Welcome back, everyone, as we move forward. We've got three now, Trelly, out of four teams qualified. That means we've only got one more set to determine who is going to be there. Of course, afterward, or it's Gorn, Trelly, by the way. Uh, afterward, we're going to have that draft show, right, that comes yep. through, get those four captains, try to figure out who exactly is, is joining who in the world's bracket and how that's all going to shake out. Uh, and the good news is I have the rosters all in front of me, so I won't be forgetting any names this time around. Nice job. And it's going to be very fun, I think, to, to watch shake out. Kings and Wardens. Not exactly where I think a lot of people thought this week was going to end up towards the very end. Uh, but before we get into these two teams, let's just take a look of how we got here. Looking over towards Group A, we've got our teams. Highland Ravens, Hex Mambo. They are going to the Smite World Championship. Shabalba Storm and the Gilded Gladiators have been eliminated and are no longer going to be be playing this season, Trelly. It's all coming down to just eight teams, but right now we've technically got nine still available. Four waiting at the World Championship. Three that are going to be joining them, and then two they're already who there. are about to play as we already... I guess they are. We set they're them there so early. They're, there. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just waiting. The, <laughs> exploring Arlington, doing all those fun things. Now, hopefully they're here. We need them a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, in Group B, it all comes down to this. The current reigning world champs trying to be the returning world champs and return to Arlington. And to do so, they're going to need to win a best of five up against the Cowland Wardens, who yesterday, Trelly, looked incredible up against the team that, unfortunately for the Wardens, was able to beat them to the punch first. Scarabs qualified in, but the Scarabs games they won were all... Hey, we're 35 minutes in. We won one really sick team fight and made ourselves move forward. Yep. The Wardens, early game, shot calling, all tons of things were, were impressive. And the Kings, that's what they're going to have to contend with today. And that's the thing. The Wardens, as far as I'm concerned, won 90% of four games. It, it said 3-1 Scarabs, and that was true. The Scarabs did kill their Titan three times. <laughs> But they just had the lead so much. And yeah. I, we got to talk to the team afterwards a bit. And it was like, listen, we are so good at 90% of Smite. But the late game is where the adaptations need to be made. And scarily enough, the Kings are pretty darn good once it gets to that point. So I'm hoping those adaptations were made quickly. Because late game is kind of where they thrive. Yeah, and not only that, it has been these team fights, right? In fact, if anything, maybe scary for the Wardens, the Kings play sometimes very similar to what we saw from the Scarabs, except they don't fall as far behind right. in a lot of those moments, right? That's something that, that, you know, the Wardens were able to push themselves to the limit. The Kings, their farm game early on is solid. Their fight game later on is solid. And so that's something that they're going to have to channel. If I'm looking at this properly as well, I believe I see twig not only in a, a king's jersey oh yeah but a very specific style of king's jerseys the championship jerseys from last year uh, so trying to channel that energy again into today wearing the black and gold instead of the purple to try and move forward here and i think that is kind of speaking to something this guy on your screen twig has been to every single world championship to this point trelly and so some weight on him to make sure it happens again. Exactly. I, I like channeling that energy. That's exactly what you're trying to find here. It's not just the chance to, you know, defend your title. It's the chance to compete for it at all. So, of course, a lot on the line. But, man, the Camelot Kings, such a... Like, their, their, their play style has been a little bit back and forth as far as I'm concerned. Because sometimes their back line just absolutely hard carries the game away. Like Tings and Yarkor just go untouched and absolutely frag out and it's not even close. And then other times it takes a little bit to get online. There is, there's a little bit of slow farm earlier on. Captain Twig falls behind. Variety falls behind. These sort of things. So I need to see the version of the Kings where they just iron everything out, right? It's, it's, it's a big ask, of course. This is a lot on the line, but they've been there. This is not a team that is unused to these situations. They have been absolutely popping off time and time again. Again, defending world champs cannot be said enough. They have that level of confidence in them. It just depends on what team shows up here today. The pressure, I think, is on. Just to, to make sure things happen. Again, as you said, things have been going a little back and forth for them. Uh, having four guys from last year come back, right? Quig being the, the new kid on the right. block for this team. And I guess technically just in general, right? A rookie player on a team of, of reigning world champions. Uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, a big deal for them to be able to qualify yep. and to make it as far as it is. We talked a little bit about Quig, but now we can talk to a different guy. He's got two rings across two years, and he's looking to try and find his third. We got Hardcore standing by for an interview. 
We've got two-time Yarkor here with me for the pregame interview. Yark, I just want to kind of start this out with the general vibe check. How are you feeling going into the set, and how's the team doing right now? Uh, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fresh. Uh, I don't think there is that much pressure. I've been in this place like plenty of times. Just really important games. So I think we, me and the team are chilling today. And going up against the Callan Wardens, the team that beat the Eldritch Hounds, then you guys got a victory of the Hounds, and now you got to go against the team that knocked them down there. Uh, what kind of prep is your team taking to kind of go up against this Callan Warden squad? Uh, we just watch a few of the game bugs from yesterday. We learn a few things, and I think we had a little talk. I think we're feeling good. And for you specifically, now getting to try and go back for a potential third time running, going back to the world stage, I mean, how much does a victory against the Callan Wardens mean in getting back to that world championships? I think it's so fun to play on a stage. I think that's what I really want to do. And you try to make a good run to there. I think it's achievable. There is plenty of cases, so I just want to be there with the boys. We hope to see you there, Yarkora. Best of luck in your match, man. I'll let you get back with the team. Thanks for coming out. We'll throw it back to the desk. Two rolls, two rings. Uh, two times back to back, and he's looking to try and make it there a third time. And you can see it. And I think, Shelly, what I, what I get out of that interview is Primarily focus is just like, you know what? We're feeling good. We've done our homework. Like what you had said earlier, that's a team that is good at adaptation. That's something that the wardens are going to have to deal with. Because right. if we turn our attention to the other side of this conversation, you've got a team that much like the, the Storm, but but maybe even further beyond, had a, a rough phase, right? Couple of wins here and there. Go in. All of a sudden, they have the exact kind of performance you need in December to then pick up where they're at here. And while yesterday doesn't go their way, I mean, you had said it yourself, they almost win four games. They do successfully win, win one of those. But some right. of those late game calls, that's the only thing that really needs to clean up. And I, I don't even know if it was the calls necessarily. It was just one little misstep, yeah. one little overextension. You know, this Good was point. very thin margins, I believe. That last game went so incredibly long and it was back to back so you know this could have very easily been a five game set here for the wardens and you know they're probably kicking themselves for that but at the very least they know what they have to work on right when you can play 90 percent of the smite game almost perfectly you just have to focus on that late game and that's exactly what the wardens you know probably went into mindset last night saying hey world stage is still the goal this is not uh, you know a fairy tale we are we were one win away yesterday we're still one win away today and that competitive spirit, I think, is going to be burning through them 100%. It's not as if the Kings are looking like they did last year on their world's run, right? This is not the same unbeatable Kings. They have slipped. They have made some mistakes. And there is capitalization that is certainly there to be had. I've been very impressed with the Wardens as of recent. I've loved to see what Slash has been able to do in the jungle. Nog has been playing like a man possessed. And, of course, Leon in that support role just commanding the team, all of which... It's not going to be easy to stop. I think this is going to be one of the best sets we see all week. And, of course, sending both of these teams to Worlds just means everything's on the line. And I know, you know, when we watch this team, it really does feel like the team fight, right? It, yeah. it is the coalesce of this squad. Although, right. I mean, yesterday, the farm game early on was absolutely insane as well. You had said it, 90% of the game, maybe even 95 if you, you want to push it there. I'll give them 95. Uh, it is incredibly clean. But this team, it, it, they just work so well together. When we listen to the comms, it feels right. I'm excited to see what the Wardens have to offer for us today. And I'm sure they're excited as well. And to find out, we've got Leon standing by for an interview. So i got Ellie on the support here for the Callan Wardens. Leon, first off, coming into this matchup, how are you feeling? You know, it's a chance to qualify to the SWC. How, how are you and the boys kind of feeling in this match? We feel we feel, we feel confident. I feel like yesterday we won four games and just lost to ourselves uh, at the end of the day. Um, I think it was just a really experienced team just uh, waiting for us to make mistakes, which we did. But we watched the back. Uh, we did our film work and we're coming back, you know, super confident into this Kings matchup. Is there any kind of extra prep that goes into playing a team like the Camelot Kings, or is it kind of just maybe a business as usual, play your own style? Or what's kind of the general vibe going up against another SPL top squad? I feel like the, the Kings really haven't shown anything in particular. I, we beat the Hounds, I think, uh, more dominantly than, than they did. And so going into this, I, it's going to be the same thing. Just play our game, and we're going to win. What would it mean for you personally being able to make it to the World Stage? You've been there a couple times when you're playing on console, but getting to go there for the first time on PC, how would it feel? It... it how do I put this? Because it's been 10 years in the work, um, so I, it feel amazing. I mean, it'd be a dream come true. That's why I'm here to compete. At the end of the day, I love streaming, but I, the competition is what fires me up, and that's why I'm here. I'm just here to go all the way, and we'll see what happens. Sure you got a lot of fans backing behind you. Well, best of luck to you in your matchup, Leon. I'll let you get back with the team. We'll throw it back into the desk.
Something, again, I'm really excited to see what this team has to offer. Because that fire, right? you can kind of hear it in his voice, but like 10 years in the making. Right. This is something that the Wardens really want, that the Wardens are really pushing for. And so there's a little bit of pressure, right? If 10 years in the making over there for, for at least one player on the Wardens. And for the Kings, Shelly, the difference between having the, the reigning world champ actually in the bracket and not is on the line. And that is a lot of pressure to go into a best of five with. I mean, we, you want to talk 10 years in the making. We already talked about Captain Twitter. Yeah. You know, he's been at every one of those worlds for the past 10 years. So there is a lot on the line here. Just legacy matchup for both one of these squads. I, I couldn't have asked for a better last matchup in this tournament, Gore, because as you said, it's just an absolute banger in the making. Both of these teams have shown you know, some high points in this tournament and some low points. And I think it is going to be a bit of a, a mental battle as far as I'm concerned, because as Leon just said, you know, the, the Hounds were in the mix as well. You can see both these teams had to go up against similar squads just to get here. So it's not as if it's just one-sided by any means. You know, I, I want to see the poll as well. We do a Twitch poll before every single game. I assume it'll be pretty close to 50-50, at least for the first game. Yeah, the Kings, like you said, have been kind of polarized mm -hmm. over the last few days. I do like the the idea. I'm trying to remember. I don't know if I saw Twig wear that jersey sometime earlier this year, and that is a lot to ask if he wore it sometime in Phase 1. But otherwise, last time he would have been wearing like the championship jersey would have been during that world's run. And so, again, maybe trying to channel that energy, winning every single set without having to worry about dropping a single game in the process. The Kings last year dominant performance need that now and Charlie specifically I, I highlight Twig because of how Thursday went that was a very standout performance and not in the way you want it to be Kings will be first pick game one for the last set this weekend to determine the last team that's going to go to the smite world championship in Arlington Texas January 12th through 14th bands already starting to throw roll through and Slash is eating a few of them up front. You've got the Daji, and you've got the Thanatos from the Kings so far. Other side, the Athena and the Aphrodite Wardens more or less playing partially against Quig, partially playing the second pick ban meta that you've got to kind of get forced into. But it is leaving open some of those big picks so far, like the Kukul Khan that we've seen specifically from Nog, the Thoth as well, things like that. Yep, the Thoth, the Kuku, the Raijin all have been pretty popular picks, especially for Nog in that mid lane, whereas in this case, the Camelot Kings focusing out some of those picks, right? The, th the, the Thanatos is something that Slash has been good and bad, but he has had just pop-off performances where you get one kill and you can just chain it to a, a team fight getting completely wiped, so probably smart that you take that away. It's not going to completely stunt his god pool. I've seen him have some pop-off games on the Susano as well, but this is a good look here for the Camelot Kings. The Wardens have to decide if a, that thought is something they're worried about, or if they just want to focus out Quig a little bit more, and it does seem that that's the call. Maybe trying to play a bit through duo lane, right? I mean, if Quig is, gets off to a bad start, we could see. But Hachiman, very safe pick, doesn't reveal much about the draft, dominant in lane and extremely safe. Not a bad look to get Yark off on a good foot. And we saw not yesterday, but the day before, Hardcore on this pick can have a real good time if you let him loose, and so. He was feeling confident. You could hear it in his voice. This is going to be a confident pick to, to lock in alongside it. It's also been one, Trelly, that, you know, we talk about this a lot. With There, there are certain picks you can lock in, and there's ambiguity, right? Oh, right. hey, that guy's played solo. He's also played jungle, or he's also played support. They're all over the place. Hachi is the one where you're like, well, I know exactly where that guy's going. <laughs> yep. I don't know anything else about this draft because everything works with it. Yep, 100%. And I, I love the hover immediately here from the war, and this pick has been so polarizing as well. You know Tings wouldn't mind getting his hands on the Thoth, but of course, the Baba Yaga is also a pick that's been up and very highly contested. But in particular, the Thoth is hard to keep alive, right? You do need some pretty strong peel. The setup is almost, you know, on the back end. You can hit a final judgment with no setup if, if you're just over a wall or you flick and no one's paying attention, that sort of thing but it's the peel. That is what's going to be have to draft here. The Camelot Kings are gonna want some pretty solid dive to get towards this Thoth. And of course, grabbing Delany the Nike, a pick that this man has went to plenty of times, very consistent on it. It's gonna be good in lane, late game. It, it, the, the, the engage is so linear. You blink in, Sentinel of Zeus, get a five man slow, and then just soak up damage. Lancelot and Raijin as the answer, something 
Uh, one that we've seen from Twig time and time and time and time and time and time again, where he goes back to it. It has been maybe one of his most consistently played this year, and it has definitely treated him kindly. Raijin as well, Shelly, which is something they played not only earlier this week, uh, but Ooh. have been feeling decently confident in their capabilities within mid, especially when it's BMT. Right. I am a big fan of the Thoth into Raijin matchup, though. We just saw the win rate, I believe, eight games, 38% win rate here for the Raijin. Has been decent early game, but that late game, when you want to talk about, you know, one mage ability just winning a team fight, it, you're rarely talking about Tycho drums, right? This is consistent damage. It's not too much burst. It's a lot of poke that you can just line up, whereas Thoth has that late game potential to just delete you, especially when you're casting Tycho drums. There's no Aegis, right? You, you have to sit there. You're, in, you're, you're a little bit slower. You're a large target. You're going to have to watch that positioning for sure. But I talked about dive. Lancelot is definitely one of those guys that can get to Thoth. He, he has plenty of movement, plenty of mobility. Variety's pick we're still waiting on, but he's going to want to help Twig. He's going to want to get to that Thoth as well. You know, it's been a little while. First off, Warden's pick up Maui. That's something. We've got Athena, Afro, and Maui right now. I think it's the list of Leon. He obviously has a lot more. Sobek has been on that list and, and a few others, but the Maui has treated him incredibly kindly. But, Shelly, it's been a little while since the Kings have had to eat five bands for one roll, and it seems like Quig is taking up his predecessor's spot and doing the exact same thing. You got three support bands up top, and then immediately followed by the Sobek and the Ares. Over there, you've got Onher and Rom that get banned out. Ishtar left available, and that's going to be an easy, smooth pickup. They're trying to force him into Baron, it looks like, because that has been that's, Quig's. Yeah, his been go-to. Yeah, Quig's, they know Quig wants it. They banned just about every other top meta pick <laughs> besides it. They're like, they're just dangling the pick in front. Like, don't you want to play some guy that's got a coffin? You know, he's the life of the party. Uh, some Baron's through that could be fun. And then they're just going to say, okay, let's focus on that guy, right? Let's yeah. go for Baron every single time. We'll see if the Camelot Kings take the bait. Quig has played it confidently into other matchups, but remember, it's usually in the Yemoja. That, that has been the call, right? We gave up Yemoja on purpose. Baron has a fantastic time. Now we're just going to keep pulling Yemoja. Maui is not going to have that same level of, you know, getting pulled. He's got plenty. He's got the Solar Swing. Even his ultimate can sort of block off life with the party. So there are definitely better picks available to try and deal with it. The Camelot Kings are going to think about this one. And yeah, they're not going to take that bait. It looks like the Terra Hover. I would like that a lot better. And Terra specifically, we had actually gotten to talk about it a little bit. Uh, as a matchup into Sobek, but when you look at like a lot of what Maui likes to do, at least specifically around the ultimate, it feels like it would also be pretty helpful, as well as something, uh, though we haven't seen Quick play it a whole ton, that the Kings have played around a lot in their tenure uh, as a team, so it does feel good. Wow. Osiris locked in, who we've been seeing a whole ton of. Big fan. Had, yeah, and you're loving this? Oh yeah, uh, that's the thing. I, when I saw the Odin, I, was, I had question marks, because uh, I went on a tangent about Odin a bit ago, where you have great... If you have great damage in the cage, then Odin's fantastic, but this didn't seem like the easiest time. Sure, you could boy the Thoth, but I'm just imagining being in Nog's shoes, where he's just like, I'm a Thoth, I need to stay away. Osiris, he's going to blink on me, he's going to tether, I'm going to dash, he's going to ult. There's just so much dive potential there, so that's going to be scary. Now you add the Lancelot in the mix, and you have a little bit of peel, like Nike and Maui can certainly do it, but this was the dive the Camelot Kings needed to find. That's Tsukiyomi. Not something that we've gotten to see a whole ton of lately. He feels like he's been teetering one time this week already, and I want to say it was, it was the Wardens yep. yeah, that we're picking it up. So, you know, I guess you can take it in the fact that Slash had already played it, but really just how do you feel about him as a pick and also feel about him with the rest of this draft? Well, notably, it was paired with Afro, and I think that's a big difference maker because it was just attached at the hip, Leon and, and, and Slash just ran around. Mm -hmm. And when you're a Sukuyomi with an Aphrodite, you feel a lot more powerful here. The Maui's going to have similar levels of help with the dive, but you don't have the heals. You don't have the slows. You don't have the CC and damage immunity. It will be a lot more difficult. You have to choose your piercing moos, moonlights much more wisely. Because remember, once you send that ult, you are all inning. There is no taking it back. Once you have chose a target, you are flying in at lightning speed and you are going to be in the thick of the team fight. So it's just positioning wise. But if you want to talk about long range artillery damage, the Wardens have it in spades, man. The Ishtar, enhanced auto attack. She's going to be able to outrange just about every other hunter except for the Hachi on the other side. You got Thoth, you got Suki. They have that dive potential if the carries of the Camelot Kings are in a bad spot. But if you're going to praise the Camelot Kings on anything in their whole arsenal, for me, it's going to be the positioning of their carries. Big man Tings and Yarkor do not mess up often. 
you know, yesterday there was a lot of conversation of Tuba versus E Chrome. Right. And a lot of that was like, okay, how's he going to do, you know, in lane? Is that going to transition to late game? I will give E Chrome a lot of the credit because by the end of the games, he had the most damage of the two carries. Right. But in lane, Tuba really got a lot of control. But Hardcore. Uh, Shelly, first off, one of the, the players that's kind of touted as, as best mechanical player maybe just ever to play Smite, right? There's a lot that is riding on. He's also the only person who's won Worlds in two roles, so that maybe leans into that. He's the only one bit. who's compared to a shark either, I'm just saying. That Who else true? you call a yeah, shark? Yeah, no, you've yeah. got a good, I guess, like, there was also, like, the player whose name was. Well, he was well he's not compared to a shark. He is oh, a yeah, shark. Darkhorn gets a compared right, to right, a shark. Right. That's different. He gets compared to a shark. Right. Uh, but Tuba's matchup against <laughs> Harkor, like, how do you see some of this dual lane going? I know you just said you like the range a little bit better on the Hachi. Right. It, that's the thing. I think the way the Camelot Kings play their early game, if they can find these stuns, if they can find some good damage, they'll look for some kills, right? It happens. But you got to think, where is gonna, where's Captain Twig going to be at level three? Is he going to be at shield buff? 99% of the time, no. He's going to be a cooldown buff. He's going to be with Variety. I don't think that's going to be where Slash is. I think he'll be over in duo lane. Well, it's going to be one to watch. And one for the ages. Best of five. Who's going to strike first? Wardens or Kings? We'll find out in game one. That's right. It's the SPL versus the SCC. One more time. Only one spot left to make it to the Smite World Championship. It's the Camelot Kings and the Kalen Wardens here for game number one. It's J-Mac inbound. And Doug here to bring you the action for game one of this best of five. We're starting to see this Terra pop back up. We saw it last set, Bobby. Konic, uh, Kha'Zix, not Kana, Kha'Zix goes over towards the Terra. Looks really good. So much so that the Gilded Gladiators that I like to do ban that one away. Now we get to see what Quig is capable of doing on a pick like this. Uh, I think Terra's always kind of been in that second tier support. My issue is that she's much better as a counter pick than just an innate great pick all the time. And I think the matchup into Maui is pretty strong for the Terra. You can get pulled very easily, but it's very difficult for the Maui to actually hit you with the ultimate because both your monolith from your three and your standing stones from the two, whatever they are, uh, you can't get pulled during those. The big pull, the big landfall yeah, pull, landfall. the normal small fisherman pull you can get pulled by, but the big one, the important one, you cannot. And looking at the, the two mid laners, something that I've seen pop up a little bit more is Aegis is the starting relic for both of them. And it's something that Nog has really liked. Paul's done it a little bit. We've seen it a little bit by Shinto. Big Man is coming around to it now. Also, it's interesting to see that the beads has kind of gone off to the wayside for these mid laners because of just how safe these mid lane gods are in that super short mid lane. You would never see, okay, I shouldn't say never, because we've seen it a couple times. Never say never. But you will rarely see an ADC pick up Aegis over the beads just because of how long that lane is. But mid laners, they get everything. They get farm and they get the short lane so they can go Aegis. Man, they got camps on both sides they of their lane. They got camps. They've got so much going for them. But I will say, maybe it's more questionable that Nog is going in it given what he's up against. Sure, Lancelot, not a whole lot of CC his way. I believe a, a slow and a knockback is about the extent of that. Maybe a cripple in the ultimate if you can get that one out there. But you're going against a Ryzen, you're going against a Terra. Like, that is such a, a difficult two to really just escape from as that thought, especially if that Lancelot ultimate is around. So maybe just trusting that he's able to live through that CC to, to, to try and fight back into it. And he doesn't have the CC immunity in the ultimate right. like Big Man has. So curious to keep my eyes on that mid lane, see if either of them get punished for having no beads, or maybe they live with that Aegis. And something that I've enjoyed seeing also is in the soul lane, this Nike pop back up. This character is winning way too much to not be getting picked high prioed. She's starting to get a little bit more prio now. Yeah, it's starting to hit hard too, especially when you get to late game. Even if you only have even one damage item in the kit, which right now doesn't look like Dunn, he's going to go that way. Straight towards defense instead. He, he's been preferring this. He doesn't like the Jotuns as much as some of the other solos. Yeah, it really was kind of day one we saw more, uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, the Jotun start, you know, that day one, day two kind of early yes. matchups we saw, but it really feels like things are solidifying back more down to the defensive style of route. Yeah, and, and that Glad Shield is, is definitely strong, but it, it weakens your kill potential a little bit. And these supports bullying out the ADCs. And, and this is like the interesting part about that early 2v2. Whoa, Yark pulled back. Monolith used and broken. Yark Horror's got a dash out. Same with Quig. Med used. And Meditation now down for the Camelot Kings. But a double stun used up against Leon and Tuba. And now it's Quig running back in. If he can just get that Monolith and get that dash back online, could see Yark Horror get aggressive. But going to wait back, clear up the minions, the 
the farm play the priority here, at least for the hunter of the Camelot Kings. And that level 3 Terra spike is just insane. Maui spikes really hard, level 1, level 2. Terra, on the other hand, hits that level 3 and then starts to bully. And that's what you like to see when you're playing this Terra. You hit that level 3 and you just start using all your abilities. You look for that all in because very few supports have the kill potential of a Terra at level 3. You see what Nog just did? Yeah, he, he loves that. He uh, invades the, big, the green again. The big man Tings goes to, to right Harpy camp, and that's when you think, okay, in mid laner, I'm just going to go to the other Harpy camp. Big man Tings goes over the wall and says, bro, he took green buff. I mean, at this point, you go, all right, cool. Now mid Harpies are back up. I can just go for those ones. But the fact that Nog is so, so willing to invade a buff camp as opposed to just going for the standard neutral farm really shows the confidence of this player. And maybe it is a good reason we've been seeing so many people gas this guy up. Yeah, I mean, I love it. And it's the same thing yesterday where there was a few plays, and, and granted, it, it comes back to bite him a few times where we, we saw him dash into three people yesterday and they ended up losing the game off of it. But I would rather see a confident player make maybe a, a too aggressive of a play than a player that's playing defensively and not really taking openings that are giving to them because a lot of time, actually, maybe a play in left. Play on, dash away. Captain Twig with the ultimate. Doesn't really get much value from this one. Just tried maybe disengage the fight for the Camelot Kings as Nog does go in aggressively up against BMT trying to get some extra poke. Two ultimates used on the left side. Team fight, nothing on the end of the Kalan Warden. So still having those utilities, those resources up should that next fight break out. I'm also curious to see what variety goes in the way of solo lane build. We've seen a couple, actually, not even a couple. We've seen like three Osiris builds now where we had Julio's build last game, which is just the Phalanx into that cloak instantly. Deathwalker opted for that Xe before going into the cloak. And then we, I think, Haddix build, which was double shield build into Onis. So those are the three type of builds we've seen from this Osiris. And that's why this character is always kind of deemed as at least an okay character. Recently, he's been really bad, but he got a few buffs. He's, he's kind of back in the meta a little bit. And that's why this character kind of always comes back alive at these land times because of how open-ended his build is. Well, at least we're not back in the days of when he lived up to his in-game title as the broken Lord of the Afterlife, man. Uh, back Bring him in back. The old Osiris days, he was essentially Warrior Kali was the best way to describe him, and that was never fun to deal with. So we'll see what Variety can go with on this build. So far, leaning towards the Phalanx route, so it'll be a question of does Variety value that extra damage that comes from the execution or that extra threat to the back line, or does he want to go for that safety a little bit sooner? Elyon walking forward towards green. Does get secured by the Camelot Kings. Quig thought about getting aggressive, but then realized that there was nobody behind him, so thinks twice about diving into three people. Interesting early game so far. Usually we don't see the Kings playing this early game as aggressive as they have been, and it's usually Twig playing towards the right side of the map, but when these shield camps are spawning, I guess until this one, Twig is opting for it. Slash here for this one, but Tuba farming his purple. Right over shield. Landfall used by Elyon, and <laughs> the shield buff actually get it. stolen away by Quig. He held on to that sun until the landfall was done. Actually able to out-secure the Kalan Warden. So, I mean, that's essentially an ultimate for free for the Camelot Kings, and they get a little bit of extra. And Maui's an important ultimate to call out there because that is a 110 second cooldown. It is a very long duration ult. And times like this where Elyon's down to two thirds or one third health, that ultimate gives him that CC immunity and he doesn't have that, that quick dash that a lot of supports or a lot of survivable guardians have. He's got that really slow get in the air jump where very easily interrupted by either Yarkor or Quig. It's almost reminiscent of like the original Ho Yi jump. Yeah. You know, where you really slowly go up and you're kind of creeping around before you eventually land back down because it's kind of also the downside of that Maui will hold that. Slash. Got Twig going up for first bluff and no slash. He's a piercing moonlight to get away. Can Big Man Tings land a single drum? Yes, he can. Slash walks right in, and the Camelot Kings are on the board first. And, and again, the Kings up almost 2,000 gold seven minutes into this game with only one kill. And this is usually not the Kings we see. There's like confidence here today. They're actually looking for plays. Twig is going in and committing to these fights. And Slash caught out there at those mid camps. And that's kind of the, the downside of the Sukuyomi. You don't have that safety a lot of these other assassins have. If you get caught out in the jungle, especially by a god like Lancelot, you can just get chased down. And Twig didn't even need to chase him down. He just, he, he left him 200 health and he said, you got it, Tinks. I know you clean him up. Big Man Tinks does just that. Strikes first, 
now for the Camelot Kings. As mentioned, that 2,000 gold lead they've been able to establish with just their fighting, just that extra bit of farming that they've gotten, pushing Tuba and Elyon under tower multiple times, stealing away a couple of these shield camps as well. Camelot Kings need to be playing with some confidence. Because so far, uh, over the course of this weekend, it was a rough matchup for them against the Solar Scarabs. It was still a bit shaky, even against the fellow SPL team and the Eldritch Hounds. They're able to squeak through with a 2-1. But now here in this best of five, with Worlds on the line, this is where the Camelot Kings have really got to turn on the Jets. And personally, that's what it feels like is the biggest weakness of the Kings, I think, over the past couple months is they just don't feel like that same confident team that we saw last year. This team won Worlds a year ago, and they're just kind of back to just playing Smite. And this game so far, we've seen that confident King style kind of come back. And Variety finishing that Executioner shows he wants to dominate this solo lane. So be prepared for those blue buffs to get invaded. A lot of pressure on Dedelny to be able to live this. Because we saw Deathwalker almost get like three or four solos like every game. Yeah, every time we pan back over when it was Deathwalker on either Osiris or Bologna, it's the enemy teammate just like that. It's, it's, it's the enemy solo just sitting under tier one. Half HP. It was Delny. Can't get anything going. Delny was It was Delny. Dead. <laughs> Typically, man, it really was Delny just kind of getting diffed in solo for a while. <laughs> but now that Delny's fought that, what, four times in a row, has learned a little bit, is able to at least try and keep up pacing for the time being. Hasn't really had a chance to go back. Close. Elyon really delaying that jump before he goes over the wall. Swings back and forth a couple times. Able to land and back into safety, but Camel Kings starting to play a bit more aggressive. As we get to this nine minute mark, I'm curious how the Wardens are going to be able to play this middle portion. When you think about their comp and how it wants to play, a lot of this game is on Elyon to really make plays, pull relics, get fights started. Because for the most part, they have a very poke heavy comp with this Ishtar, this Thoth, this Tsukuyomi. They don't really want to all in these fights. So if Elyon's not hitting anything, Slash? Quig, he's the Grand Chow. Slash goes in for the Piercing Moonlight, but it's just got to bounce him between three different people. Quig stuns him out for Quig to take him down, too, now. For the Camelot Kings, Captain Twig finally on the board with a kill of his own. And Variety has rotated to mid. Does Nog have the dash available? May have used it to get to the wave, but gets it up just in time. Elyon shows up as an extra means of backup, but not very often we see our solos rotating in 10 minutes. And usually it's when that first beacon spawns in. Quick getting pulled back. He should be just fine, tanky enough, but early rotations from Variety. And he didn't even get the proxy off. Usually you see those early uh, rotations by soul laners. They proxy the wave beforehand, but Variety just rotates, says hello to Nog. And Nog has those beads actually forced out in that engagement also, so maybe potential to kill Nog here. We talked about it a little bit in the earlier portions of the game where, I mean, if Ryzen gets a taunt onto him, that is potential for kills onto Thoth. But now being that level 12 does mean Beads back for the mid laner. So we've returned to norm with Beads and Aegis for your mid laners. Though I think you were right to point out something we'll keep track of as the course of this game and uh, really as the course of this series, I should say, goes on, seeing how much more Pryo has been throwing towards those Aegises for the mid laners. Opposite end, as compared to Variety, Delny goes into the Prophetic Cloak very early. I believe second item for him goes back and full buys it and a Blink as well. So not going to have any extra form of safety necessarily on the side of Delny, but plenty of aggression. And when we go to this late game, we always talk about Nike as this character that gets just heavily countered by Sunder. So eyes on Quig, you know, as we get to that 12 minute mark, or t level 12 for him, and I guess the 12 minute mark, will he opt for that Sunder, or is it just going to be maybe an Erosion, Gem of Iso, maybe just that Deathbringer as anti-shield options? But from what we've seen with this Nike, not a lot of Sunders into her, and maybe that's part of the strength from her. His teams just don't want to invest into that Sunder. But that was like, for years, the, the counter oh, yeah. into Nike. It was buy Sunder, win game, don't buy Sunder, she will dominate. Yeah, it felt like even when Nike was kind of, you know, the meta for a time around Worlds, the answer was either Sunder, or in some cases it was, we're going to grab a Fenrir, we're just going to pull this Nike over here, and even if you do get to use your ultimate, you've lost like almost all your HP because I drug you over to a carry with crit or to a, to a mid laner with a whole lot of damage. We'll see the response here for the Camelot Kings. Fight around the beacon, though. Slash stunned out. Captain Twig dismounts off the horse. It's the Kalen Wardens, primary on the platform. Elyon trying to zone out, but misses his hook. Gives a little bit of leeway now to the Camelot Kings. They're not going to give up this 
Beacon so freely. You see Quig stepping up time after time just to keep slowing down the momentum. But Elyon lands on top, gets the stun, pulls him back. And now the Tycho drums out of Pigman. Takes, but he gets clipped by Final Judgment. That's the back off now for the Camelot Kings. No chance that Captain Twig stands by. And they're starting to win that, and they actually won that fight with Slash down two levels there to Twig. And a lot of that is on the back of Nog, able to hit the two-man ultimate and just get a lot of poke onto Quig in the meantime. And as this game takes over to 12 minutes, we got about a 3,000 lead for the Kings. And so far, they've not really done too much since that early game. I want to see them start to pick this up a little bit, starting looking for those fights. I think that was a perfect opportunity for them to take a fight with maybe a variety rotation. But instead, they opted to just kind of sit around and trade poke. And what did I say earlier? What does the Warden's comp want to do? They want to trade poke. So if you're going to be there, you're going to be standing around, you have to look for the all-in. You cannot just trade that poke, especially against the Thoth. You especially don't want to get chipped away by the Thoth, because all it takes is Slash. Clothesline from the jungle with a piercing moonlight. Just chase down those tiny low HP targets for a landfall from Elyon to pull somebody back. It's around the Pyromancer. Quarter HP, Elyon goes in. Double pull. Yanks back too, but Variety's already in the back line. Dealing with Nog, quick. Half HP and the Camelot Kings get the Pyromancer. And no further chase from the Kalan Wardens. That landfall down. A lot of the initiation now off the table for the Wardens team. And Delny opted to not rotate to that fight. He was opting to clear the wave, reset, get that tier two Onis. Maybe potential for a gold fear here for the Warden says they see variety in the right, they know Quig is in the middle, four here, and it's just Yarkor. Cool. Fury half HP. Yark knows this is happening, but just gotta give doesn't it. think he can get the shots through. He's gotta go through four different people and out securing what Nog has on the Thoth. So Gold Fury over to the Kowlin Wardens. Closes up a little bit of that lead. It was pushing 3,000 plus nearly for the Camelot Kings. Kowlin Wardens able to answer back and keep it to just under that 3K mark. Where do you see Delny get a bit more active? We've seen Variety already make two, three rotations over towards mid. Wait, wait. No way they're going fire. Giant started for the Camelot Kings. Delny's already here. Maybe it's just a pick to try and kill Delny. Maybe Delny can they just kill her. somebody here because Fire Giant's at half health. Now Big Man Ting's on the way. Captain Twig knocked up by the fire and the ultimate from Delny. Gets him a lot of extra HP, but Captain Twig's able to walk out of the pit. The Fire Giant might not be able to be finished, but at least for the Camelot Kings, they can get there. One, Variety's just walking down. Nog. Nog in the back line. Able to dash away. Lord of the Afterlife chases him out. Aegis and Beads used by the Thoth. Variety trying to chip away, but it's not enough damage and not enough CC to slow him down. The Kings will just have to take their one. And it almost looked like they were actually just going to 50-50 that fire until Delny said, okay, well, I guess I just have to kind of all in here and die for it just to make sure they aren't able to get it. So Delny sacrifices his life just to make sure the Kings don't do that. And this is not even an objective burn comp. There's no Fafnir, there's no Alma, there's no Frenzy. There's a Bracer and a little bit of damage. Twig. No ult. Beads keep him alive. Ultimate's not there. Landfall off the mark. He's just running around the, the wall and gets the blink pass. And now Quig cuts off the path of Elyon. Captain Twig trying to go back in. Slash. The wall cuts him off, though. And Captain Twig might just need to turn back and return to base, go back and farm up the jungle. Because there are a couple of players in the Kalan Wardens ready to hunt him down. Another play looking to be made there by the Wardens, and that's kill there if they're able to hit just a couple more abilities. But that speed buff on the Lancelot, hard to hit with those abilities. And it's junglers in general, when they have the speed buff, they are so much faster than everyone else on the map that if they can just play around those walls, it is very hard to actually hit those abilities. And a lot of the abilities on the side of the Wardens, I mean, at least in their dual lane, are impossible to hit over walls. So that is something we'll have to keep in mind. If there's no thought there, the, the damage is, is actually just really hard for them to kind of play around those walls. You see Variety, at least mirroring that of what Deathwalker was going for his build. The only difference is it's not that Pestilence and fourth slot that Deathwalker is more apt to go towards. Instead, going into the Kusari tree for Variety. We'll see. That ends up being an Oni Hunters. If he goes to Shoguns, we'll have to wait until that one gets finished off. That's Elyon. Waiting for a chance to fight around the beacon. Spawns up here in just a few moments. We're going to see yet another breakout fight between these two teams. Last time, the Kalan Wardens were able to get just enough poke on the Camelot Kings. Thanks to the help of Nog landing a pretty big final judgment on BMT that allowed the Wardens to get that first beacon. And both these solo is trying to stack up that cloak. Second option for the Nike, third option for Variety. Leon swings away. Thundercrash out by BMT. 
The Arc trying to pump him some damage as Downey walks by. You still have very early. Landfall catches Variety, but he's able to use the Lord of the Afterlife just to get out of danger. No problem for him. Captain Twig launches a horse at El Leon, gets some good ship damage to the support. And that will force now a five versus four around the beacon. Camelot Kings can group up. Yarkor can cap off the objective. The Kalan Wardens, not much they can do in response. Beacon alive, Pyro spawning, gold spawning very soon. A bunch of options here for the Kings, and with this little lead they have, 3,000 gold, 3,500 gold. I mean, as long as Quig doesn't take too much poke, an opportunity for both objectives. But I expect the Wardens, at this point, are strong enough to, to kind of take these fights, and I don't expect them to give anything for free. And also something that we've seen, Yarkor is happy to rotate to the, a lot of these fights. It looks like the Kings are looking to like four-man, five-man group a lot more often than most of these teams that we've seen. I mean, even the Wardens ha have been playing kind of just 3-1-1 one, one and keeping their side lanes on the side. And the Kings just want to rotate out and fight. You see these Soul Laners sticking around here still for the time. It will be that Oni Hunters on the side of Varitas is looking for that extra mitigation, walk into the middle of a fight on top of what he already gains from his passive. So it's going to be difficult to kill this Osiris. In fact, Variety will just play Gatekeeper and zone away the Wardens from even trying to go towards this Pyromancer. Leon steps forward, but the Camelot Kings get Pyro. Have to walk away for a moment. Want to go back and pick that one up, though, to put two in the hands of the Camelot Kings. They tried to go for a Fire Giant bait earlier, but now having 2,000 damage in pocket for the Camelot Kings might make that 50-50 a bit more one-sided. And again, the Kings are confident going to these objectives. They say, Variety, zone out Nog. If you do, we will confirm the objective. What does Variety do? He blinks onto Nog instantly and just lets his team confirm the objective. And this is like, again, the confidence of the Kings. They're going to these objectives. They know they can do them. They're taking the fights or just doing the objectives in front of the enemy team. And with this Oni Fury up, no teleport on Variety for the next 90. And teleport is up for uh, Delny, maybe an opportunity for the Wardens here to try to make a play. The Kalan Wardens, not too far out of this game just yet. Still only about 4,000 gold up for the Camelot Kings, which hasn't been too much of a lead so far. But Captain Tuba. Twig goes aggressive against Tuba. Dash forward, but the wall from Quig locks off his path. Beads and egg is gone. Tuba's life bar removed. The Kalan Wardens Hunter gets picked off at what was a tier one tower line, but with that tower there no more, the safety has been removed. And yesterday when we saw the Wardens play, their early game was phenomenal. This time the Kings are taking it to them. Oni Fury already down to half. Fury, can the Kalan Wardens get in? You've got good steal chance. If Nog can find a way forward, Landfall already used by Nog the support, but Variety's not gonna let Nog even step up to the pit. They got the Wardens, it. they do steal the Oni Fury, and now they can just break right out of the team fight and walk back to base. It was an in-hand from the melee range Sukiyomi that steals it away. The Kalan Wardens able to grab one from under the noses of the Camelot Kings. And that is just a great steal there by Slash. The opportunity was there. He's able to get close enough, gets the steal. And that kind of just delays this game a little bit longer. The Kings, phenomenal early game again, but it's just they're not able to kind of get that gold lead up a little bit more, sitting around three, 4,000. And as we go into that late game, the thing that I love to talk about when we go late is the objective confirm. I feel like I bring it up every time, but it's just su such an important part of the game when it goes late. And comparing both sides, you have to say the Thoth is just going to be the best confirmer on the map. Well, Leon, where did his health bar just go? What hit him so hard? Captain Twig, though, going to try and make some damage in the back line. Has three at low HP. And the tier one tower removed by the Camelot Kings now. They can back up, man, but they got two Runic Bombs in pocket and three players going back to pace. The Kings might just go for the pull on the Fire Giant because they've got enough damage to try and do so. No crit online for Yarkor just yet. It's going to be a little bit longer to burn this one down. Last time, Delny was the lone wolf to stop the Camelot Kings from going for a fire, but can he do it a second Five time? Holds. Big Man Tings goes up into the ultimate. The Kalan Ward is on their way, but the Camelot Kings secure it with the double Runic Bomb, but a big ult from Tubo catches down three. It's a double stun Huge. from Leon and Slash is tearing through the back line. Landfall just misses pulling Yarkor back in. If they only lose Captain Twig, it's still a win for the Camelot Kings. And all too low for the Wardens. They cannot chase out anymore, but that is the opportunity the Kings had. They get the, the Warden's comp low enough, and then they just go to that Fire Giant, they burn it, and this is, as you said, before crit on the Hachiman, but the Warden's in return try to push down this middle tower. I try to, but with a Raijin nearby, plenty of ranged poke available and afforded to him. 
So Big Man Ting is able to keep the minions out. The Kallen Wardens cannot continue their push on Tier 1 just yet. Level 20 is coming online for both these min laners. Waiting to see when they go back and finish up those star items themselves. Let's see if we get either the Pendulum or if we get those alternate timelines back up. And just now for Elyon going back to base and finally upgrading his starter item. Sentinel's Embrace for him. Opposite side, Quig already sitting on the War Banner plus that Talisman of Energy combo. That is a such an annoying combo of items to deal with because you just get so many extra stats from them. Yeah, the movement speed, the attack speed, they stack on top of each other. And as long as you're fighting on those waves, and you should be when you have Fire Giant because you're looking to push down towers, there's a lot of movement speed and attack speed available for his entire comp. And that's kind of why maybe they were pretty confident around these objectives because they have so much movement speed from those waves. And there's so much attack speed. When you think about it, when we get to these later portion of the game, I'm curious because we've seen a lot of ADC builds throughout this week. We've seen Kins, we've seen no crit, we've seen kids with crit. Eyes on Nog, maybe? Captain Twig goes in for the lone ult. Little bold. Blink, Grand Joust used. Doesn't pull a relic or any kind of resource from Nog. No ultimate, no Aegis away, so we'll have that for the next team fight. As the Camelot Kings push up right, the Titan's about to unleash here in just a few seconds, and it will be through this solo lane. Quick drops down the Monolith, keeps himself and the team healthy, healing up for the time. As Delny tries the zone back, goes up that barrier to block some of the enhance, but what barrier doesn't block is the damage that Big Man Tings is, is just volleying out right of them rapidly. And Variety is actually looking to kind of wrap behind, be a nuisance here. And, and I think that's a good thing to highlight. Delny, when he's putting up that two, Big Man is going to be able to get a lot of damage onto him. And if Delny's clued too close to his team, that damage might shred up, spread onto everyone. Titan now standing right at the edge of the tier two. The Camelot Kings can just walk backwards slowly, safely, deal with this Titan. And they got a full HP one on the way to help them with the siege. The important thing is, well, when that barrier is up, down is a really easy target to hit with that. You move so slow when so that barrier slow. formation is out, it's almost impossible to get any kind of turn whenever it goes there, so makes him an ideal target. Big double stun from Quig. They won't even need the Titan for the Camelot Kings. There's so much chip damage that's going to the back line. The Kallen Wards have to turn tail and run. Not the Twig. Out Captain Twig with the help of Leon and a piercing moonlight all the way to the right. And Big Man Tings, though, gets the reset and gets the turnaround kill. Delny can he even find the damage himself. No, he can't. And now it's Yarkor dashing forward. Question marks from the carry and from the dual lane of the Kings. The Kallen Wardens take down three and they only lose Slash for it. And it looked like such a big fight for the Kings with that opportunity. Tuva gets really low. Unfortunately, Twig goes just way too deep, and Nog connects on the ultimate, and that pendulum damage is going to be very high now for the Stoth. We've seen, as you said, a little bit of alternate, a little bit of pendulum. Friday gets to that tower in the middle. Nice use of the bomb, but we've seen a little bit of alternate, a little bit of pendulum, and the big difference between both of them is pendulum is so much more damage, but those resets, even right there, Big Man gets that second health, or second life, and is able to survive off of it, but now Nog's just kill potential, one-shot potential, poke potential is just insanely high with this pendulum. And at that, now that pendulum or now that alternate timeline is down for five minutes. Yeah, yeah. True. Next big team fight comes up. The big boost and the big boon that you get from having that alternate timeline is effectively gone. For Nog, you don't have to worry about that. He gets that power all the time. So we'll have to see how that pans out in the next team fight because this one went a bit sour for the Camelot Kings. Do get one objective for the Kalen Wardens in that Fury being knocked down. So a Primal Fury stack for the Kalen Wardens. And back on the defense. The league with a lead for the Camelot Kings. Not too far out of hand just yet. Only about 4,000 still. It felt like, what was it, like 10 minutes ago we were saying? Three, 4,000. It has yep. not really done a whole lot more since then. The Camelot Kings have not been able to push this lead too far. Something I have my eyes on right now is those cloak stacks, 28 and 27. The spike you get from finishing that cloak, I mean, we talked about this with Deathwalker. As soon as you get those final stacks and hit that 30th, get the evolved form, the mitigations you get just makes your character so much more unkillable. So eyes on Variety, eyes on Delny, trying to get these last two stacks for each of them. And with how much they were beating down on each other in solo lane, you got to assume they're both magical stacks. I mean... You get mitigation from the Osiris passive, mitigation from the Prophetic, and now from the Oni Hunters. It's going to be tough to kill Variety on the side of the Kallen Wardens. 
He will head back to base. Upgraded teleport, upgraded blink available to Variety. Still waiting on to finish out that last item. As we see these teams starting to group around for Pyromancer, for Fire Giant. Quig taking a bit of poke, big double stun. Some nice chip oh. from Yarkor as well. It will fire a couple of those stray autos in. Pyromancer now started by the Camelot Kings and will be secured by the Camelot Kings, but it's a landfall from Eliana to try and kickstart the fight. Quig is in danger, but Captain Twig and Variety are just bothering Nog in the back line, keeping the stop from joining the fight, but Slash removes his enemy jungler. That's one for the Warden. It's about to be a second because Yarkor goes down. It's a double kill for Slash, and it might be a bit more. Variety in the middle of three, trying to take down anyone he can, but he's getting stunned down. CC and triple kill for the jungler of the Kowloon Wardens. Big Man Tings and, Qu and Quig had to turn tail and run, and it's now the Wardens heading up to the Fire Giant. And, and that's a winning fight with Nog not even having ult. He uses that at the beginning and hits nobody. Fortunately for them, though, they're still able to win the fight. And I, I saw something pretty clearly in that fight, and it's Twig is going way too deep, way too fast. He's going before Variety, and he's dying without able to get much damage off. He has to play slower. When they play this comp, and they, as in the Scarabs, when they play it, Variety has to go in first, and then Twig has to clean up after. Quig has got to be more patient. Well, to see now how the Camelot Kings do on defense, because this entire game has been an offensive one for them. But you got to talk about Elyon starting that fight as well. It's a fight over Pyromancer. At, at this stage of the game, sure, a thousand true damage is nice to have around one of these objectives, but that wasn't even an ultimate that Elyon needed to throw out there. He just does. Says, all right, well, we'll see what I get from it. It pulls Quig out of position, which is a matchup that we were kind of talking about on the desk and one that we even kind of talked about, which was Terra into Maui. Feels pretty good for the Terra so long as you have one of those two structures to throw up. That landfall should mean nothing to Quig. Yeah, and, and Quig not expecting to get pulled again. I would assume that he is just ready from now on. Always going to have something down. Make sure that the Maui ult doesn't hit him. But I think when you see this Maui ult come out, I think a lot of the times it's just used as kind of like the fight starter. Like, they're using their dashes if I throw this, or they are going to be blinking onto us and we can take the fight after. A lot of time the Maui ult just has to be this engaged tool. It doesn't necessarily have to be the ability that's actually hitting. As we hit this 30 minute mark, just EF, or this FG on the side of the Wardens. Got eyes on a couple things. The alternate timeline coming back up at about 50 for BMT. And the Deathbringer finished by Tuba with Deathbringer, or just tier 2 Deathbringer for Yarkor. So those are the spikes that I'm keeping my eye on. And we get to the sieging portion. The Wardens don't really have like that all in. Like, like we said it before, they're mostly a poke, poke oriented comp. So it's on the Nog, it's on the Slash to kind of get some sort of poke before they actually look for that all-in. And we've seen Nog happy to throw out that ultimate, even if the fight's not starting. So Yarkor and B Big Man have to be ready at all times. Aeon and Delny step forward first. Nog channeling the ultimate for a moment, but cancels it out just to push the Camelot Kings a little further back, keep them cautious. That's when one of those final judgments might just rip right back. 10 seconds now on BMT's alternate timeline coming back up. All relics available in just a couple of seconds. But aside of the Kowloon Warden, didn't want to fight without an Aegis on Nog. Didn't want to fight without Beads or Aegis for Slash. Tier 2 tower under threat in mid lane now. So Elyon will walk up and take that tower. Minion's right behind it. Elyon swinging forward. Does have access to landfall, but not going to pull the trigger this time. Knowing all relics are available on the side of the Camelot Kings. Kowloon Warden's going to play cautiously. That's what I would say, but... Delny's going for a pincer maneuver. Let's take it. Let's see what the Kalen Wards they go for the team fight. Nice. I have everything. So, OC, OC, OC. Big poke, big poke. We right, can right, siege mid. Siege, 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 siege. Yeah, you can walk in. Touch my mouth. Touch my mouth. They're scared. They're scared. Yeah, they're scared. They're, scared. Go they're go left, giving it. They're giving it. They're giving it. Get in. Yeah, we have onies. I'm losing a lot of health though, so I'm Okay, we have onies. We have onies. We're out. We're out. I lost my mantle. Probably it's fine. Go. We have 40 seconds of terror, right, Jiri? A nice pick for the Kalen Wardens and a mid Phoenix to boot. Added one more tier two tower, and the Kalen Wardens have now swung the 4,000 plus gold lead the Camelot Kings had to be about 5k in their own. And with Fire Giant still on all five, the Kalen Wardens are going to keep up their pressure. Right side Phoenix, the next target. They've got a minion wave here. Delny blinks right to the back line, tries to keep BMT out. It's not taking a whole lot of damage either wow. on the inverse. It's their Phoenix that's just getting melted from the Camelot Kings. So now it's the Kalen Warden. All it takes, one pick, gets them tier two tower on middle, tier two on right, both Phoenixes as well.
And, and the pick on the Quig was phenomenal. All they used was just Maui pull and Tuba's ultimate. There was not four ultimates used. A lot of times we see these team teams look for picks and they use three, four ultimates for one player. That was not the case here. The Wardens calculated in their ability usage only using the Ishtar ult, and it l allowed them to go for that second Phoenix. If they have one ultimate, two ultimates, maybe they aren't able to get that second one. And now we also kind of see like that, that counterplay between this Terra and the Maui. Terra has nothing to stop the Maui pull. She has to try to stun him out of it, which is still just not the easiest thing in the world, especially if there's follow-up stuns on top of the pull. And when we get to this later game portion, one pull could spell death, as we just saw. All it takes is that one pick to open the door of opportunity for the Kalan Warrens and the Camelot Kings, especially around these fire giants. We're hitting EFG, though. Crit online for both of the hunters. Deathbringer available to the two of them. It's the Kalan Warden stepping up first. Quig back off of respawn. Means it'll be a full five versus five inside of the enhanced fire giant pit. One pick again is all you need to kickstart things. Kalan Warden's found that in lane. Allowed them to get two Phoenixes on an offense. But now the Camelot Kings are essentially kind of having to leave this middle lane by itself right now. That's going to allow these minions to start pushing in and eventually if the Kalan Wardens wait around long enough, they'll force the Camelot Kings into a 4v5. They might just try and go for that opportunity beats. now. Big man Tings. No beats. No ultimate from Nog Twig? either. And no life for Captain Twig. Elyon gets credit for the kill. But the Kalan Wardens just collapse on the jungler. And, and Twig is just so far forward for no reason. And also on top of that, Big Man just gets poked out. 3v5 looking to defend this fire. Righty, ults away, it's on top of Nog. No ultimate available for the Thoth, but he doesn't need one when he's got the backup for the rest of the team. The Nog kill? goes down though, Yarkor gets one, uses the Aegis, but there's too many people surrounding him, and Slash will pick up Quig by himself. Now Variety, the only one still up here to even try and defend. Big stun from Variety, but that stun is not enough. Double kill for Slash, and the Kalan Wardens, they don't care about Fire Giant anymore. It's just Big Man Tings to defend up against four. He's got two lanes that he's got to deal with and four members of the enemy team. He's got the alternate timeline here. There is some good outplay potential. 10 seconds on Twig who does have ult when he's up. Relic's not looking great for the Wardens also. Big man Tings is waiting around the corner. They're playing too he slow. Find anybody around the wall. He's going to sneak in from behind, but he misses the Raiju on Slash. He's got a Thunder Crash back over the wall. He's got the ultimate as well. Try to talk the back, but he gets alternate Twig's timeline. Here. And now his ultimate doesn't get much. Captain Twig is back. Finds a big Grand Joust on top of one. Big man Tings takes down Slash, but the Titan is falling too fast. Too bad. Takes down two for a double at the end, and the SCC strike first. And that was the exact opposite of a game I expected hearing about these two teams. I expected the Wardens to dominate early and to play the late game a little bit worse. But no, the comp they drafted doesn't play the early game very well, and they just manage it well enough to go to that late game. And we see that poke potential. Ryzen goes barely too far forward, eats a Nike jump, and then gets nearly one shot by just Slash and by Delny. And personally, so much more do I like Delny on this Nike than that Wukong we saw yesterday. He just feels like he's able to do way more, and I think he's the one that really sticks out to me in this game. And that team fight, I mean, that near pick on a BMT also comes from Nog just fire, rapid fire the ultimate. Not sit there, charge it up, yep. get ready for the, you know, screaming ready. Oh, when am I going to fire it? He just instantly shoots it off. BMT has to go back to base. And sure, you're now fighting without a Thoth ultimate, but you still got all that damage from Nog pumping into these tanks. Killing off these, you know, these backliners and whatnot. These hunters really are just not able to get there. Eventually, Yark is able to find his way to the backline, gets that kill, but he had to expend everything to get there. Yeah, and, and Twig, really good early game, but the late game, he just gets picked a few too many times. He's just out of position, and he gets punished for it. And, and I don't mind the Lance. I think the Lance can be really good, but he's got to play it slower. He's got to let Variety go in first. Got to see if you can get some backup in there ahead of time before you need it as a life support at that point. The Camelot Kings start off great, but fall apart at the end. It's the Kowloon Wardens who come out on top for game at number one in this best of five. We'll see if they can keep up that momentum in game two after this break.
Welcome to Smital. Here's how to play. You're trying to guess the god, and we're going to give you six hints to do so. With each hint, you get one guess. These hints can be card art, item builds from the Pro League, or even the god's release date. If you guess correct, you win. It's that simple. If you're wrong, however, you move on to the next hint until you're out of hints. Seems easy enough. Then let's play. Oh, you really, you really gave me nothing on this one. Unless it's a wing. Is that a wing? Cthulhu. We're some winged gods in Smite. We're some cool winged gods with maybe a purple wing. Chernabog. Who's got wings? Uh, Chernabog. It's, it's rare that I have no direction. Um, I'm just going to say AMC. I got nothing off that. You know, earlier this year we did those videos where we wrote all the gods that came out in a single year, and I wrote the ones for season two, and this is definitely season two. Let's go with Fafnir. Thanatos. I'm going to say AMC just to, so I can get another clue, even though I'm pretty sure it's wrong. No, we've already done that god, so it can't be him. Chiron. It's not Alposh, but it's after the Alposh goofy skin. Some sort of Martian? Well, oh, no, there's no way. That's so old. It couldn't have been. For some reason, I'm thinking of a Space Invaders Cupid skin, but I don't think that's it because that looked like a wing still. You know what? I got it's all that's in my head now. So I'm, I gotta go with, I gotta, no, I'm not. He's too old, there's no way. He's, that's not 2015, my brain is not letting me say that. Uh, I have to, Cupid. It's not Cthulhu, it's not Thana. It's got wings. Chernabog. You know what, I'm gonna go Nuwa. I think it can be, no, it can't be Vulcan. We've already done him. Um, I. Aplosh? Um, what does that even mean? This is an achievement. Going back in time. <laughs> Dude, I'm, man, maybe I should quit Smiles forever. <laughs> I'm doing pretty bad. Not a good track record today. Um, you know what? I'm gonna say, who's another, like... Oh, Discordia! It can't be Sol. Sol doesn't have wings. Eset. I got nothing off this, either. Let's do... Eset. I'm gonna feel like such an idiot in about five minutes when you tell me who it is, because I know I'm gonna get it wrong, because I don't have an answer here, man. I don't know, I'm gonna have to pass on this one. I feel so dumb. <sighs> I need to know more game, more skins and smite. I can't tell you who this is, so that's a full ass card art. So I'm just gonna name a goddess to get out of here. I'm gonna say Neath, even though it's absolutely wrong. Oh, right! Oh my God, yeah, no, I never would have got that off that. I forgot, I'm gonna be real with you. Loki, high key, forgot soul existed. And her name is literally just Sun. That's embarrassing. God, how embarrassing that'd be if I missed everything. Uh, okay, let's think. Light, soul. Not Issa. Gotta, oh, soul. She has wings? Goddess of the Sun. The only thing I can think of is Soul. It was Soul. What was the skin? I...
That's right. Cthulhu's Dream is available now. If you go to advance.gg slash smite, you can pick that up. My dream uh, is to be better at smitles, I've discovered. I forgot how bad I was that day, by the way. I recorded three of those. I got all three of them wrong. <laughs> so that was a really, really fun one. Uh, but you can do better than me. And by doing so, you can maybe, you know, fuel up and feel better. You can go to advance.gg slash smite, pick up Cthulhu's Dream. It's a delicious, delicious flavor. While you're at it, uh, you can pick up the cup. The shakers that Advanced GG make are fantastic. Uh, they're really, really good quality. And I'm jealous that these four have been sitting there the whole time, and specifically the Maui one that I've wanted to take for a long time. Uh, I have not, and because they are a set piece, and it would also be wrong to steal from work. So, Trelly. That's fair. That's, uh, that's I know good. you said, when, before we got into this, you said you were going to defend yourself. I'm furious, No man. matter what we said. He's, he's... I've done nine Smitals, <laughs> and like eight of them I've gotten first try. That's the one where I yeah. made it like to the fifth, and it had wings? Soul has wings? Since when? That's like the one I did horrible on, and we showed it. So thanks for that, Billy. I appreciate it. But it's all right. I deserved yeah. it. I didn't I, I didn't get it fair enough. It's, it's, like, it's whatever. It's yeah. Fine. Admittedly, also, I like Goddess of the Sun stared me down in the face, and my brain went, oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I knew I knew what the achievement was. I'm like, well, that's clearly Soul's achievement, but she doesn't have wings, so let's yeah, skip yeah, that yeah. one. All right. We're done talking about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's moving on. I'm sorry. Good news. I feel like I look better than I did then. So like, there's there's some there's been some upgrades, and like I remember Soul exists now. Uh, and speaking of things that look better now than they did before, the Wardens yep. beginning of the game, a little bit of a rough path, right? Into the game, really really solid play style for them. And Trelly, it really is a, a couple of turnarounds. I mean, the Kings have a gold lead, the Kings have a kill lead, the Kings have a match lead. In this game, it just feels like everything is coming up for them. And then the Wardens just kind of rally around and, and surge forward. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. Remember, yesterday, the Wardens were sort of in that position where they were ahead, and then these late-game team fights, someone would get picked, a small mistake, a small capitalization, and that's exactly what happened this time around. Uh, it was a bit of an overstep. Captain Twig tries to dive, and Lancelot is such a difficult character to pilot late-late game because you don't really have one-shot potential. You have plenty of damage, but you need to get it off, whereas... You also have this massive shield that Twig kept counting on. He would go in and then try and ult out. And how many times did we see him die while he was hopping on the horse? Seconds before that massive shield would come in. And because of that, right there, see? Yeah, that shield's about to come through, but he dies. And now it's a 5v4. You don't have your, your Lancelot ult. And then it's just a chase down potential. Slash really did come online towards the late game. And he showed up big for the team. That's exactly what they needed. You get... A massive turnaround, solid defense, great play coming out from the Kowloon Wardens. 2-0 and 12, 0-1 and 11. I mean, your front line's making sure that you have plenty of space. And, of course, Slash Tuba picking up as many kills and the damage from the mid lane really standing out. Everybody on the Wardens, I think, needs to be, be happy about that. And if you're looking at the Kings, a, a majority of the, at least the early game, right, was well played, right? right? Uh, around objectives, around the fights, they managed to hold their own there. It's just making sure that some of those slip-ups later on don't happen. But if you're the Wardens, you got to be feeling great, right? I think coming into this, you're, you're up against the reigning world champs. Maybe a little bit of nerves, although I didn't really get that from any of them. Uh, so you wanted to make sure that you were coming in smooth sailing to get a win under your belt at first has to be enough to give you a, a nice little boost of confidence. So picks and bans, game two. How are things going to shift? Well, we're going to keep the same sides. Kings, our first pick. Wardens will be second. So far as well, we're going to keep the same bans. Daji, as well as the Athena. Now, last time around, what was Thanatos, the Aphrodite. We got the Kukul Khan, and then... My mind's blanking on the last one, but I know it was a support. Maybe it was the Ganesh. I know he definitely came through. Yep, the Ganesh was the third one. And so far, we're all coming down for the four to remain the same. Do you ban a Kuku Khan to try and limit what the Wardens get? Where is the King's mindset? I'd try to get Kuku for, for the tanks. Nike. Yeah, I would try and grab that Kuku 100%. Delny was top damage for the majority of this game, absolutely being a threat. I think towards that last fight, the reason it went so poorly is... Del needed like half health tings and got his beads before it even started. He goes back to base, and the rest of the kings have to fight without their Ryzen, right? So I can see why the Nike was so highly prioritized. But now the water are in a position where I don't think you want to let Cuckoo through, man. Cuckoo is just such a deciding factor. Tings on point with that character pretty consistently. Sure, you can still get the Thoth later on. And maybe the Thoth is something the kings would want, but it was Ganesh ban here into Hachi pickup. I don't think we see that mirrored. I, I I would choose the cuckoo in this spot if I'm the Wardens. 
They're going to be thinking about it. They, they, gonna they, go for the they can't put five bands on a quig if they ban Cuckoo here, so that's my mistake. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> they gotta think, Charlie, you got to think about it. Think of how much quig – because he goes to the Terra last game. Right. Baron's definitely still been up there. Maybe they top pick. What? Uh, or top three a support pick. But they go for the Thoth over the Cuckoo, and Nog, Trelly – has been looking real good on Cuckoo Khan. Bro, I saw him hit a four-man Cuckoo ult like from 5k gold behind. I would not be letting that pick through in this case. So we will see. We will see if the Kukulkan is something the Wardens want to grab immediately. I would say Hachi Cuckoo isn't a bad look at all. But the Maui is something they value a little bit more. I did love it from LA Owen. He did have a lot of control. There was one landfall that I thought was crucial that needed to be hit was a little bit off the mark. And Twig gets out because of it. But hey, they ended up getting the set win. So, And also, I'm, I'm silly. You don't even have to pick Cuckoo. They already picked Thoth. They're not yeah. gonna, it's not as if they're going to grab the, the Kukulkan here. So I, I assume Cuckoo's the top three there. Gone are the days, Trelly, of having to worry about double mages. Yep. <laughs> At least, specifically, those two as well gave us a, a little bit of leeway because it wasn't often that we would see Thoth go solo in right. Cuckoo mid. I think... Yeah. Warriors probably did that because I could see Sot pulling that out, but realistically, it was not something often, and it's not common now. I'm actually really curious as to what Delny's going to go for because I feel like the Wukong has been high on the list, but not necessarily high on the win rate. And so, you know, Osiris has been in that conversation. The Nike, since it's been taken out, I I'm curious, but I agree with you where Cuckoo is probably next for the Wardens. Now, what the Kings want to go for... Well, that's all up in the air. Quig, if he wants to get any of those other picks, should go for it now because otherwise it'll be banned. Uh, but you're not feeling too much pressure otherwise, right? A few hunters available. They're hovering Rom right now, but we've seen, you know, Ishtar in that conversation, uh, Onher's in that conversation. So you've got quite a few uh, to, to be able to make it through without having to worry about the wardens. I'm also curious about jungle picks this one, Charlie, because I feel like we've gotten... Slash to play Slash Gods, right? right? As long as Slash is on Slash Gods, that feels real good. Uh, and admittedly, it's also, outside of the Thanatos, really hard to ban out because I feel like Slash will just play some of the most random things. Yeah, he certainly will. That Thanatos is a pick that he loves. Of course, the Suki is also in his God pool. But on the other side, in my mind, one of the dream matchups here for the Kings is if they got their hands on, like, Hunbat's Ares, right? That is something they would love to grab. The Beads Burn, they, they play around those team fight ultimates quite well. The Wardens have been banning the Ares in this slot. And there goes the Cuckoo, of course. I mean, it'd be they banned the Baron this time? <laughs> I guess because of the, the Cuckoo, they don't love the matchup. But that's hilarious that they let it through. Quig said, I don't want it. And they're giving them the possibility of the Ares Hunbats. That, that, I would grab that immediately if I was the Camelot Kings. You got the Beads Burn. You have one of Twig's best gods. Quig can be an absolute menace over in duo lane early on, which is exactly what Ares brings. And you can make Cuckoo's life a little bit more difficult, only having one form of CC immunity. And that's something that they have the potential for. The question is where they go. Sukiyomi, or not Sukiyomi, Susano. He's the one who gets banned out. Sukiyomi's still available. And the Sun Wukong gets banned as well. So it's going to be the double shots towards Delny, one shot. I guess technically three shots over towards the jungle. Warden's held on to that pick a little longer, so I wouldn't be surprised if this ends up being so long. Who do you like that has a matchup into Achilles right now? Is it Bologna? Because that's who they're getting. No, I, I think I would have, well, there's a lot of these, long, so Nike and Wukong are at the top of that list, right? Warriors Axe Procs, that's what you're playing for. You're trying to just outrange the Achilles. I wouldn't have hated an Osiris, but I guess that's not Delny's MO here. So just going for an auto attacker, trying to run down Rama, trying to run down Thoth. And the Yamoja? Gets the whole way through, which is going to be always a good time, right? You have so much damage, and this is interesting. I think this pick has been left untouched because I assume no one in the game wanted to play Maman. They didn't feel like, you know, staking their their chance at Worlds on Maman, who she can be kind of difficult to pilot, but ends up getting locked in here. We'll have to see. Captain Twig's able to make a big difference. This is a disgusting team comp as far as I'm concerned. The Camelot Kings have range damage, late game hard, hard carries. Yarkor does not miss snipes. Be ready for that. The Rama's going to be on point. You got your execute for the tanks. You have a Yamoja. <laughs> and then, of course, Amon Brigitte, who in the right hands can be one of the best junglers in the game. And that's the, the big question mark, right? And I know there were, were moments last time around, and there have been moments this week where sometimes it's, okay, Twig, you know, goes in, gets a big play. Sometimes Twig goes in, gets no play. And so that's going to be the question, uh, I think, on their mind. 
Lions. Nope. Don't don't analyze it. I'm ignoring. It. Yeah, I'm it's ignoring not, it for that now. That's not getting locked. I want to ask about the emoji because please do. The emoji don't has ask been me about that. So limited for so long, it feels like, and, and yet recently she has really fallen down the ladder of, of where people prioritize her. Some people are still absolutely insane. I think Quig is a really solid emoji player. But where does she fit right now in the grand scheme? As far as I'm concerned, Yamoja is still going to be that game changer. The healing is ridiculous. The setup is ridiculous. As long as you're not into one of these annoying matchups like the Awelix or like the Baron, you're going to have a good time. And Quig knows what he's doing on the pick as well. And that's a big deal, right? It's all about positioning. It's all about spam healing your team. And that's what he's going to bring. I'm glad we saw the, the, the switch up there into the circuit, but still not my favorite jungler at the moment, man. She is in such a weird position where you can't really build her tanky because then she doesn't have the damage. You can't. Everyone builds her tanky. There's no way it's a full damage to cat. It's just not going to happen in the meta we're in. But if you don't build her full damage, you have that fall off potential where Maman is going to walk up and just 100 to 0 you late game. So cat is setting up for the squad. So you're putting a lot of weight on Tuba. You're putting a lot of weight on Nog. They also have a lot of setup. And Cuckoo has the potential to just win a team fight, right? Spirit of the Nine Winds can say, this fight is over. You don't get a chance. That doesn't mean that Big Man Tinks doesn't have the same exact damage on his side as well. Sir Ket, Trelly, of all things, was at the very, very end. Right. And I'm kind of curious, both synergy with the team and just in general right now, where does Sir Ket live? I don't love the Sir Ket, but if you can, if you can build a little hybrid, get some lucky crits, and just play setup. Like, one thing you have to make note of, because Slash, again, he was a solo laner for quite some time, just recently got into the mix of the jungle. That's why I think he's not playing a Wheelix into a matchup like this. That's why I think he's not playing, you know, the Hunbats, the Thor, the, some of these top meta picks. He's playing what he what he knows. And in this case, you gotta be on point right away and say, listen, when I jump, like when I ult, when I use last breath, I'm going to be throwing him this way, or I'm gonna throw towards the wall. You have to follow up immediately, because if not, relics come through, your CC gets sort of chained together and it becomes a bit of a mess. So they need to say that right away. Like, listen, bro, when I, when you have Spirit of the Nine Winds and I last breath someone, I'm throwing them directly at you or the wall. Like you need to, <laughs> that the comms have to be clear because it can mess up an entire team fight if you're like, I got him, and then you're thrown the wrong way. You missed two ults, and now the fight's over. I mean, it is something like this draft has a whole lot of, right? Maui, hey, I'm going to pull a lot of people into this spot right here. Just kill them. Shoot right there. Bologna, I'm going to stun them. Uh, there's a lot of, like, hey, you know what? Like, ignore what the King's gameplay is. It's just line up Nog for success, and that's honestly proven to work out pretty well for the Wardens in the past. Yeah, I don't I don't hate that game plan at all. Right <laughs> At this point, you have... I'm amazed that the Cuckoo got through, but Tings had a preference, right? He he had the choice. They said, Thoth or Cuckoo, let us know. And he said, first pick Thoth. You know what? We're going to have to see whether or not that first pick Thoth stands up to what it is, or with Wardens find themselves a 2-0 lead. The only way to find out is to jump over to our casters. We got JMac, we got Inbound, and we got game number two. That's right, thank you so much, Gore and Charlie. Over on the desk, that's right, it's game two with the Camelot Kings and the Kowloon Wardens here in our best of five, our qualifier matchup. And I'm not going to mince words with this one. No, it's not. It's J-Max and Doug. We've got to introduce ourselves first. How in the world, in the year of our Lord and Savior 2024, are we bottom picking Yamoja Maman on the side of the Camelot Kings? How did they get away with that? You know, before even introductions, I think we should have touched on this. We could have came back and then introduced ourselves, but you were right. Bottom two, Yamoja Maman. The late game potential of this Kings comp, I mean, is through the roof. In that Twitch poll, 51% Kings, 49% Wardens. They had to vote I, before they saw those. I was going to say, I guarantee you, before you actually saw these P's and B's, the Wardens were probably 70%, and then it just instantly flipped to the other side because that is an insane bot two. If I would have ever told you, Maman Yamoja bottom two, especially for a Worlds qualifier match, it, it, it's crazy. Like, there was an opportunity to take the Maman for the Wardens, take the Yamoja. Well, everyone's had the opportunity to take the Yamoja. She's obviously fallen down a little bit on the, the prio potential, but that character is still really good late game. And you pair that with the Maman, you pair it with the Thoth, a Rama, an Achilles. If this King's comp goes 25 minutes, 25 is all they need. I don't know how they lose. Especially a Mojo on a player who time and time again has gone to this pick as a comfort guy. You know, Yamoja, whether she is or isn't top of the meta is to be determined sometimes. 
Leon's still gonna get aggressive with two, but stun just off the mark by Leon. That one connects. That's probably a beads by Yark just to escape there, but I mean, this is a god that Quig has gone to so many times when he first joins the Kings, when he's still comfortable on his time with the Eldritch Hounds. I mean, this has been a god that he has really cemented his name with. So being able to bottom to that one and then giving Captain Twig such a power pick in Mamon is crazy to think that e even though we are only, you know, this isn't the qualifying game or the elimination game, it's crazy to think the Camelot Kings are able to get away with a draft like this. And, and you're 100% correct. This is a, a crazy da da draft, and we're, we're a minute and a half in, and we're still gushing about this draft because this is unexpected. This is an unprecedented draft for the Kings, but on the opposite side, the Wardens don't have a bad draft for themselves. They've got a, a very good draft. It's just how strong this Kings, Kings comp is. And I think a lot of this is going to come down to Slash on the Cirquette and this early gank. Wig dashes forward, lands him off bank, gets the stun after the bubble. Not enough, but Yark's in hand is the Camelot Kings on the board first. But now it's Slash rotating through with only a 2v3, not an ideal target, and standing on a ward. The Camelot Kings knows that he's here. The snake is back out, and the fire is starting to do some damage to Slash as well. He's going to try and fight for the shield buff, but will not commit too much to it with so many people standing by. With that early gank, getting this Maman, this Rama out to that early lead. And you think about the Warden's comp. I, I, I guess I shouldn't say 25 minutes, it's going to be hard to see this King's comp winning. Because when you look at the other side, Cuckoo late game can just eviscerate somebody off the map. Just one shot them, get them off, erase them. And, and that's like the, the strength of this Mirrodin mid mages. But you have one on the other side also, one that maybe the ult is a little bit easier to hit. So if we do go to that late game portion, it's going to be very interesting 5v5s to watch. I'm also very interested to see how those 1v1s happen between Twig and Slash, because I think there's a lot of outplay potential for both of them. A lot of movement and a lot of damage. Twig and Slash find each other inside of the jungle. Twig and Variety are still going to push up towards blue, maybe. Let's go from damage on Delny instead. Maybe just that little bit of poke is enough. The Camelot Kings to also want to step back. So maybe we don't want to go too far forward in enemy lines. Just to try, you know, steal a blue buff away, even this early in the game. Tuba stunned out by Quig. Bubble lands. Elyon tries to pull Yarkor back, but probably not the ideal target to pull at all at this point. Just because of how much damage Yarkor is still doing, even with only that tier 2 devours online. Every 50, 60 damage that goes through really sticks at the stage of the game when all of your potions are gone. And typical soul lane fashion, we see a battle over the totem where at least one of them is using an ultimate to confirm it. Yeah, and that's a big thing we saw with Deathwalker also on this Bologna and on that Osiris. Happy to burn that ult because it is a little bit lower of a cooldown, especially on this Bologna, 75 seconds, it'll be back up. Also a little bit of safety from those protections in her passive. She also has that tier two failing side assume. Potential for Berserkers, but we've seen a ton of Phalanx, which, by the way, the buff to that item makes it just so good. I, and uh, really, if Delny backs, he gets this Phalanx. I, I don't see how he's really ever going to die, because he gets those magical protections also when the Maman is ganking him. Do you see Contagion as a response by Variety for his first item? So that deals with not a whole lot of healing on the side. It's mostly just that CC. Get hit by that CC, and well, now all of a sudden, Variety's getting that free extra chip damage, and that disarm is going to count every single time to poke back at Delny. So not only taking the damage, you're also not going to be healing a whole lot. And as you can see, there's that first proc of it right now, just to slowly chip away at Delny's HP. Delny still playing for those camps, and Mumon actually maybe looking for a ganker. He's still here for the cooldown buff. Delny ult is back up. Right, he dashes forward, stun onto Delny. The second stun from Captain Twig. Good Execute hold. Execute there. Available for variety, but not used with Slash on the way. Could have been an extra kill for the Cowland Warden. So, Camelot Kings, play patiently. Send Delny back to base, because it's 80 seconds, at least until the teleport he is back him. up. But Big Man Tinks gets clipped by Nog. This man is doing it all by himself. Don't need no setup. Don't need no teammates. He's just letting these ultimates rip every time. Where did he even flank from? Did he come around from the right mids and just wrap around Big Man and Big Man just didn't see him there? Big Man has everything available, beads, he has the dash, I'd assume, but he just holds it because of the Maui pull. Landfall pulls back Quig. He's got River's Rebuke if needed, but not going to use that. Instead, it's just that fight over the shield that goes the way of the Kalan Wardens. And Variety going to play aggressive at the enemy blue buff. 
Not able to steal that one away, but still getting that strong chip damage up against Slash, Delny. Every one of those hard CCs that hits, that taunt from the circuit, that disarm from Delny is just stacking up free damage for Variety. Something to pay attention to as we hit this middle. I guess it still is a little bit more early game, but the beads for the Emoja. So there's no team fight relic for this Emoja. This is a pretty popular Emoja thing because of just... Ooh, close. If he hits that root, there's... They're diving? Gets the stun. Nah, you don't want to continue to okay. dive there. That was, <laughs> they looked like they wanted it. If that first bubble probably hits and then the stun catches them a little bit closer to the line, maybe we see that dive. And with how low Tuba is there, Yarkor maybe looking to go into the air to get that kill. But Tuba gets the reset off, gonna get start getting some stacks, and already seeing in dual lane, massive stack advantage for the Kings. And that is when we see that finish stacking for Yarkor, he gets that flat pen. That ultimate is very strong against those backliners. A lot of times we'll see Ramas, even in the middle of fights, just go into the air just to get some poke damage to allow the dive to clean up. Oh, he Delny. jumps over, stun from Variety, but now it's Captain Twiggy who's found him. Throws out a snake, stuns him out from the potion. Big ultimate from the boom of the explosion of souls, and then the execute after the double ult. Now the Camelot Kings are right side, nets themselves their second kill. And Delny up downs at probably the worst possible time. Literally right before Captain Twig goes across the ward, Delny up downs and he gets punished for it. Almost gets out, it was rather close, but just enough chase potential and then the execute on this Achilles. And this is why, you know, a lot of times Achilles is locked in just because in this middle portion of the game, you don't have to 100 to zero the frontliners. If you get them down to that 25%, that is an execute for the Achilles. And you can even chain that into one or two. And it's always, it's always interesting to see how Achilles play that middle portion. Do they play to dive and to like execute a backliner because you still only have to get them to 25 or do they play front to back? Especially when you have such good damage out of this King's comp, maybe they can play front to back. Man, Ting's hit by the tornado. Let's deal the with the Kudra. Oh, gets it again? Are you kidding me? Big Man Ting's does get one before he goes down, but Captain Twig returns the favor. Nog finally falls. It takes a full rotation for the Camelot Kings to do so, but this man Free hands yet another ultimate and takes down the mid laner a second the time. This man is crazy with this god. And something that we saw in the middle of that fight is Twig was just able to 1v1 Nog because Nog was playing so far forward to get that ultimate onto Thoth that he put himself out of position and Twig, I mean 1-0-3 oh, on this Maman already. He's getting himself into a great spot to just be able to carry this game. And we've seen Maman's just 1v5. We've seen Maman's generally 1v5 because of the damage, the survivability, and he's already two levels up on Slash. He's that level 10. Curious to see where he goes with the build, I think. A uh, little bit of flexibility with how you build her. Can you go, you can go do more, but you can go book. Seen a little bit of Deso, a little bit of Soul Gem. The only things for sure is Mirden and Rada Tahuti because those are massive, massive spikes for her. We'll keep our eyes on Captain Twig's build path. Seems maybe Typhon's Fang might be the next call for Captain Twig on this jungle mage. Yarkor trying to zone Tuba out of a bit of farm. Keep him away from some of these big minions that have been left back. Not often do we see the dual lane still sticking together this late into the game. We, I mean, we did see some rotations from Quig over towards mid, Elyon as well, but coming back over and soaking up farm for the duo, probably because there's not a whole lot else happening across the map at this point, so... Take your free farm and your opportunities to do so when you can get it. Quick is on the mark. Tuba falling a bit behind in HP now, half HP for him versus Yarkors. Quig has been just landing stun after stun and really keeping this hunter in a dangerous spot. Same for Leon. He's had to use the solar swing just to jump away from Yark at this point. This is this is a man who will stand his ground firmly every single time. You've got to bring the fight to Yark. And the reason we see this Yamoja kind of sitting on the duo side of the map is this character in 2v2s in this middle portion is just phenomenal. You don't have to invest mana or, or cooldowns or anything to be able to heal up your teammate. Your autos can just heal you up. Your 2 is also going to be healing up a lot. And, and we saw the, the damage potential. Tuba gets hit by just two of her ones, and he's instantly down to half health. Yorko is able to follow up a little bit, and Tuba's getting bullied out very, very easily. And if we get to that, actually, a little damage. Another ult hit by Nog connects. A little bit of setup from Leon, but the windfall, it blocks off the path of the Riptide. Nog gets another kill for himself. Now three and one for the mid laner. Wait, and beats. Slash was a little bit more because Twig stepped too far for that one. We'll go to the jungler, the Kalen Wardens. 
now with four. First kill for the jungler of the game, but a third for the mid laner. A massive ultimate, but maybe an even better landfall from Elyon to cut off Quig's path. And, and why did Twig walk back up? He was out, and then he looked for the all-in. His beads weren't available, and then he used alt before Slash even used anything. He just put himself into death's door for no reason. I think that's, like, the, the biggest mistake I've kind of seen from Twig recently is he's the one that wants to get involved a lot. A lot of the times he's not playing fights patient enough. Variety actually steals that blue buff away from Downey. This has been bully fest central. For Variety on the right-hand side of the map. I've only seen Slash rotate over there maybe once or twice to try and bail out, but Captain Twig puts Variety in a good spot and puts himself in not so hot of a spot there in the mid lane. The four versus four in kills, but gold is still in favor of Camelot Kings, about to the tune of about 1,800 up experience in similar spot. But these tiny little spikes, every time we see the Calum Wardens get one of those kills, you see it spike down just gradually. And sometimes... That one little kill, again, can start to kickstart the fire under a team, especially in a few more minutes while the Pyromancer are up, Gold Fury going to start becoming more and more of an option. Speaking of, we're seeing Nog not go towards that Mirrodin in third slot. He's actually starting Tier 1 in the pen tree. And that's actually a good call-out because Mirrodin third is like the definitive build for these, uh, I, I don't know, big mage ultimate gods. Not like Ryzen and stuff like that, but the ones that can actually use the Mirrodin. We see it opted to in that third slot. Nog going for op shard probably means, I, I mean, they want to kill Quig, obviously, but Mirden does that just as well. Captain Twig throwing back beads, used, and will accidentally jump into Slash. Puts him in a bit of a dangerous spot, but able to still get away. But now that's beads away from the jungler on the Camelot Kings, but the Kings are still grouped up on the platform. Here for this first beacon spawn, Leon will walk forward, being met with three, and a lot of poke coming from BMT. Not the safest spot for Leon to be. Wow. We'll still maintain it, but Ooh. Nog just gets slammed by a final judgment. No chance that he's going to want to stick around anytime soon. Might just throw a tornado out, get some clear, or just head back to base and reset himself. And that's what we saw last game from Nog, just setting out those alts and connecting. And Nog, a little bold here. Stays there. Wait, he's dead. Vegas used a bit too early in the ultimate. Swings left. Doesn't find anything this time. Variety, though, has he gone too far forward? It's level 12 to 13. No, he's fine. BMT right there to back up Variety. Just an early Aegis used by Nog. Now leads to his downfall. He should have just gone to base a little bit sooner, but he steps back forward. El Leon clipped by the explosion of Souls, and now stuck in the River's Rebuke. Can't even find an escape out. Captain Twig going to try and close the gap and chase him down while Quinn takes the tower. Captain Twig does get one. Now it's Slash all by himself. Captain Twig the taking it for a taxi ride himself, and now it's BMT with the kill on a Slash. And we're starting to see the strength of this core 3v3 for the Kings. This Maman, this Thoth, this Yamoja. So much damage, so much survivability. I, I almost think Elyon maybe missteps a little bit, not going for an early heart word because of how strong that core damage actually is. Mitigates a lot of what they want to do, but he opts for this Relic Dagger to get that shell up a little bit more. Nog here, no ult for another few seconds. Charges the ultimate. Quick's getting a bit low, has to reset back to Captain Twig. The Pyromancer goes to the Camelot Kings. And now we're really starting to see the lead develop. 4,000 at 14 minutes is similar to what we saw in the previous game. Now, the question is how far can the Camelot Kings push this lead compared to game number one? You've got the momentum, you've got the kills, you've got those that XP and gold. And now it's, start to, now it's time to start really pushing those leads. Yeah, and I think this game, it started a little bit slower, but it seems like it's a bit more consistent at this 10 to 14 minute mark. And with these objectives still available, at least the Gold Fury still available. Variety also up two levels right now with the TP upgraded. I want to see Variety rotate over and get ready for this objective because right now, Nog has no Aegis. Nog is a pretty free kill for the Maman, the, the Achilles. And, and especially on top of that, no Phantom Shell yet too. So the value from that Yemoja ult is going to be through the roof. And I think this is a big opportunity for the Kings to extend their lead. I'm honestly surprised we haven't seen that Phantom Shell picked up sooner from Elyon. Instead, just focusing on part of the build. Does get that Relic Dagger. So that does mean the Shell will be up a little bit sooner. Then maybe what Quig is accustomed to, I think, with the combination of that Relic Dagger and just upgrading might put it a little bit sooner than when we get to see those Rivers Rebukes. Do you have a Prophetic Cloak also built by Quig? Not too many stacks on it just yet. Only needs a couple of range in hands to do so, but 
Now Captain Twig on the left side. Thought maybe we'd see a bit more of a fight around this duo lane, but it's still just scrapping more than anything over the shield buff. Make sure to get all the neutral farm that you can and really try and extend your lead a bit more. Delny is just getting handled by Variety. I think there's no other way to put it is that Variety is just owning this solo lane. Yeah, and it seems like Hopefully it's going to rotate out of that soul lane soon because th there's not much more bullying you can do at this point. This Bologna is getting very, very tanky. She's got that execution to finish. Maybe potential for her to actually take that fight right now because Variety still is not reset for that third item. And with this Gold Fury still available, it, it seems like the Kings are playing this maybe a little bit too slow for my liking. Their lead is very good right now, but it's not good enough. At 16 minutes, you got to start pushing somewhere. They're just kind of farming it out right now. Purple buff is available. Some of them can go get deep wards, play around these tier one towers, and, and especially Gold Fury. Play around this Gold Fury. Right, he's sitting on 3k in hand. That's crazy. We when got will back. he go to base? I think he's backing now to finally start spinning some of that up. Full Pestilence on back. Something that we saw a lot built by Deathwalker on a Simon Solo and even able to pick up tier one in the Stone Tree. Going for that Druid Stone right away. Let's we'll see where he goes. With that, I don't know. A couple of big options and go towards that Stone of Binding, but only have one real reliable CC to pro kind of proc there, so maybe that Arc Druids could be an option for Variety. Or even something else to dive. Something to get a little bit of extra damage there. We'll see. We'll keep our eyes on Variety as the game goes on. 2-0 and for him. 2-1 for Captain Twig, who's gone for double lifesteal himself. Typhon's Fang and Bancroft's Talon. Interesting to see the Bancrofts. Curious if he goes for the Bancrofts Claw for a little bit of that shielding when he is taking those fights, because Sir Ket, as a character, is very good into lifesteal characters because their ult cancels a lot of that healing out. Actually, all of that healing out, but shielding absorbs her ultimate, so maybe something there. Twig looking for maybe something on a Tuba. Oh, Captain Twig gets Aegis and ultimate from Tuba. Snipe's not quite enough, but threatens half of the health of the Hunter. Fast dash from Captain Twig gets away for the taunt of Slash. And now it's the full force of the Camelot Kings on the left side. They've got Vision on the Gold Fury. They even have they a Bracer this. dropped in position. The Gold Fury is just melting at the hands of the Camelot Kings. Can Elyon get in there and steal it with a landfall? No, he cannot. It's too little, too late. But he pulls back two with the ultimate. And Variety there to zone the carries out. Camelot Kings get themselves one objective. And every single one of them can get out of this team fight relatively unscathed. And the Kings finally getting that Gold Fury. Almost. Eesh. Wait, what? Eesh, the poke. Oh, I said it. Eh. But yeah, so about 6,000 gold for this. A pyro spawning here available too. And the king's looking to rotate here as Tuba sits on the left side of the map. Looks like you're opting to give up both the beacon and the pyro. Pyro. Half HP. Delny walking forward. They don't have landfall to try and take this one away. Pyromancer to get reset, but the Camelot Kings do secure wow. even under the threat of a Kakulkan ultimate. Variety, I think, takes that last breath damage. From Slash. Now, ultimate not used. It's just that taunt to pull him back a little bit. But Variety rather healthy now. On to the Achilles. It's all about the reset. Now for the Camelot Kings. You've got two objectives off of that. Some nice golden pockets to go back and spend. But as you point out, and something we can maybe kind of sink our teeth into a bit, Arcturoid's Fury picked up by Slash in the jungle this time. Yeah, and Charlie talked about this on desk where you aren't going to be building full damage circuit. You need some semblance of survivability. Interesting to see the Arc Druids after its buffs. It's in a very good spot. We've not seen a ton over the past few days, so it's, it's curious to see why on the circuit this game, and it just seems a little bit of extra damage when he is going for that dive. The, the item works as the more damage you take, the more damage you do to the enemy. Stun from Twig beats Huge down Aegis. Aegis and the Shell used to try and keep Nog alive, but there's just too much damage from Yark and Twig, and even too much for Elyon as Variety shows up to the party. And the Camelot Kings notch two more in the kill column. Now it's Captain Twig hunting for Slash. Taunt and ultimate used against Captain Twig, but he's still marching he forward. He's still going to go for another one. Yeldy, he ults over the wall. Oh. <laughs> Taken down by BMT. The final judgment removes the solo laner off the map. And the Camelot Kings can pick up a free fire giant. And now the Kings are starting to roll. 6,000, 7,000 gold. They've got fire giant. Now they back. They've got a bunch of starters that they're going to be able to finish. They've got a bunch of items they're going to be able to finish. And if they hit this level 20 on the Momon, the spikes are going to be insane. And we talked about if this comp gets to late game, they're in an incredible spot. 
And so far, it seems like they've already gotten to their late game. And we're only 20 minutes into this game. And nearly 10,000 gold up. Starting to push to the tier 2 tower. Players still coming off of a respawn. Camelot Kings will be able to walk away with this one as well. So tier 1, tier 2, 4 kills and a fire giant have really started to balloon this lead out of control for the Camelot Kings, that 10k. And as you mentioned, plenty of time to go back and spend up that golden hand. Look at this, another 3,000 in the pocket of Variety. Captain Twig <laughs> just, you know, goes back to base. 3k for Yarkor. I mean, that's whatever he wants to finish up from here. Go ahead and grab that kin size and nearly finish up that next item after. He's actually going to be able to get that starter on top. Same with Variety. True. So now those spikes are going to be insane. Sundering Axe, alternate timeline, Compassion. Everybody but Twig, unless Twig just backs right now or, or after these back camps. Everybody but Twig has the starter items finished for the Camelot King side. And we get to these late game fights. Quig is able to sustain up a lot of the poke that the Wardens have. And if you look at the Wardens comp, their poke is pretty non-existent. A lot of it, they have to put themselves out of position. Maybe Tupa can hit some Hachiman ones to get some poke, or maybe Na can get a few ones snuck in there without taking too much poke in return. And Twig actually able to finish up that Mirrodin also, so massive spikes coming through for the Kings. Th this could be very close to game. I if the Wardens overcommit a little bit too much to this fight, the Kings end easily. I think Captain Twig is just trying to get any farm that he can right now so he can go back and finish oh, up that Bumbus, but Tuba takes, what was that, one auto, one hieroglyphic shot, and we'll go ahead and march back to base as Variety pushes up tier two tower. Still three of the Camelot Kings over on the left-hand side. Final Judgment being charged up by BMT. Let's it fire against the dog no. and nearly eliminates him away. The Phoenix is down. BMT gets thrown Big back man? by Slash, but it's not enough damage. The alternate timeline is there. Big Man Tings is back on the scene. The Camelot Kings can continue to march forward. Variety goes in. Stun doesn't connect, but Big neither taunt. does the damage from Captain Twig. The Kalan Wardens live for now. They remove a couple of important resources from the Kings, but they lose their Phoenix still. And that right there is the strength of the alternate timeline. Big Man nearly gets wiped off the map before they can even get that Phoenix. Fortunately, he gets that second life, and the rest of the team is ready to take the fight after. And I guess fortunate for the side of the Wardens also, a lot of them lived very low after Big Man came back alive with the alternate. And they're all able to get out of there, especially with that Maman damage ticking. If Slash isn't able to hit that taunt on Variety, maybe we're talking about one or two more going down and potential middle Phoenix. But before we even talk about, you know, what is their next opportunity, they've got a Primal they're taking, they've got the Tier 2, the Tier 1, the Phoenix, and then they also got the Pyro. So a bunch more Golden Hand for the Camelot Kings, about 2,000 for four of them. We're almost six items deep for the carries at 23 minutes in this game. I mean, even better combo than Camelot Kings and 3,000 gold in pocket at they this point. It. It's like the fourth they time now this game that the Kings are just sending some time saying, oh, you know, there's still a lot of farm on the map. I can grab that before I head back to base. Well, you know, one more camp, you know, before I go back. Well, you know, now my speed buff spawned in. Might as well I just clear that out. It. it is a bump of spear for Captain Twig and going towards Rush some play. defense last side. I'm worried about some of that dive to be taking a bit too much damage. If you go towards Tuba, maybe Slash can deal quite a bit back at him. So wanted to be on, play on the safer side. And defense from ahead feels really good if you're Captain Twig right now. Yeah, now he's all, the only thing he's got to be worried about now is that Cuckoo ultimate and with Nog finishing that Mirrodin. Yes, he's not six items deep, but this is the spot Cuckoo wants to be in so he can actually get near one shot damage. I don't think it's necessarily one shot damage yet. I think he still needs that one more item. But that threat is there. And with the chase down potential of Slash, Big Man and Yarkor gotta be ready. And, and I guess Twig on top of that also has to be ready for that Cuckoo ult. So before we get ready for this Fire Giant, I wanna I wanna keep my eyes on these mid laners because that's two Mirrodins. Usually we have like one Mirrodin character. Usually it's one of these is banned. This game we have two Mirrodin characters. Well, Long three, range. Three people, long range. Three yeah, people yeah. who built it, but two people who are des more designed towards it. Yeah, yeah. Two, two long range maids ultimates, and those are the ones that I want to pay attention to. This Cuckoo, this Thoth. When we get to this Fire Giant, who can out secure if there's an actual fight happening? A couple members of the Kings going to go back to base and reset themselves. Wards, power potions, all those things starting to come online for some of these carries. Quig's even going to get back and finish up his Pridwin now. And available some extra defense, another shield afforded his way. Camelot Kings with a 
1,000 gold lead, 25 minutes in. Usually those are numbers Wild. we're talking about. 35, maybe 40 minutes in the game where it doesn't matter as much. This is all very relevant gold because not a single person has sold a recipe on the Kowloon Wardens and almost everybody is starting to get six slotted on the Camelot Kings. They'll pick up a Fire Giant. And now they get the pick of the litter. Do you want to go for the mid Phoenix? We can do that. You want to go for right Phoenix? We can go there. And as long as they can try and keep that left side pushed up, which it seems that Slash is going to deny that opportunity at least for a little while longer. Camelot Kings can essentially do no wrong on this siege. And Slash still having to clear out that wave. A little opening here to get some poke off for the Kings because there's very little engaged. And again, the the poke potential isn't there for the Wardens. The Kings have almost all the poke potential. The all-in, though, is pretty scary for the Wardens. We saw it last fight on that left Phoenix, and Big Man doesn't have that alternate available now. Right, he walks up. He's got a Runic Bomb, so that's a free Phoenix for him. What about the rest of the team? Yarkor and Quig working on the right side. Bird, River's Rebuke used, keeps Nog out of the fight, but he lets an ultimate fire, doesn't connect with anybody. Snipes up in the sky. Are they good enough to get two? But no, he's too far out of range for Yarkor. Meanwhile, it's Twig and Variety dealing with the mid lane Phoenix. Slash goes to the back line, gets a taunt onto Yarkor. Big Man takes, charges up the ult, and removes El Leon, the Camelot King. To now waltz right in, take the right side Phoenix, and maybe just a bit more as well. And with everything still available other than a few ultimates, Relic still available everywhere too. All Phoenixes drop down for the Wardens. And with the sustain they have from this Yamoja, potential look for an end here. They do still have very good clear. Nog is still Cuckoo, Tuba's still on Hachiman, he still has that Gooseberry, so they still have very good clear. But with Maman still having that ult available, maybe they look for something. Delny, there's half of his health, maybe more variety, Scorching Blink to the back line. Delny able to ult back to the Fountain to keep himself alive. That's Elliot now up soon. the ultimate away from Delny. He walks back in, Quig falling low, doesn't have the Rivers and only ultimates from Twig. And Variety, Nog swings and misses with the Spirit of the Nine wins once more. The Camelot Kings, though, don't want to take any more risks. With all five of the Kalen Wardens back up, the Camelot Kings return to base. And with Gold Fury, Pyro up, maybe they look to do some, a, a little bit extra farming, because, you know, they don't have 3K in hand yet. They need a little bit more farm to oh, actually get their resets Twig's off. almost there. Oh, yeah, yeah. After this Pyro, he'll, he'll have it. And with this, this game so far has been all Kings. This is impressive. Oh, yeah. This is the Kings you expect to see when you hear about the Camelot 19K? Kings. 19,000 gold, 20,000 XP. Yeah, the XP doesn't matter too much anymore, but, I mean, three minutes ago you said recipes all on the side of the Wardens. We still have, okay, well, Nog just, just sold now. this. Four recipes still on the side of the Wardens, and Nog doesn't have that sixth item. Just now bought the Tier 2 book. Meanwhile, the support, who's always the last person to get any Crazy. kind of itemization, Quig's done. He says, we're 20k up, and I'm part of that 20k. Full builds for every single member of the Camelot Kings and even upgraded relics nearly complete for everyone as well. At the bare minimum, just about tier two for everybody. It's only Quig who hasn't upgraded the beads further, but Quig's not under threat. He doesn't really need those beads any more than they already are there. So now it's the Camelot Kings pushing forward on the left side. Still, at least a little bit of time left with this fire giant. They'll see maybe if they can make anything else happen with it. Captain Twig splits himself off from the rest of the group. He'll head back over with a Variety as the Camelot Kings keep the rest of the team over on left. Alternate timeline back up for BMT. No timeline for Nog this time. And we've seen so many of these fights start and end with a single big mage ultimate. Eyes on Tings, eyes on Nog as a fight breaks out. Delny. BMT still holding on to ultimate. Delny with a sliver of life. Heads back to the fountain once more. The Titan is pulled. The River's Rebuke is down. Slash is trying to deal with BMT all his own. A landfall Quake's low. misses this time. The Big Man Tings is fine taking that damage. He's got timeline to come back if needed. But Captain Twig is in no man's land and gets picked off. Now the Camelot King's momentum has been halted. And with no alt other than Yarkor, it looks like the ending is not available there. But still, three Phoenixes down. EFG in about 30 seconds. Still a big opportunity here for the Kings, but also a rather large opportunity for the Wardens. Down 20,000 gold, able to keep him out of the base, able to take down Twig, and again, Twig goes way too deep without Variety. He's just not willing to wait for Variety, and especially when you're playing a god like Maman, you need your team with you. I mean, this was, up until that moment, a, a lead and a level of dominance 
that we came in probably expecting from the SPL Phenomenal. teams. That maybe took some of them a little while to get to this point, but that's also a moment there that I would have expected the SPL team to just be able to close that game out cleanly. Instead, now we're looking at we're looking at Phoenix resets. Left side is back up. Mid and right are going to be returning here in just a moment. So with none of the damage done to the Titan, no big deal. I've got to worry about the Wardens healing anything up, but with a lead this large, this, you know, even I would say this early in the game Cut at 30 dash. minutes should be a little bit easier for the Kings, and it is easy when Slash hand delivers a death to their door. And that is such bad timing. EFG is spawning, and they just get their Phoenixes back alive. Now this is an opportunity for the Kings to kind of put themselves back to where they were about a minute ago, have that EFG in hand this time instead of just a regular FG. But, I mean, these are weakened Phoenixes. These are just walk-in, auto once, maybe auto a second time. But still, last time we saw them try to end, it was a little sloppy, and I think they have to kind of fix it up or change up what their idea is if they want to kill that Titan. They've got 20 till Slash is back up. All Phoenixes up. All about a quarter to a third HP and all weakened from having to come back off of respawn. Quick Meanwhile, beads. Variety just gonna poke it knock. Right side, Phoenix down. Captain Twig now, no beads but it's four versus five for another 10. Quig tries to find anybody with a Riptide, but misses this time. Instead, it's BMT charging up ultimate. Won't let this one fire just yet. The Camelot Kings playing patiently, respecting the opponent. He's gonna strip away the birds instead. Downey gets poked away by Variety and BMT on the Thoth. Eyes are on Camelot Kings to find their opening to get to this Titan room. And both junglers, no beads available for about 90 seconds. And both of them have playmaking gods that can punish those beads being down. Eyes again on Nog, on Big Man. They have these one-shot potentials. And, and I think Twig does have potential here to also one-shot frontliners. He shouldn't feel the need to only go for backliners here. Yeah, Twig going to push some minions forward in the right side. Camelot Kings group up three in mid and leave Variety by himself on the opposite end. So a 1-3-1 one, one split for the Camelot Kings. Who will make... The first play, the first call to go forward. Quick keeps trying to find these root ties, but gets nothing. Throws out a bubble. It's Delny to go in and a landfall. Everything dumped into Yarkor, but Yarkor is not the problem that you got to deal with. It's Captain Twig. It's BMT, the Titan. Down a third of its HP. Down Delny low. low. A big Serpent 9 wins. Delny hey, Yarkor. It's a kid for Yarkor. And Tuma can punish him for that. Twig right. goes in with the ultimate. Captain Twig going to get caught out and picked off. Nog. Gets one, the Titan is low. You just gotta walk in if you're the Kings and secure it, and they do just that. But things got a bit dicey at the end there, Bobby. Oh, oh, for sure they got dicey. That was looking a lot harder than you'd expect with such a massive lead. And FG the first time, EFG the second time. It, it seemed like Nog was just really throwing them off of what they wanted to do. And just the threat of the Cuckoo all made it feel like they couldn't look for the end. And again, Twig is the one hitting the Titan first. Twig is the one dying. Variety's not there. Quig's not there. If he's just a little bit more patient, I'm pretty sure that end is just way easier. Just a little bit cleaner, too. I mean, it, it was kind of sloppy on the last couple of sieges the Camelot Kings went for at the end. So maybe time to clean up a little bit on those in-game sieges. But when you have a lead as large as the Camelot Kings do, I'm not going to say you have room to make a mistake, but when you're 19,000 up, you know, 25, 30 minutes in the game, you got a little bit of room to play with. Yeah, and, and I think that's a good point. What a phenomenal early game, phenomenal mid game by the Kings. Everything except killing the Titan was phenomenal by the by the Kings. And if they can keep that up, and if they can draft like they did in this game, like what a draft. Maman, Yamoja, bottom two picks. Can't that is something that cannot happen again. Quig is too good on Yamoja. Maman is too good. Twig is too good on Maman. It's got to get changed up there. Can't be giving the Camelot Kings such power picks like this because they're going to make you punished for it. It's a 1-1 one, one now, meaning we're getting at least a guaranteed game number four. We'll see who can get themselves up on match point in game number three.
up here, Charlie, the, the, the Kings, this game, fight back with maybe a little bit of a vengeance. Warden's a couple of bumps in him, right? Slow him down a little bit, right. but never really get to fully stop him the way they did in game one. No, I really did like the, the entirety of the Kings play here, and I think it starts from picks and bans, right? There was a lot that was on the table that didn't seem like it needed to be left on the table, right? Maman, Yamoja, Variety getting Achilles ended up being a huge thorn yeah. in the side <laughs> of the Wardens there. Um, it was just... A, a great bounce back, and that was the thing. When you get off to a rough start game number one, these are the kind of adaptations you make. And remember, it happened to the Kings previously, where they were able to bounce back after taking uh, an L. And that's what I said. The, this is a team that can make adaptations. It's a team that can learn sort of as they as they you know excel. And that's exactly what's happening here. They are making those changes immediately. So now it's up to the Wardens, because as far as I'm concerned, you know, Nog getting the Cuckoo was great. I saw some some ults connect. I saw some good damage. It wasn't as if this draft was terrible, but the Circuit wasn't doing it for me. Delany on the Bologna got some great CC off, but if you're picking Bologna just for the stun, there are other warriors that can get that done as well. And, of course, Leon going back to this Maui got focused out a little bit this time yeah. around. So that there, there's going to have to be some change-ups, and I think starting in picks and bands might be the best call because if, if the Kings continue playing like this, it might be, might be a quick one. Yeah, got to strip some of the power from them. And, and, you know, we were questioning. We were talking about it. Kukul Khan versus Thoth. Who's going to be first pick? Which one do you want to go for? Turns out the range, if you're going to give teams the ability to hit that much, that hard from that far, yeah, it's it's absolutely going to be a first pick that is worthy of it. 6-2 and 6. You had mentioned it. 0-1 and 11 for Quig. The Emoja looking incredible. And even though the Maman starts with 3-3, three and three, it's nine assists that Twig is able to put up. And, of course, Variety with an undying game at 5-0-5. So everybody, it feels like, on the Kings, top to bottom, get to look good. My man stacked two anti-heal auras and still dropped 30k damage. That's crazy. <laughs> that actually is really insane. Just 5k behind what Tings was able to put out. So Variety in the face of every Warden at that point. I mean, he is causing trouble. He had mentioned it. And the thing is, Jelly, you know, we've had some conversations and some mentions where it's like, yeah, you know, like maybe Achilles is in the top Warriors right now. Right. He's been kind of there and not at the same time. But if you're looking at picks and bans, which, which is what you've mentioned a couple of times, it becomes a very interesting dynamic because can you ban something like the Achilles maybe in the bottom two, maybe instead of the Ganesh, but it's letting a lot through. And like you said, you're going to have to adapt as we go into game three, the sides stay the same yet again. So the question for the Kings is, do you make any adaptations? The question for the Wardens is, what do you do? Because you need to make adaptations. Uh, Charlie, so far, the first two bands are the exact same. Daji, Athena. This was Thanatos last time. And it's Thanatos yet again, three times in a row. The top two have been the exact same for the Kings. Yeah, this is... Surprising to me, though, the Wardens have had their choice, and they took that the second pick. They don't want the first pick slot, but it really does feel like if they were able to get their hands on this after, I'm not sure if the Kings would ban it away. We haven't seen the side switch just yet. It would be a nice, you know, influx. of It's a buff to Slash. He's been able to do a lot when Leon is on that pick, but is it going to be the case this time around? We'll see if the, it's still the Ganesh. If, that, if, if it's still the Ganesh here and not something like the Thoth, that tells me that the Wardens either A, figured out, you know, what what they want to change about the second wave of bands, or B, think that they there was nothing wrong with their draft, it was just how they played it, and no, they have made that adaptation. They are not going to be letting Thaw through, which means the Camelot Kings can decide, do they just want to first pick Hachi, do they want the Ganesh that's finally through, or do they want to take that Kakulkan, all of which are up with the Camelot Kings. And at least two of which uh, we've seen pretty good arguments for being top pick, right? Yep. The Ganesh may be in the conversation, but but nowhere near as much as the other two. And so the Kings are going to have to think about it. It does also leave open, you know, a, a little more, I want to say versatility for the Wardens in terms of where they go. We've mentioned it. Leon really likes the Afro, really likes the Athena, really likes the Maui. Uh, Maui's still available, but, but maybe some wiggle room since there's not as many support targets getting banned out here. Wardens. Uh, again, waiting for the Kings to make their selection. Charlie, it, it, again, maybe it's it's too much, and maybe it's something completely different. You know, we've been talking about the Kukul Khan. 
Bobby Yaga has been in that conversation for a few of these teams, and we have seen some really, really stellar performances from that first place or that first pick spot. She's locked in for the Kings, and so BMT knows exactly where he's going to be. Yeah, could be the Hachi Ganesh, but I don't think Leon. I think, I think the Ganesh is more specifically a ban. It's not something that they want to take away from the Kings. It's something that they just don't want Quig to have, right? It, it's not something that Leon wants to pilot himself. If that was the case, I think they would have played this one a bit differently. The Hachi is certainly something they could grab here in the top two. Don't need to grab the Cuckoo. They can wait at least one more. But in this case, I, I wouldn't hate the Yamoja Gore. I, I think that's a pick that Leon has played to some, some great success. Not so much recently. It seems like he sort of let that one by the wayside. But getting Delny on something he's comfortable with will go a long way. So I actually do like the Wukong grab here. Because if not, Delny was going to take some bans and being, he'll be forced to play something like the Bologna, and clearly that's not a pick he wants to go for. Yeah, the Nike seem to be the number one. Wukong, it's been the go-to for Delny and for the Wardens. Uh, and so now, like you said, being able to avoid it getting banned away, avoid putting Delny onto something maybe a little more uncomfortable, but does leave open the, this question. I think we've had this discussion, but Maui, despite how much the Wardens love it, not many people are going to ban it anyway. And even beyond that, just because we keep talking about it, just because we keep seeing it, doesn't necessarily mean Leon can't switch to something else anyway. So if it does get banned in the second phase, maybe not that big a deal. Baba Yaga's already locked in. Would you want to see, and this is maybe getting ahead because the Kings haven't even locked in their next two, but right. something like the Cuckoo Return for the Wardens. I know there was definitely some. There's been a lot of good Nog plays on that god. Yep. I don't know if a lot of them were in that last game. Yeah, no, I, I saw some ults connect. I wouldn't hate him going back towards it, especially... Uh, with the draft like this, that Ganesha, that dreaded Ganesha that the Wardens did not want to see does get locked in. So it's going to be a bit unfortunate for them. The silence is going to be very annoying. But yeah, I wouldn't hate this at all. And of course, they're going to go in for the lock here. Wouldn't be surprised if we saw the Maman ban, but the Achilles needs to be at the forefront of the conversation as far as I'm concerned. I would I would let Maman through over Achilles in this setup just because, yeah, Captain Twig had a great performance, but... The whole team was looking cr clean, right? You saw how much damage Tings did. You saw yeah. how much variety was able to get done. T Twig could have been playing just about anything and, and popped off when your team is playing that way. So I think the Achilles needs to be addressed first, and then they can decide if they want to send more bands over towards Captain Twig. And this is one of the bigger tests of what a, what, what changes in a best of five versus best of threes, which is what most of these teams uh, in the SEC have been used to. Of course, the Wardens got their best of five yesterday, but that adaptation. Smart. Uh, and Charlie, everything you call for, maybe not in the order you called for it, you wanted Achilles, then Maman, but you know what? They if knew what get, they were going I was gonna for. Say, you, you get both. Right. That's all that really matters. Maman and Achilles taken out, so that's going to force a game change plan from the Kings uh, and force Twig back onto one of his other gods. I mean, earlier we saw how highly prioritized Lancelot was. We, we still have the Hunbats, Naja, that has been very common to them, although not very common lately in the meta. Uh, a lot of those options. Other side, Maui and the Sobek do get banned. So, uh, you know, I went to, to vouch for it slightly earlier. Now the question is going to be, what does Leon play in that spot? And are they holding their jungle pick for a little bit longer? It would make sense to do that one, right? Yeah, I think so. In this case, you want to wait. I mean, that's the thing. If, if you have the freedom, you're going to let Slash sit a little bit longer. You could try and take, like, the Susano. That is certainly an option at this case because it hasn't been banned away. They went more towards Leon. They said Maui. They said Sobek. Out of the, out of the card. It's not going to be here. So... You have your two options, where you grab it right now, and you say, okay, we want Susano, that's it, we're waiting, and then Captain Twig gets the counter pick, or you just grab a support, Yamoja's okay, but yeah, I was going to say, not something Leon probably wants to go into this slot, will be the Sylvanas, and now Slash gets to see what Twig plays before he locks in. And this Sylvanas, something we, so we don't see Sylvanas often, Shelly. But at the same time, in a list of here's gods that Leon plays and plays well, Sylvanas is very high up on that list. Uh, it's something that's, again, maybe kind of at odds with what you come to expect from the rest of the game uh, and the rest of the, the meta, the rest of the teams, every other support player. How do you feel about Sylvanas? I mean, he's got good healing, some decent CC, but, but also some kind of fat cooldowns. Right. The, the best Sylvanas plays are the ones that appear in lane, right? At late game, you're going to get the Dharma Pillars dropped on you and you're going to get shredded. It's very hard to pilot. Uh, the, the Sylvanas later on. But early on, 
you get to pull three buffs, you get to get a lead, you get to tell Slash to come over and duo and try to build from there. So it can work out. It's just rough. Positioning is everything on the side of the Camelot Kings. Man, I am shocked that the Chalk gets luck. And the Hunbat, come on, just wait. We knew that was coming. Yeah. That's no surprise. But the fact that Chalk comes through when Osiris was available, I'm guessing it's just the fact that, he, you know, in Variety's head, the way he's been playing, which has been very well, is I need to chase down Nog. He's on Kakulkin. That guy's fast. Osiris is just the slow guy, right? The slow immunities yeah. are not going to come through. Chalk also is a lot about slows, but he also has a silence. You know, he's got some burst. He can yeah. move around. So I don't hate the switch up. It's just didn't expect it. It's So in a, in a world where right now it feels like Warriors ha have found their, their home again, and Susano gets locked in to close things out, does Chalk feel like he's going to fill the role well enough, right? Like, that's some of the issues. Sometimes some of the gods are, are just not as strong as the others, right? That's yeah. why there's an ever-changing balance that comes through. Osiris, we've seen, real good at standing in the way and stopping people. Chalk, is he going to be able to fill, you know, the same role that we saw from the Achilles or facilitate the same style of play? Oh, no. They're, 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 <laughs> you can, what Variety just did is not going to be done on anyone else as long as Achilles was banned. Doesn't mean that Chalk doesn't have his strengths, of course, but... The execute makes you play. It makes you play a team fight. Makes you build, just all entirely different, right? You can't just stand at the forefront and like look for a Sylvanas pulls when you're at 50% HP. It's not going to happen. You're so close to threshold. You're just throwing the game. With a chalk, it's a little bit different. You probably get a wing blade. There's a lot of slows on the side of the Camelot Kings this game. So wing blade sprints. Those are going to be very powerful. Still though. Looking at the entirety of the Warden's draft, like, if you, if you just take it piece by piece, Nog on Cuckoo, love that. Delny on Wukong, love that. Y y Tuba on the Hachi, these are all great picks, and Slash getting a Susano. But as a squad, it is heavily, heavily reliant on El Leon hitting poles and hitting knockups for the team. And I think the Camelot Kings could make their whole game plan, let's kill Sylvanas first and then move from there, right? He, he is not yeah. a very mobile character. He's probably going to be the first one in, first one out of the team fights. The Camelot Kings are going to just, you know, pick up a, a Dharma Pillars, drop it on the Sylvanas, and just throw everything and then go from there. Now the question for them. I mean, you had mentioned team fight, priority, things like that. You had mentioned engage, for, and there's a ton of it <laughs> on the Kings. But can you rely – so if, if let's say their game plan becomes kill Sylvanas and, and you start to struggle maybe in that regard – is there a way that you could lean a little on the Susano for, for some of that engage, or are you really kind of all inning on the, the Sylvanas? Well, I do think that's the benefit of picking something like Wukong, because Susano very much excels at getting in, getting out, right? Mm -hmm. He does a lot of damage. He has so much movement. He can blow up the back line very quickly. Delny can do the same thing on Wukong. He doesn't have the same explosive burst, but he's very safe. Last game, Eagles Rally, once it's down, you're dead. You can blink in. You've got the bird. You've got Somersault Cloud. Like, Wukong can be slippery like Susano. So... If Leon is getting dove and you're putting all this damage towards him, your backline can get focused out as well. It's not as if the Wardens just lose because of it, but there is a lot of weight on engage, and Leon is the engage. As far as I'm concerned, the, the pulls, the knockups, and of course, Slash can find them as well. But you only get one set of beads, and Twig on Hunbats, he doesn't miss much. We have seen several times where sometimes if the engage is lacking, the team fight does not come to follow. So right. the question and the pressure is on the Wardens, but it's 1-1. One, one. So the question is who will put their best foot forward here? Well, the only way to find out is to go over to the casters. Yeah, thank you so much, Gore and Trelly. Game number three with the Camelot Kings and the Kowlin Wardens kicks off. It's J-Max inbound, and Doug back here. Once more for game number three of this match. Match point on the line for these two teams. Giving themselves up to that 2-1, one, one game away from qualifying to Worlds. The Camelot Kings starting to get a bit of favoritism now from the fans. 55-45 in favor of the Camelot Kings. They need it. After the momentum they just had in game number two, one of the most dominant performances, at least lead-wise, that we have seen so far this event. Yeah, I mean, an incredible game by the Kings last game. Now it's a completely different game, completely different comp, running back nothing from last game. Uh, actually, Yarkor was on Rama last game too, so running back one single character from last game. And they get the Ganesh, and the Ganesh is something that we've seen with a lot of Pryo this tournament. And in that Ganesh pick, Quig also starting with a different starter. No longer will he go for that War Flag. He has that Benevolence, which if it does come down to it, 
diving a Ganesh with a compassion, same thing like diving a Yamoja with benevolence or uh, with compassion. It is very, very difficult the amount of survivability he adds to his backliner. So diving into that, especially with Susano, especially with Wukong, it's going to be very, very difficult. Eyes on that when we get to the late game. But now for the laning phase, Bluestone versus Warrior's Axe in this laning phase. Interested to see kind of how this plays out. Is there going to be any early ganks by both Twig and Slash? Because this is a pretty AFK laning phase so far. I wouldn't be too surprised if they just kind of let them beat on each other a little bit. Maybe get each other to half health and that's about it. Because this, for my money, is where the action is going to be. This Sylvanas is the most important pick in this entire game. And something that Elionis had some time practicing. And not just in the support role. He's played this jungle at times. Played it mid. Variety. Taking a lot of poke from Delny. I don't think you want to proc that blue stone too close to the minion wave variety. There's in a 200 HP. One more good hit from Delny. Could be curtain call. Maybe towards BMT. Pulled back by Slash on the Susano, but still standing healthy. And one thing at least that I noticed, during the picks and bans, you know, we pull up, you see the stats, how many games the gods have been played, how often they've been picked and banned. BMT's on Baba Yaga that was played 10 times so far this weekend and 80% win rate on the god. That's a staggering number for even 10 games being played. Nerfed, by the way. Nerfed Baba Yaga. Yeah, nerfed Doesn't Baba. stack. Doesn't stack as well. Doesn't stack the cloak, the book, nearly as well. And she is still dominating. It's because of just how strong and easy her base damages and her base abilities are to hit. And I, I actually... Okay, if he hits that, that, that is a kill. I had to pause for a second, but I, I think it is actually a pretty big detriment for the enemy team against the Baba Yaga with the 50-50 of her one. Sometimes you get silence, sometimes you get slows, sometimes the enemy team gets movement speed, and that's almost to a negative more for the enemy team than it is for Baba, because Baba can at least see as she's casting it what she's using and she can kind of call it out. The enemy team has to see it hit the ground and getting silence in the middle of like a channeled ability, like if Slash is trying to use his one spam through it to try to get that dash off and he's walking through the silence, it can be a really big pain. One of those things that just, it's out of your control. And I think that's the exactly. worst part about fighting a Baba is a lot of her damage is completely out of your control, sometimes even out of the Baba Yaga's control. <laughs> sometimes you walk up, she throws an L, sometimes she throws a Y, as she you throws mentioned, a lot has of all the debuffs. Has a lot of L's in there. A lot of L's. Sometimes forward, sometimes backwards. But the one thing that really sucks the most at fighting a Baba with that first ability is when you get that silence oval that pops up. Yep. Might be the worst one of all of them to have to deal with because then you're essentially kind of just trapped there, similar to how Leon and Twigma might be trapped at the purple buff. Leon falling low, jump by Huge Twig, slow. slows him down. And even with a potion toss, it's not necessary because the Camelot King's on the board first. And with that purple buff still available, Tuba is going to lose his purple buff. He's going to lose his support and give up first blood to, tw blood to Twig. And Twig's not even level 5 yet, so he doesn't use that ultimate. He just gets that first kill. Slash here looking for that invade. Slash gets ultimate away from Big Man Tings, but now can he steal the red buff away? Tings is trying to pull that one back. Wait, the potion, or I'm sorry, the firebolt's not going to confirm that one, so it is a steal by Slash. It looked like he almost mistimed it a little bit. Using that one it looked like a little bit early, but he had the timing down right. Well, why am I questioning him? He had it. And the biggest thing for me with that first blood is now Twig gets that super early Yotens. And this is a Hunbot's Yotens who wants to get that 5 more than anything. And then after hitting 5, he wants to get that Yotens as quick as possible. Because this is a character that you want to force out relics. That is your entire job. And him coming to the right side of the map means he's potentially looking to force out a relic here on Delny. And by relic, I mean actually his life. More than anything, the HP bar. If you can catch him... Just with the wrong HP. Pretty much, uh, I would imagine, any time that Delny sees Variety jump up into the sky, holding that axe, CC immunity, Delny's going to respond with his own ultimate because he knows that there's probably something else coming because you don't want to lose your only form of, of safety before you get the opportunity to use it. And then a fear no, we will follow up. And, and to be fair, Chalk Alt is such a long CC if you get hit by it because it's not just a knockup. It's a knock-up into almost a three-second silence. So it's about three seconds where you're unable to do anything. And on top of it, it also is Chalk is doing a lot of damage. So a lot of the times you see Chalk go for that ultimate. In turn, the Kowloon Wardens, whoever it is, will ult to get that CC immunity to be able to use their abilities. And one thing we've already seen a little bit. Potential for a kill here on the two, but two, but just ults out. But something I am very curious about is Sylvanas went for the shell. 
I was expecting an early sprint because of just how effective and how slow strong this King's comp is. The Ganesh has the ultimate to slow. Hunbots jumps onto Sylvanas and he's gonna slow him. And then we also have that Chalk slow. We also have Rama slow. We also have Baba slow. Man. And they have multiple slows in their kits on top of it. So a lot of slows just across the board. If Elion gets caught out, he's not gonna be able to get, a, get, get away. He's just gonna be essentially a sitting, well, cactus in this case. Captain Twig walks up, walks over a ward, does Elyon. Twig might just go on the hunt. Does he realize that Slash is around the corner? Surely he knows that somebody else is there and it's not just Elyon. There was a ward up there for a reason. Twig? Really goes towards the purple buff. Pull off the mark by Slash. Ultimate used by Leon. Quig doesn't have those Darmic Pillars back. And with Nog, Nog on off. the way, Quig will get clipped by the ult. But it's not enough damage. They need a little more. Typhoon going to be used. But Still using the Ohm to stay alive a little bit longer. But it's just the delay, the inevitable. But look how many resources it took just to kill the elephant. And on top of that, Big Man is farming that entire time. Nog forced to rotate over. Going to miss that mid wave. And it also looked like... Actually, he probably cleaned, cleared green as he walked back over, but misses that entire mid wave, misses both of these mid camps, and Big Man able to get that farm. No surprise if now Big Man actually gets a little bit of a lead here in that mid lane portion, but you kind of had to stem the bleeding over there. Can't really fault the team for trying to get Nog to rotate over. You need to confirm a few purples in the early game, because if you don't, I mean, Tuba's already down a level. If he starts losing two, three purple buffs, we're talking one, maybe even two levels. But we are down level in the solo lane. Delny just now proccing over to A. Variety sitting there for a little bit, so about a half level between them in the early game. Well, the early game was all Delny for that solo lane, at least for those first three, four levels, but once you get that rotation over, once you put a little bit of threat, and once Variety's hit, kind of able to get that first tier two online, it's been Variety show ever since in the solo lane. That's why you point out some of the minions walking away <laughs> yeah. from that blue buff, tried to drag them all together and forgot to hit them a couple of times, so They'll walk back over towards their respective sides, their respective camps. It will be a shield buff now for the Kowloon Wardens, but with this first blood, Camelot Kings have gotten their lead. Hasn't pushed too far. Only about 700 gold up for the order side team here for the SPL. And, and these are high stakes games that we go into. Now that we know we're guaranteed at least the four, both these teams kind of have this game to, to really test the waters, to really try and push the advantage. And get themselves into that 2-1 lead in the best of five. Worlds qualifying on the line for everyone here. You see a bit of a skirmish around the mid harpies, but nobody want to go into fighting. I expect this game is going to be probably a lot slower pace than even the first two that we were a part of. Yeah, I agree. I think this is going to be a pretty big farm fest for both of these teams. And a lot of it comes down, these mid laners just want to farm. That's all they want to do. There's no thought to kind of bully out in that mid lane. It's a cuckoo who's looking to AFK in lane and maybe rotate to a blue buff to out secure. He does take. One? No way. He actually steals what? blue from both of them. I thought he was just going to be, all right, I got the one minion. Maybe I can get a second one. Nope, Axtos does just take both in that case. And purple buff invade. The Camelot Kings are stripping buff after buff now. Away from the Kalan Wardens, denying so much farm. And that's now pushed it from the 700 that we saw up to 1,100 gold. And they can just go back and farm up their own buffs and further push that lead. And getting timer on that is something that they can now look to invade again after with both purple buff and blue buff. They have potential on each side of the map and with leads also in both of those lanes. Tuba down a level and also Delny down a level. Ult on to Elyon. Elyon stuck inside the Dharmic Pillars. He's walking forward, but the Ohm is just keeping him silenced out. And all of that fighting was for the shield buff. I don't even think that they were really planning on killing Elyon there. Still fairly tanky on the tree, but... Using quite a bit of resource, especially Captain Twig and Quig's ultimate, both to confirm that shield buff. And a little surprising, I think they had the damage to actually kill him, but it was like two of them were on the same page to go for the kill, and one of them was a little not on the same page, because no Thebes finished for the Sylvanas yet. That is like the big spike in the early game for the tree, especially when you have the CC and the damage of Dharmic Pillars and the Fear No Evil. But they opt to just kind of go for the shield camp, and it's no surprise, because we've seen this a lot, where... Ults will get dropped for buffs in the early portion because there's very few things you can actually do to push your lead in the early game outside of actually just invading. Gold Fury is a bit too tanky in the early game. Pyro doesn't spawn until after 10 minutes. So it's really just those camps. So it's no surprise to see ults thrown at them. I think maybe we see more attempt to kill at Leon if Quig catches him on the edge of the Dharmic Pillar. I think 
Elyon got pushed Possible. maybe a bit too far forward. Maybe the Dharmic Pillar got slightly misplaced. So Elyon not taking that, constantly stacking up tick damage from those Dharmic Pillars. So maybe that's why we just see. Okay, we got the buff. Let's not continue our fighting. Let's just back away. Ult for ult on the right-hand side. Delny may be worried that somebody was lying inside of the jungle as well. So maybe overly cautious, but at the same time, I think the right amount of caution going up against Variety to, to use that ultimate. Yeah, especially when Variety's up two levels over in that solo lane. And that's something we've seen now a few times today where, where Delny's falling behind pretty far in the solo lane. Variety's just kind of bullying him out, getting those blue buffs. And with blue buffs spawning again, Variety already walking around. And with nobody rotating here, he, he is a true two levels behind. Delny just hits the 11. And Variety steals another blue, nearly kills Delny. 200 health on the Wukong. He'll go back. Minions will walk through the jungle a bit before they path back into lane, but... Variety's just winning this lane. There, there really have not been a lot of rotations to that side of the map in the last, what, seven, eight minutes at this point. I think Captain Tweet goes over for like that first blue, that first attempt of a kill, and then says, all right, cool, peace out. Because Variety is just winning this lane all on his own. He doesn't need all this extra help just to get this farm and to get this poke out. Yeah, Nog even rotated to try to help Delny out yeah. to secure the blue buff, and Variety's chalk one out secured the, the cuckoo sneeze. Ultimate from the no fear, beads. no evil, slash can dash away, but it's a monkey toss to chase him down. Not far enough, though. Captain Twig used all of his resources just to get there. Nothing else for the chase after. And, and that's some play potential we could see come late game. We saw it out of April on the side of the Solar Scarabs, utilizing that jet stream to chase out targets who were able to jump or, or leap really far away. Captain Twig can now effectively do the exact same thing, chase the Susana the same way one could to someone else. Yeah, and pretty interesting... 1v1 matchup there because no knock of or uh, knock of immunity in Hunbots 2 also no no real true survivability from the Susano into the Hunbots and when you think about it Hunbots is more that 1v1 character or sorry Susano is more the 1v1 character Hunbots is more of the team fight character but it almost seems like Hunbots has some pretty good chances at winning that 1v1 Twig doesn't have oh but the Dharmic Pillar is there Elyon on the wrong side of the wall and he can't get back to safety take it down big knock up by big man Ting slash gets a big typhoon and Captain Twig is able to escape no! and a potion toss from big man Ting now it's Nog in a bit of danger uses the Aegis to immune the damage from Variety's ultimate but that fight around Beacon goes catastrophically for the Kalan Wardens as the Camelot Kings with two kills on the mid laner and a Beacon cap to boot and you know what's crazy there? I'm pretty sure the Baba 1 was the attack speed slow, and Susano the Slash was not able to get this auto attack cancel out because he was slowed from the attack speed from Baba 1. Very interesting that maybe that's the reason that Twig lives, because he only had 100 health left. One auto attack does take him down. And, and little things like that, I mean, may mean a big difference. And with that kill in mid, Gold Fury pulled here by the Kings. This time, Twig does have Fear No Evil. Dharma Pillar is already back up from Quig. Captain Twig gonna try and zone, they gotta be quick, because the Fear No Evil ends. And Nog a bit too late to try and steal anything away, but no ultimate there for that mid laner. I mean, it's gonna be hard, have to walk in, hit it with your one. 4,000 up for the Camelot Kings, 13 minutes in. Starting to try and add some of that pacing from the previous two games. But it's mostly just this inexperience over anything else. Two levels in solo, one in every other single role at this point. The Kallen Wardens are just down in base stats more than anything. Yeah, and a lot of it comes down to this soul lane with Variety just bullying him out so far. Gets another blue buff. And just the threat of Variety's ult means Delny has to go into the air. Doesn't matter that he's basically full health. He has to play it safe because of the combo potential with the Hunbots. Variety able to clear out the wave. No problem. Now the Camelot Kings pushing his where's their next target. Pyromancer has spawned. Captain Twig, no ultimate for a little while since he used it to help try and guarantee that the, his team could get that fury. But still has plenty of damage on his own. The difference now around these objectives is these ultimates starting to come online once more. Nog has his ult for this objective. Big Man Tings has his, but not nearly the same level of burst as the Spirit of the Nine wins. So we'll have to see what the Camelot Kings want to do with their lead, where they kind of want to play that lead more than anything else. As Big Man Tings is just farming away. Level 16 on the Baba Yaga. Showed up on the XP for a minute. He was topping the charts by a considerable amount, almost 70 over the next person being his direct lane opponent. BMT, he is just on farm mode right now. 
And hitting level 17 at 15 minutes. And actually slashes here. Righty's low mana. Righty does have ult, but don't think he had the mana to use it. So nice kill for the Kowloon Warden's jungler. Able to punish Variety for sticking around a bit too long. Didn't have the passive stacked up to get that free ability cost and didn't have the mana to use it either. So the worst of both worlds. Captain Twig gets the monkey toss, hits Delny. Delny goes into Tiger form Quick's and now Slash is here, but with Quig and the Darmic Pillars, it traps Delny in the sky. Captain Twig gonna try and chase out Slash, but maybe should have been keeping eyes on Delny instead. Able to jump away and now it's Leon and Nog on the way. Quig. Captain Twig is low. Can Quig save him? This time, Twig will get the jump. Tornado off the mark. Nog wants to fire off that ultimate, but Leon misses, and now he's trapped under the tier one tower. Too much damage from Big Man Tings. The turnaround from the Camelot Kings is able to get some damage onto Nog. Beats Aegis, both used by the mid laner, but it's not going to save him this time. It's Variety coming back from the grave and picking up a kill. And the overchase there by the. Wait, is Yark. Yar they're going for Fire Giant here. No crit online. This is gonna take some time, but they've got plenty of time to play with. They killed two on the right. Slash is on the way. He does have Typhoon. If he spots this out in time, he can maybe try and stop this one. Captain Twig's doing his best to zone him away. Slash used most of his mobility again, and now Delny, Delny here to try and stop this one. Quig falling low to the Fire Giant. Delny might at least get a kill on a one before it goes down. The Fire Giant to the Camelot Kings. One extra pick on top, but for the least, the Kallen Warden's able to get one after losing the objective. Those those Fire Giants early are very risky because of how much damage it actually does. And Elion a little bit too far forward gets hit by the Fear No Evil. Ultimate isn't enough to save him from the CC. Camelot Kings even get the Pyromancer and maybe even more than just that. Big Man Tings, his ultimate's coming up soon. The Snog is going to have to play zone. In the sky is Yarkor, has to get away from the Tornadoes, throws out the Snipes. It's waiting for Slash to use the beats. Fast roll by Yark, but Slash will chase him down and Nog will finish the job of Spirit of Nine wins to close out the kill. And the Kings get that nice early Fire Giant, but then they just stick around and constantly fight. This should be a much bigger lead that they have, but they just stay a little bit too undisciplined. Tube is able to push down left, get the tier one, get the tier two. Still an opportunity for Gold Fury for the Kings, especially with two on right side. Tuba only one available on left with, I guess, Delny also. But a, a, a good call for the Fire Giant, first off, but then just the sticking around, the constant fighting after. Yarkor is the one that's important for Fire Giant. He should not be dying, especially after you get it. Losing one, losing your support for Fire. Down, 100% down. It's normal. That That's like a, that's a, that's a, a tale as old as time. You almost want him to smite. die. Like that's the, that's the OG phrase, support for Insert whatever here, you're good for that trade. But losing your entire dual lane, losing Yark, who is the one that you really want to have that buff, if you're planning on sieging, if you're planning on getting more of these objectives, it's not quite the trade that you wouldn't want to make. Without that crit, it just made it so difficult to really shred that one down. Quig was probably going to die regardless if Delny showed up or not, but it takes a bit too much, loses two, and now. The Camelot Kings will go to the Oni Fury. Darmic Pillar use just to make sure they can shred this one down a little bit faster. Well, Variety zones three slash four uses the ultimate on a couple. Max over the wall. Not going to be enough because he can't teleport to it in time. So now that's three down off the Fire Giant. Starting to look a little less worth it for the Kings. Yeah, I think that's entirely it, especially with Slash going down right, able to get a bunch of farm, and it's a 3v4 fight here. Quig stunned out by the Tiger. Delny on the cloud, lands on top of Quig, who's just trying to run. Turns around, silences to get rid of the decoy. Potion tossed by Big Man Tings, and now the home sweet home is here. Elyon zoned away. Snipes from Yarkor. All three are good, but not all three are enough damage to take down the support. BMT level 19 on the Baba Yaga, nearing that level 20 power spike. Kings, they're not going to lose another member this time. And Quig with that level 15, is he going to be able to have enough farm for that compassion? He's able to get it now for this next fight. Still Fire Giant on two. Granted, it's probably two of the worst it could be on because character that's not really taking much damage in the Hunbot, so the sustain doesn't really matter too much. The Mage not really getting too many autos onto the objective, so probably all they were all that's all she wrote for this Fire Giant getting ready for the Tier 1 tower potentially in right, getting ready to maybe gank Delny. And I like that the Kings are starting to look to group. This is a pretty rare thing until this set today. The Kings want to group and they want to group early. Hero Evil hits Delny. He can't get up to the cloud of time because he doesn't even have it. Yarkor gets a nice pick 
for the kill, the killing blow up against Delny. The Camelot Kings are going to use the last of their fire giant. Push down the right side of the map. Tier 1 tower gone. Tier 2 tower will be gone in just a moment. Nog actually gets clipped by a little bit of damage from the Kings. And now that will be two more towers off of the map. Courtesy of the Camelot Kings. Gold lead, not astronomical just yet. Still sitting at about a 6,500 gold lead, but... Still holding on to momentum, still keeping their pace up is important and utilizing every bit of that fire giant they could. Now 20 minutes with FG spawning soon, Pyro spawning too. What's sticking out to me is the solo and the support differential is huge. Three levels in solo lane, we're about to have a level 20 chalk. Delny's only level 16. On the opposite side for support, 16 for Quig, the same level as the solo laner for the enemy team. And Elyon is still only 14, does not have that upgraded starter yet. And when you get to this 20 minute mark, this is usually when you want that starter upgrade. Because this is such a big spike. It's a massive team fight effect. And also, one last thing that's sticking out to me, the difference in ADC builds. We've talked about some go crit kins, some go just kins, some go double crit. Seems like no crit for the side of Yarkor, so the objective's not going to burn as quick as you'd hope. It's mostly that kill on gods for Yarkor, where Tubo wants to try and get some of that extra boxing if he has to go 1v1 against the fellow hunter or if they need to deal with objectives. Speaking of objectives, it's Pyromancer for the Camelot Kings. Callum Warden's not going to step too far forward to try and defend this one. Who's going to... Who picked up the, is the... Okay, Variety went back. I was about to say, is nobody picking up the Runic Palm? They just left it sitting there for a moment, but... Gonna go ahead and grab that one for the solo laner Variety. Not the worst one to have that, considering how the Camelot Kings usually go about their Fire Giant defense. It's almost always Variety playing zone duty way up at the front. Typically, you'd want to have your Runic Palm on the support, maybe on the jungler who's going to be going for that secure right, and sticking around there, but... At least somebody's picked it up and they have that potential if Variety wants to walk back and make sure they can confirm themselves an objective. Speaking on confirm for the objectives, big man on this Baba does not really have that same type of confirm as he did last game on the Thoth. And Nog back on this Kakulkin. The objective confirm is pretty solidly in the Warden's favor. And, and I think that means King should look to take fights. But if you look at how easy their engage really is, good poke, Chalk is able to play very far forward, look for a little bit of trades. And they also have the all-in potential from that Ganesh ult and that Hunbot's ult. And if Worst comes to Worst, somebody gets out one shot, Yarkor goes into the air and cleans him up. Redstone picked up by Variety. Interesting. So I'm going to try and really harass these backliners, really bother Tuba more than anybody. He runs into El Leon. Not an ideal target for him, but... And that's the zone up. It's a Camelot Kings group for Fire Giant. It's starters for every single member of the Camelot Kings. Meanwhile, on the flip end, only that War Banner for Elyon. No one else able to upgrade a starter item just yet. Or at least haven't had the gold to upgrade him for a couple of these players. For Nog, for Slash. So de fighting at a major deficit in Power Spike. Variety goes to the back, finds three with the ultimate against Beads. Elyon's away from Tuba. Dead. Snipes from Yarkor. Are enough to help take down Elyon as Variety gets the credit for the kill. Delny up on the Somersault Cloud. But where does he run to? Variety is the only safe place for him to dive down. And he will do just that. Camelot Kings have now dismantled the Kalan Wardens inside their own jungle. They'll head right back to fire when nobody's willing to step up on the Wardens. Fire Giant, much easier to take for the Camelot Kings. And we see the weakness of the Sylvanas. A Blink Hunbot's ult is all they really need to take him down. Doesn't really have that same amount of survivability most supports have. If he does get slowed, if he does get CC, it's very hard. He has to be on the ready to drop ult in trade for that Hunbot's ult. But even then, at this point, Hunbot's ult lasts so long, he's still going to eat a lot of that CC. A lot of CC. Extra little bit of damage never hurts either. So now the Kings with Fire Giant start pushing up mid. Don't have minions for a moment, but still have plenty of pressure. Try and push up, take down these Tier 2 towers. Decent damage still coming through, even without the help of minions. Darmic Pillar just scares Tubo away and forces Nog to retreat. Right, taking up the tower a bit long. Use the ultimate early. Oh. Ooh, pull so close by Elyon. If that's a grab to Variety, that may just be a kill for the Kalan Wardens, but thankful is Variety for Elyon just being off the mark. And going for that tier 2 in mid kind of opens up the rest of the map. Now they only have the tier 2 in left to go down, and they have this FG. So back here, get strong, 
this is the let's open up the base, let's kill a phoenix or two here. This is their opportunity. Usually the first fire giant, and actually this is their second fire giant, but usually that first fire giant around 20, 25 minutes is just to break the base. You just want one phoenix. If you get lucky, you get a second phoenix, that's perfect. But all you want to do is just put a little bit of pressure on the enemy's base when that yeah. EFG spawns. That's like the, the big prize. But this first FG is for that left phoenix usually. Expect him to group around there. Maybe try to get this pyro first to get that second bomb. And with that potential bomb in Variety's inventory, maybe some split potential for Variety and Twig to maybe go two middle, three left. Camelot Kings now with two Rudic Bombs. One for Twig, one for Variety. They've been teaming up a lot when it comes down to these pushes. And, and kind of speaking on Siege, you didn't really get a whole lot over on those Tier 2 towers. Kind of soft defense. You know, we're going to stand up. If you go too far forward, we might punish. For the Kalan Wardens, they have strength in their Siege defense against the Camelot Kings, who are now starting to push up that mid lane with that Titan. We'll have to see if the Wardens do have that. I mean, where do the big strengths lie with the Kalan Wardens? I mean, the safety in there clear. Nog really doesn't have to put himself out of position to actually clear waves or even clear the Titan. They also have just really good damage, and I think that's what's going to kind of scare the Kings off a little bit. There is a lot of damage on the Warden side. Sylvanas so does solid damage, and it also has big AoE. Same with the Susano, same with the Cuckoo, so that is the threat. Captain Twig goes in. Let's listen in with the Camelot Kings on the fight. We've got the Phoenix, man. Oh. Season, season, season! Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm not TPing. Can we hit this? Can we hit this? Uh, can't try. It's slow, it's slow, it's slow. Yeah, got we, it. Got nice. it, we got it, we got it, we got it. Chill, I'm chill, out, chill, I'm chill. out, I'm out. I have meta thing. Get out, get out. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, I'm I'm medding. Fine. Fine, by the way. We've this. fine. I'm healing. I'm healing. Harry, Harry, Harry. You're alone. Be careful. He's fine. Okay, can we go mid or not? Can we go mid? Can we go mid? Maybe. I'm on 20. I'm back for my item. Camelot Kings do exactly what they need. They walk in, they drop a runic bomb, they kill a phoenix. For a moment, everybody kind of had that question like, Harry, what are you doing? Variety, why are you going all the way back there? Chill a little bit. But it gets, you know, four-man ultimate and then eats the entirety of Nog's ultimate, which was just consumed by the Prid Windshield at that point. So not a care in the world, not a worry from Variety. And then you even hear after, can we do mid? Maybe. And I think as soon as I heard the maybe, that was enough for the team to back away and reset. Yeah, I think if Variety maybe holds ult, there's potential for that middle Phoenix, but he's trying to get stacks on his cloak. He's trying to bring up that that damage number, so it makes actually grouping here in the jungle. And the Kalan Wardens find a pick. That silence is just so good into Sylv. If Sylv walks forward, Dude, Ohm he is just so, can't do anything. Ohm's just so good. Silence, protections, knock-up immunity. By the way, those protections go to your teammates, too. Like, what a good ability that is. Good to play as good to play with. with. Not, Not good against. to play against. Yeah, actually, no, that's miserable. Rather frustrating, especially as like a frontliner that's trying to dive into the Ganesh. And, and this is that that late game Ganesh with the compassion and as you said, the ohm with the prots and the silence. It is going to be very difficult for both Slash and Delny to actually dive into that late game Ganesh. And also, we see Delny not opting for those beads again. So if he does get ohmed, and with how much damage Yarkor and Big Man have at this point. Delny's got to be really, really careful with that blink. The Camelot Kings grouping up on the right side. Left Phoenix is already down, so one person is guaranteed going to have to be over protecting the Phoenix, protecting the Titan from minion waves walking in. I mean, Delny's already dealing with one wave, another wave on its way. The Camelot Kings are playing cautiously. Their lead, pretty massive at this point. We're sitting 15,000 at 28 minutes. We're a very similar boat that we were in game two, where it was 19k at 30. They're still putting some respect to the Kalan Warden's name, to their defense, their damage output, because we're at the point of the game where even if it is only a five, five and a half item Kukulkan, that Spear of the Nine wins is still going to hit really hard if it slams one of the carries. Yarkor experienced that firsthand in game two. Variety pulled back, but... Variety's chilling. He pops his heel. He's standing by. Phoenix goes down, and Delny goes to the back line, but Delny just uses mobility. Wow. He barely gets up in the cloud. So there to nine wins. Quick, quick, dead. quick to go down. And it's not going to be a trade out. Slash will die in the back. And Yark with the snipes takes down an extra. And from the home sweet home, they're able to clean up a third. The Camelot Kings 
trade one for three. But Variety is starting to fall a bit low. Delny is keeping the backliners no busy. Meanwhile, Tuba is just getting shredded by Captain Twig's damage. Tuba resets inside of the fountain and the Titan goes down. The Camelot Kings put themselves on match point. And that was really good ending there by the Kings. Decisive with their calls. Their damage and targets are perfect. And that Frenzy adds so much damage into his backline. Delny nearly gets one shot before even being able to get into the air. And then when Slash blinks in, the Hunbot's damage is just way too much and he just gets one shot. Now it's the Camelot Kings. One game away from getting back to the Smite World Championships. Camelot Kings say, it's not a world if we're not there. We're the world champions. We're the defending champs. They got to be there at SWC to be able to defend that title. And now they're just one game away from doing so. And they're starting to play like it. This is the Kings that you expect to see when you talk about the Camelot yeah. Kings. And, and this is even better than what you expect because they're playing the early game well. Usually when you talk about the Kings, the early game isn't their, their, their suit. They kind of play through the early game a little slower, play for that late game, and then out team fight you. Not today. Today the Kings are trying to dominate at all points. And if you ignore game one, this has been a dominant King set so far. It feels weird to say this, but it feels like this is one of the better sets the Kings have played since like early phase I was say one. All it, year. It's, it's been a great set for them so far, but they've got to be able to close it out here. Camelot Kings now one game away from Worlds. Can they do it? Or the Wardens push this to five? We'll find out in game four right after this.
That's right. It is only, Trelly, this is going to make maybe you a little nervous. Say as it. As five days away until we get there. It's the 7th right now. On the 12th is when we will be going live in Arlington, Texas for the Smite World Championship. One of these two teams is going to be there. The Kings, one step closer than the Wardens right now. Uh, but, of course, we want to see you there. Whether you're there in person, of course, you want to come up and say hi. But if you're at home, you can watch on Twitch and on YouTube. Uh, the entire schedule's released. You can go to our Twitter to, to really kind of break into that. Find all the stuff you want to be there for. I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for you. It's everything. You're going to want to be there for all of it. From minute one uh, until we close the broadcast every single day fantastic quarterfinals which i imagine we're going to actually know oh my god we're going to know the teams all of the teams today <laughs> we've already got seven uh, of them i saw a couple of the teams waiting to pick yeah yeah they're going to be they have no idea choosing and we'll have like a we'll have like a bracket my yeah. god it's it, guys it's like real and then, <laughs> it's, and, it's then, happening. and then later we're going to have worlds so all <laughs> yeah. that's going to be there oh, yeah no i get to go home over the next couple of days and like pack and, <laughs> and figure things out for yeah. some of you at home. Uh, that's going to be the case. If you want to look at it, by the way, here's going to be what the schedule is at the World Championship. You're not going to want to miss I already said anything, and it feels kind of cheesy to go back and say that, but also you don't want to miss anything. Uh, the red carpet leading into the, the Smite keynote has a lot of stuff at the very beginning of the day, of course, followed by the opening ceremony and all of the quarterfinals that Friday. It's going to be a long one, but you're going to be uh, I want to be glued to your screen while it's all happening. The next day, the Year 11 update show. So if you're wondering what the future of Smite's going to be looking like, you are going to want to dive into that as much as possible. And from what I've been told... Uh, it is going to be a lengthy one, so <laughs> be prepared uh, that that is going to be, again, a fantastic show. Leading into the semifinals, which are going to be fantastic, then, of course, on Sunday, the Build a God panel, the Creator Showdown, something that's a, a little special, a little, little sneaky treat in there for you that is to be announced, and then that's going to be followed up by the Grand Finals and the Trophy Ceremony. It's going to be a fantastic three days. So again, there's all the times uh, in left, uh, in central, right, in eastern. Uh, most of the time we go off our eastern time zone, so for us, we're having to change leagues up because <laughs> yep. it, we're still going to be going off of uh, you know the eastern times for us. So it's going to be a real, real fun set of days. Hopefully you hang out with us. Trelly, it might be the Kings that are there. Could still be the Wardens, though. That game, game two as well, I feel like there's some similarities between them. And, yep. you know, we were talking about this coming into this, and it was best of fives adaptations. We mentioned how good the Kings are at that exact thing, and it seems like they've been making the right ones. They certainly have, and I think the – the ability for Variety to just be a threat in the back line was still here, of course. Captain Twig having a phenomenal performance on the Hun Bats of God that he has made his name on time and time again for the past, what, 10 years now at this point. So, yeah, definitely going to be a solid one. And, of course, Big Man Tings opting to go for the Baba Yaga over the Cuckoo and showing exactly why he chose that pickup. Uh, just doing ridiculous amounts of damage, staying safe, being a menace, as you would expect. It, it just looked all kings here there was a few mess ups during the siege but as long as you're able to grab like your fire giants essentially uncontested step forward and go up to the phoenix as the kings did wasn't too bad and i think a 15,000 gold towards the end of that game just by nature of better farm better fighting and in this case once again better god picks Unfortunately, and, and there's a very common theme in the last few minutes, but it's been Delny getting bullied yep. on the Wukong, not letting that solo lane really stand out. That Nike ban since game one has really helped out the Kings and really slowed down the Wardens. Oh, yeah. But I also think we got to see a, a huge return to form here, right? I mean, you get an excellent game out of Twig at 308. You had already mentioned it, but Ting's 407 and putting up 24k damage. It doesn't even last long enough for him to knock out the rest of the, the damage marks that he was looking for. So in the same ballpark uh, as Twig and Variety, we were both surprised by the Chalk. Uh, but now I'm going to say he's not unwelcome, right? He comes in, gets the job done, uh, and creates a lot of space, creates a lot of opportunities for the squad. And I would argue to, to maybe making Quigs and, and Harkor's job pretty easy because it oh, feels yeah. like we got three guys that were, were playing absolutely on point. And when you're doing that, Quig and Harkor don't have to worry about anything. They can have just a good game <laughs> and, and do exactly what they did. So really, really wide open doors and the Kings – uh, being able to find that lead because of it, Trelly, and the draft changes, it, it feels like that's really where they've been controlling the Wardens. And that's why I was surprised about the Wardens not choosing first pick, right? You, you're If you're sitting in the same path, it's just not going to work out. This time around, 
they, they did. And that, that is something that they needed, of course. Just a little bit of a change-up. I want to see how these picks and bans differ because if things keep going, or kept going, I should say, in the same path, it just wasn't going to work out for them. They weren't getting the gods they were looking for. Sure, if you value the Kakulkin that much, it's great, but it wasn't game-changing damage like Big Man Tings was able to dish out. So I love the switch up here from the Wardens. I want to see how they play it. I still think they'll probably try and prioritize that Afro or the Nike, but now it's time for the Kings. They can take those away, no problem. Oh, Amon gets banned immediately, so they're not even risking letting that through another time as they did earlier, and the last couple of times even banning it towards the bottom. Achilles was another big problem child, but the question is going to be what they go for. Athena, I have to imagine, is part of what the Wardens are looking for yep. and hoping for. That here. one too. Because Aphrodite has been on their list. And they're going to see what they can force the Kings to do. Ganesh gets banned by the Wardens. Thoth and the Nike banned out by the Kings. So Trelly, when we have this many gods that are not only available but but high priority, you gotta think. I mean, Athena has been. It, it's Afro or list. Athena. That's yeah. that's what the wardens want here. That has to be what they want here. They they cannot ban one of them in this spot, and then the kings have to choose. Let both through, and that could be pretty annoying because if you let them both through, then the wardens have to take their favorite. It would likely be the Athena, yeah. I would assume but you're giving up the Afro over towards Quig, who can certainly play it. Hasn't played it too much, but you know when he does pick it up, it does look clean enough. So, oh, wow, what? So now, is there something else that they wanted even more than the Athena? Because the Kings either ban that Athena, or they should, now they're gonna ban the Athena, right? Well, uh, you would have to imagine, but It's the Thanatos point, either. Thanatos and Daji actually getting to make through. So with, with Athena banned, it limits maybe some of those. I don't think you first pick a Thanatos or a Daji, but at least you have them as options for the first time this set. But they are going to take a page from the King's book. Yeah. And I feel like we've been giving, or at least I've been giving, a, a lot of credit to the Thoth, to the Kukulkan. I feel like Baba Yaga, especially after that last performance, has showcased that, yeah, you can absolutely first pick this god and have it be worthwhile. Right, and there's no way the Kings are playing Thanatos. Like, like Twig's not going to that pick, so they have their time to get away from it. Twig could go for the Daji, but not Twig's not a guy that likes to pick his jungle this early, right? He, he likes to see and let's let the draft go through. So I do think Baba Yaga first pick, once again, doesn't reveal much. It's just been very highly contested so far this set. BMT's had the opportunity to pick Cuckoo and has went against it, so it's maybe not even a pick that's on his radar at the moment. I wouldn't even hate things like the, the, the Ting's Discordia. That's a pick that we haven't seen too much. I believe Ven whipped it out back when they were trying to qualify the Ravens, that is, so maybe still something that the Kings could be looking towards, but don't have to grab a mage here. Uh, I assume it's Hachiman, and then they can just chill. <laughs> like, like, that's probably the idea, like, like whatever you want. Ganesh is gone, so they don't really have a support they'd like to pick this highly either. Now the Achilles... So here's the question I have for you, because Achilles not only is still available, yeah, uh, looked really good for the Kings in Game 2, but is it something that... Yeah, Hachi Achilles, that's definitely what I would grab. He doesn't even care. He doesn't want it at all, man. He doesn't care one bit. So Chalk <laughs> I also had a good game, Shelly. But we're, we're like... We were very much... Pick adjacent, right? What did you say? You said Hachi Achilles. Like, Rom Chalk is like the Walmart brand. <laughs> well, I mean. But they both play really well. That's the thing. The Rama, between between Hachi and Rama, it's just preference. But Chalk over Achilles is a choice, right? That is something Variety said. Hey, I felt nuts on Achilles, and I just played Chalk. So pick your favorite, right? At this point, and Variety yeah. just wants the Chalk. So the confidence is there for a reason. He was able to absolutely dominate lane. Think about how many buffs that Variety solo invaded. He didn't even need Captain Twig on that side of the map. My man just walked up and stole them himself because he just had that much more damage. I really don't want to see Delny go back to the Wukong. It didn't have enough pressure for me. It didn't have enough presence in lane. So that's not going to be the case. And wow, it actually will be the Dodge E. So no Thanatos this time around for Slash. Still a pick that has been highly contested, but... When World is on the line, I did expect him to go to that Thanos. And not only that, the question I have for you, and admittedly, I guess it's you can't really wait, right? If you wait for the next round for your jungle pick, Thana and Daji were were going to be the top two that the Kings go to. Likely, they were yeah. willing to, to commit it to their top picks or their top bands when they were first picked. Mm -hmm. But also, both of those feel like they 
hurt to pick this high up, right? Because it just gives you a lot of opportunity. I mean, Chalk and Lancelot. Rom both able to at least deal with it with their ult. Now you've got Lancelot as well, who plays well into the dodge. It just feels like, yes, you get the pick you really wanted, but also it's going to be harder because of it. I would say so. Now I get to see this last wave of bans. Support's still on the table for Quig, but he doesn't mind one bit. And of course, I mean... Tings might be forced into this Discordia pick. Like, if it keeps going, I do think that's something that he would like to grab. Yeah, because you're going to be banning Ryzen. And you got to assume Cuckoo's also up there. But maybe not. At this point, Tings is like, dude, I don't want it. Like, like I've been given so many opportunities to lock in this Kukulkin, and I have not taken it. Yeah, he'll go for, I mean, so much over it. Now, you had already mentioned the Hachi. We still have, on her Ishtar, those have been up there in that conversation of, of Hunters. They're going to take care of the on her, so Ishtar still available. If the Wardens opt to go that path. But what mage do they want to take away? And are they thinking on the same vein as you of, you know what? Tings just hasn't been wanting to play this. Yeah, they might just let it through. And so, yeah, they, they say, all right, bet. Like, see if he's going to go for it. Instead, get rid of the Emoja, which did give them a lot of trouble again in game two when it got locked in. Yeah, I don't hate the Emoja ban there. They're, they're, they're trying... Things is life. They're like, let's see it. Yeah, well, are you going in for the cuckoo? We're giving it to you. And he's got the opportunity to. But with the on her, with the Hachi ban, I think that does force Tuba to play the Ishtar. It's just a pick that he's been going to pretty consistently. It's not as if there aren't other hunters. As far as I'm concerned, your hunter doesn't matter too much. I wouldn't even hate like a Heimdall just to try and play safely. However, you got a position so well, it doesn't do much to the chalk. It can actually be very annoying. And it's gonna be the Geb. Get the Stone Shield cleanses ready for the Daji. I mean, hey, if you're worried about Beads Burn, Geb's got your back, but I haven't seen too much Geb recently. Well, the good news is, Shelly, right, it feels like he's got a few things going for him in this matchup, but you had already mentioned the cleanse. I feel like having at least like a little bit of anti crit because of your passive feels kind of nice. For sure. But I realistically, the, the the one change, like, he came back. Do you remember when they, they added, like, a base damage to his ult? Oh, yeah. He showed up again for a little while. Then that got nerfed, and he disappeared for a little while. So question marks on the Kings, and based on your raised eyebrows, you maybe, see that, maybe dude? some question marks over here for the Wardens. You see that dude right there? I'm I talking about Kukulin. That, that dude's no, fine. No, the, yeah. the other CU. The other dude. Yeah. I'm going to wait. Surely they both went to click Kukulin at the same time, and then one just got, like, auto-moved to Cupid, right? Because they're, like, going to be right next to each other. Um, it's you know, like, we talked about, like, how Ishtar was available. Right. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Into Ishtar? Into Ishtar? <laughs> come on. At least give me, like, oh, ye or something spicy. Like, he hovers Cupid just to lock into the pick we all knew he was going to go? I'm disappointed. It's a good matchup in Arama. I understand. Okay, it, okay wait. Are you disappointed in the grand scheme of if they lose this, it's their season being over, right? Like. But we've already seen Ishtar lose. We haven't seen what Cupid can do. <laughs> we yet. haven't seen Cupid lose. <laughs> yeah. The, the, <laughs> doesn't matter. Just normal. Kakolin should have a much better time fighting into Chalk. Wukong, you know, you pick him for his safety. Delaney was playing back a bit. But Kakolin can scrap, man. If you get that Warrior's Axe popping. You don't really need a blue buff. Maybe he was thinking ahead of time. Like, hey, I'm not getting MP5 anyways. Might as well pick a god that doesn't use the mana. So, not a bad look there. Great engage. Can pull beads, etc. But, not Discordia. Tings wasn't in the mood for the Cuckoo. So, I'm just convinced that Tings will not play Cuckoo. Because this would have been the spot for it last. If you didn't care about the Daji, you had the Geb for the shield. Morgan Le Fay, you got the CC immunity. You have plenty of CC of your, of your own. You can self-peel up against the Daji. And, of course was one of those top of the meta mid laners hasn't been played too much recently mm -hmm. but i don't think that she's gone anywhere i think she is still just fine all right so the real question comes down to it. we've seen like a baba yaga can, can perform if nog gets their feet under them then then it's you know gonna be amazing ishtar maui those things we've seen for the wardens in the past it is the Kakulin and the Daji, and it's specifically those two because it feels like a lot of pressure was on Delny last game. Yep. And if you're getting this Daji banned from you a lot of the time, you have to have a good performance on it. But it feels like Daji has a rough matchup into everybody. Oh, yeah. Don't and Kakulin is, you know, Kakulin. So how do you feel about those two picks and, and their strengths? It's rough, man. The, the, like you said, Lancelot doesn't care too much about the Palau. He just rides his horse on out of there. The the Geb is going to be annoying. Morgan Le Fay should just have the self-peel aspect. But 
uh, if the Kakolin and the Dodgy can start cooking early, right? Like, like free, like 10 minutes. They need to find some sort of presence across the, you know, their blue buffs, whether it be fighting, whether it be rotations, just to get something rolling, the ball rolling. It bodes well for late game. Baba Yaga just wants to get online. Ishtar just wants to get online. But man, the way that Tings and the way that Yarkor have been playing, Captain Twig and Variety have really, you know, turned their gameplay around as well. I mean, they're going to have to knock the Kings off the rhythm because they have been looking unstoppable these past two yeah. games. And that's the, the biggest thing, right? In game one, it got disrupted. While the, the Kings led early on, the Wardens were able to stop it. In game two, it didn't happen. In game three, it didn't happen. Uh, and so, Trelly, it sounds like you are, are starting to ride the train with the Kings. What do the Wardens need to do to derail it? I mean, early pressure. That's That's got to be the start because just waiting for late game when they're fighting down, they can make some stops, but it hasn't been the play, right? If you're able to get ahead of the Camelot Kings, that's a good start. That's still not even enough. Like, they still have room to fight back as well. But uh, I'm thinking that's what they're going to have to do. Find a first blood and snowball. Well, the pressure is on for him. Again, this SCC squad, who wasn't even, they were the fifth seed, man. And yep. then they managed to make it here. The question is, can they push us to five or will the Kings go to Worlds? The only way to find out is to go over to our casters. Thank you so much. It's game number four with the Kallen Wardens and the Camelot Kings. A win for the Kings sends them to the SWC. A win for the Wardens puts us on game number five. We'll see if we hit that point. Here in game four, it's J-Mac inbound and Doug here to bring you the action. And immediately going over towards this Bobby Yaga pick. Want to go on a, uh, and talk about it again because we mentioned it briefly last game. Eight games or ten games played, eight games won. Now bumps up itself. Another win able to jump into here. I believe a nine and two record on the Baba Yaga. Twitch poll sliding over the way of the Camelot Kings this time after their win in the previous set or previous game, 58-42. I want to get your thoughts kind of on, more than anything, the Geb. Because we did good. not see Geb at all. Oh, I just want to mention Bobby. I just hype up the slash shot because so that does boost up the Wardens a bit. But I want to go over to the Geb because we don't see a lot of Geb. We did when he got his buff, when he got that extra you know, free base damage on his ultimate. Saw him a lot. Now we don't really see him that much at all. J-Mac, I got a take. I think Geb is OP. What? I think Geb needs to be picked more, especially in the matchups like this Maui. And especially if you can get it with a pretty free farming ADC, something like the Rama, the Ishtar, the Hachiman. Geb gets through laning phase now even easier than he used to because his clear is just better on the archers. And if you get to late game, there's very few supports that can do what Geb does late game. And then you also compare it with what does this Warden's comp want to do? It's a pick style comp, and that's when Geb is the best. Now, where did you have Geb on, on your, you know, your tier list going to the end of the year and moving towards Worlds? Was Geb up there in like that A tier? Was he like sitting at B? Like, where, where, where was Geb sitting at? Geb was around the A tier. Okay. I think there's a couple supports that are still better. He's not first pick or anything, but he is such a fantastic counter pick. And I love this pick by Quig right here. Well, let's see what Quig can do on the Rockman himself. It's been a while since we've seen Geb played by just about anybody. It's been even longer since we've really seen him be meta, so. Let's see if I can remember everything that Geb can really do. Pretty easy kid. Roll forward, he knocks hit a knock up, up yeah. has a shield, and then a big AoE stun. I wonder if we see a blink from Geb this game. Because that was like the way to, similar to Ares, like that was the way to play Geb was blink cataclysm, start a fight. But it feels like over the years, some of these gods have kind of been pushed a little bit further back, not forced into going for that immediate style of play. You can kind of just be that defensive option for your team. Now it's Slash, though, on the way, stunned by Leon. Good. But Slash has other things on his mind. Those shield other camp. things, shield buff. He Pretty good that. to go for. He loves that shield camp. He wants to get it. And to answer your question kind of about this Geb, the link, I, I think it's a player preference. I think if this is Elyon on Geb, 100%, we're seeing a blink guaranteed. He buys it on Sylve too. But because it's Quig, Quig's a little bit more of a backliner, I think, with Geb. I, I would see something like the Bracer in this med or something like the Shell in the med. But I think the... The potential of Geb is that there is flex potential there. There is the offensive style Geb. There's the backline style Geb. And this game, I think the backline style just makes a little bit more sense. Yarkor caught by the hook, pulled in towards Tuba. Yarkor is a bit low, standing his ground, but those are AoE in hands that Tuba can lob right past Quig. Doesn't have to worry about the Geb standing in his face this time. The benefit of Yark is he does have access to a stone shield. That extra little bit of HP on top of the meditation that was used, in fact. They're both Leon low. and Tuba, both a bit low. 
And both forced to retreat back towards the tier one tower. Meanwhile, 2v2 group up on the right side. With blue buff spawning in, maybe a bit of a breakout fight to try and go for it. Never mind, Captain Twig says, I'll think twice about that and go to our blue instead. When Cullen's mad, you don't really want to walk at his blue buff. And he was a little mad. A little angry. He was a little angry there. They decided to give it up. Get their own blue, and this is a positive for Delny, because he has not seen a lot of his early blue buffs. Charlie kind of made a little bit of a joke on cast where, maybe I get this Kakolin because I'm not getting my blue buffs, so I don't need the mana. But when you get Kakolin, as long as you time your transformations correctly, it is very hard to invade the character. His pre-5 is just incredibly strong. His build makes him so tanky. And in the opposite side of the map, looking at the builds, a little surprising to me to see double sentinels out of both supports. A lot of times we see the war flag or we do see that benevolence. This game, double sentinels. I know Elion likes the sentinels on the Maui, but Quick has not opted for a sentinels until this game. I also want to take just a brief look around at recipes. Don't really talk about them as much anymore because, you know, they've been around for enough time now. You kind of just get used to them. But one that we're not super accustomed to seeing is one that Delny's gone for. It looks like he's heading towards the durable drumstick on the Kakulin. What is it about maybe this recipe that kind of stands out to being maybe geared more towards Delny's playstyle? I, I think there's better. I think this one is probably the worst recipe. <laughs> the only thing I can think of is that he just wants to mitigate a little bit of that Baba poke in when it comes to that late game fight. But a, a lot of times I think there's just usually better options. I'm not a big Kakulin player. So uh, I guess maybe it's just like a little bit with that, that blink potential. You do get mitigation on that first ability. Ultimate from Delny, Variety in danger, throws Axe over the wall, uses his own ultimate. Will he even teleport back with the torrent? He's waiting, taking some time, will not. Instead, he's going to run right into the hands of Nog. Goes into the home sweet home, but Delny gets the credit for the kill. And for the first time this set inbound, it's Delny getting the better end of Variety in a matchup. Needed help, though. Yeah, yeah, got it. Still doesn't have the lead yet. Still both level six. And we kind of got to wait on it just to make sure. So we can have the damage here. He's looking for the dive. He says the ultimate dismounts twice and dashes once, but now slash on the way. He's got that trickster spirit. Dives right on all counts. But a good push back. Force the thousand cuts to be used, but it only takes two swipes for the Kalen Warden's jungler to knock down Twig. And down the gets the revenge, or I guess Slash gets the revenge kill for Delny getting taken down. TP available, coming back out of base. Has that Contagion finish now too. And it's a little interesting seeing a lot more Contagion for some of these tank solo laners. Usually it's the Glad Shield, the Breastplate. We've even seen, I, I guess a little less recently, that Jotun's, some Runeforged. But I, I really think Kukulun with Contagion makes his early game threat potential, especially when he's getting CC'd by this Morgan as much. It's going to make it very strong on those rotations, so kind of a, maybe a little bit of eyes on him. Not as much cooldown, but maybe a little bit more damage. I mean, we saw, was it Friday went double, double anti-heal yeah. stack? While in, like, seasons of past, maybe a bit more kind of a sin. You know, the auras don't really stack on, but the extra damage that you get from Contagion, the bonus anti-heal you get from Pestilence, maybe kind of makes it a little bit not so bad this day and age. And I've been really liking this Pesty build that a lot of the soul laners are going for. It's physical defense, physical defense, and then that Pesty. I think Pesty is like the best magical defense item. Even that mitigation you're losing out on from Sigil is just made up for in the anti-heal application you get from Pesty. And those 70, 70 protections aren't anything to scoff at a Gengar to Variety. No ultimate for Variety. He used it earlier for Poke, and now it might just be his downfall. Pow Lao over the wall, and Slash has the damage. 2-0. For the jungler of the Kowloon Wardens. Now, time to see them translate to something else. Only still sitting at about that 400 gold lead. But the Camelot King's response is, well, if you're going to fight oh, no. us all the way on the other side, we're just going to bring the fight oh, to no. the purple buff. Elion's used everything to try and escape. He's got landfall. He'll use it in place. He's buying time Jump to soon. Swing, but the mid laner is on the way. BMT here to pick up the kill. Said, you guys took a little too long. Now it's my time to get a kill. And if Elion doesn't jump that wall... The, the problem that sometimes you get caught in with Maui is if you go a little bit too close to a wall, you don't have that opening on the backside on the back swing where you're just forced over the wall. And I think that's maybe what happened there. Elion forced to jump the wall because he, he knew at least two players were there. And then he knew that Yarko was able to walk around. So maybe just an unfortunate spot for Elion to be in. But across the board, still not a bad spot for either team to be in. It's kind of a switch from what we've seen with these teams. Usually, Soul Lane is getting dominated by the Kings, and the ADC role is kind of in Tuba's favor. This time, it's flipped a little bit. Delny has the lead in Solo, and Yarkor has the lead in ADC. 
And kind of speaking back about the supports, Quick does fully upgrade that meditation. As soon as those Gauntlet of Thieves are done, so has those extra cooldowns, has that bonus healing. Slash around the wall. Variety's right? gonna go back to base. Pow Lao used. Oh. Nearly catches Variety. I think he just barely heard the Pow Lao go up. Slash misses out, can't pull him back. Can't catch him by surprise was probably the idea there by Slash. Yeah, he's trying to get him on like the last second of the t of the back so he wasn't actually having his screen open. Fortunately though, timing didn't work out. Variety was ready. And it looked like he was even a little short on the mana to actually get his ult off. So I do think if Slash does hit him there, it might have resulted in a kill. But they still get the blue buff. They still get their own blue buff. And they're putting Variety even farther behind. And this was kind of like the MO of the Kings in the entire second phase. Variety behind, but Yarkor living, big, big man living. And it usually seemed to work out at least somewhat okay for them. But this tournament has just been the exact opposite. Usually it's Variety dominating. So it's a little strange now to you know see Variety actually getting bullied over here. Delny's doing a really good job keeping up the bullying this game. He, Delny says, you can't beat me three times in a row in lane. That happened yesterday. It's not happening again. You can't do it for a fourth. What's, what's your point, Nat? Three times. Well, he did do it three times in a row. I meant to say four. four, times times four. You can't do it four <laughs> times in a row. I said three, maybe like three sets in a row. I don't know. Well, <laughs> three sets in a row. That is getting you don't, bullied you don't, wanna, you don't want to get bullied three sets in a row. Tuba can be met with three of the Camelot Kings. Speaking of numbers and threes, actually it's four. Big Man Ting sitting at the Fury Ultimate used by Tuba. And the purple has been secured by the Catlin Ford. And Captain Twig jumps over the leap and uses the, the horse block. to get past the Landfall Island. But Slash is still chasing out Captain Twig, who's one hit away. One single shot will do it. It's Elyon to get the credit this time through. Slash jumps off of the Pow Lao. Quick Yarkor back away towards the tower. And Big Man Tings, who was hovering around the jungle that entire time, never gets a part of that fight. And the Maui ult was just enough to block part of the Lancelot ult, so he didn't have that full range of dash, and Slash is able to catch up and get the kill on the Twig. And this is actually maybe a fight. Tuba's going low. Twig nearly takes down Tuba. Are the snipes good? The second hits the third off the mark, and the shell there just in case. But here comes Slash. He's around the corner. El Leon gets no the ult. pull. Yarkor stands his ground, but Yark and, and Quig aren't low enough just yet. Slash wants to wait for one of them to walk further forward. And he didn't have any wards spotting him out there. We'll have to see exactly what goes down further beyond that one. Slash tried, but couldn't get the Camelot Kings to walk far enough forward to try and go for that gank. And the med bait was almost enough for Quig to pick up that kill on the Tuba. Tuba did get baited by it, but fortunately for him, he gets around that wall. And that is like the one weakness of Rama in the ultimate, is it's hard to see around some of the walls. And unfortunately for Yarkor there, he cannot see Tuba, no wards there to actually get the vision onto him. But he still hit him with one of them. Still, uh, I mean, one more, forced the shell out of the Maui anyway. But something that really stuck out in that fight to me is the uh, the Geb med bait. Getting those cooldowns back up, a lot of healing, getting the abilities back up, double knock up. And also Yarkor able to get a lot of damage out there too. I mean, we're still getting med bait in 2024. Med that was like a, that was like a season one, season two thing. You get, you know, what is it? Hercules, I'm about to die, I'm about to die. Hot psych meditation three. Now I'm just going to walk right back at you. But a little bit of a different iteration of meditation since that time frame. But much better now. Like cooler better. Yeah, it is a bit cooler. The meditation wasn't meditation back then. Was you pop and you instantly just got a pretty big percent of your health. Now you actually have to, you know, kind of tick that health up a little bit. But getting a lot of cooldowns. Or honestly, I know it's not that great. Yeah, Cloak of the Avatar, so much fun to use. You know, get that extra Another knockback. Fun item. Dude, blink, like, blink with any support. You pop that, having a wheelist nearby, you just get a free engage. Yeah, you're basically playing Sylvanas with blink at Cloak of the Avatar, right? Dang, you really are. You're yeah. just playing Sylvanas. We should play Sylvanas with that, too. It's going to be double Sylvanas. That's not, that was an option. It's not an option that was taken this game, though. Callan Wardens, they're trying to go for the win because they need to push it to game number five. There's another purple buff invade by the Kings. This time it will be successful. Yark even debating stepping up to Tuba. Tuba's now lost a little bit of his lead with how much pressure's been thrown his way. And that first beacon will go over to the Camelot Kings. Elyon a bit slow, being able to jump over that way. As we kind of check in back with the Soul Laners, it's still Delny up on that side of the map. So still a bit of a lead for at least the solo laner now, or at least keeping that half level up over Variety. And those two deaths have impacted Variety's early game, but haven't really slowed things down too much. Questionable ultimate by Tuba. 
throws it there, maybe trying to get beads or trying to get an ultimate from Yark, but gets neither. And Tuba with only the tier 2 XE and Yark are having that XE. Pretty big advantage in that 1v1. Tuba, like you said, maybe a little antsy, trying to get something forced out there. Another fight on shield camp. Landfall misses by Elyon. Double knock up by Quick. But again, remember, Tuba doesn't have ult. He used it in the fight previous. So now, just going to be down two ults to still the three standing for the Kings. And now there's four because Variety's joined the party. Gets Wait, Tuba and Slash to back away entirely. And Palau from Slash not going to get anything. Slash from Yark gets some nice chip damage back on Tuba. Will force the Hunter back. But I didn't even notice Variety's full teleport TP rotation over. Me neither. Variety just wants to make the play and he wants to make it now with five strong right now. Nog getting chased out. Nog. I think Nog's fine. He's level 15 versus Captain Twig's level Lion. 11. It actually looked like the house had body blocked Captain Twig a little bit. Kept him from being able to jump in right away. And as you point out, something that we really haven't seen a whole lot this tournament. Looking like a prophetic cloak going to be coming out from Nog. And that should mean that it should be a pendulum because I, I think... Yes, your survivability with both Cloak and alternate timeline, Baba, is good. Your damage is just not high enough to actually be threatening. So I think I like the Cloak, but it should mean it's paired with the Pendulum. Keep eyes on Nog and the rest of his build as it goes on, which possibly means no Mirden coming out. But we haven't really seen Mirden from the Baba. It's mostly just been get the pen online, get that percent as quickly as you can. Things like, you know, even Charon's coin. Haven't really seen too much Charon's coin, a little bit of it, but another free stacking item by Baba takes a little bit longer now with some of the nerfs her away. But Genie's mid laners, I mean, for as little as they've gotten involved in the game, isn't that pretty high in their farm? Level 16 for the both of them. Yeah, both of them, for the most part, just staying farming wherever they are. Been involved in one and two kills apiece, but this game as a whole, there's been a little bit of scuffling here or there, but there's not really been that many all in fights. And with that, El Leon pulling this pyro, pyro started up three of the Kalen Wardens near, but Quig wants to try and go for the seal opportunity, not unheard of for Geb to try and take this one away. So, the respect from the Kalen Wardens slash goes in. He's got Captain Twig, but Twig's got an ultimate because Quig cleanses himself with the stone shield. <laughs> Looking out for himself more than anything. Trust that Captain Qui Captain Twig had his means of escaping. Yeah, also probably really low cooldown on the ultimate. Too. Yeah, yeah, it's really not that big of a deal. You got the Jotuns already on Twig, but maybe you should shield him and all yourself just to like you know keep the Lance alt up. But that's all right. It shouldn't matter that much. It's not this massive opening slash used alt there also. So it's not like no ults were used for just that that ultimate there. And with this. Bullying capping in solo. Looks like Twig's actually making a play in left and Pyro pulled by Elyon again. Let's go back to the objective, but They're now Variety left. and Big Man Tings are on the way. Yarkor being bullied out by Tuba as Delny steps forward. Landfall from Leon oh. will pull back Variety, but it's only going to pull Variety, who's taking no damage from this fight. Delny transforms into the rage mode, but not going to get any damage beyond there. Health bar is a bit worse on the side of the Kalen Wardens. Means that now the Camelot Kings, if they want to, they can be the ones to go to the objective. And it seems like the team that was taking the fight on each side of the map lost that fight. Because now Tuba starting to bully Yark on the left side when Twig was just over there. And just like that, a couple plays looking to be made. But again, nothing comes from it. 4-2 in kills. And this is a expected fourth game, I think. Especially when it comes down to... If the Kings win this game, they're going to Worlds. And the, on the opposite side, if the Wardens lose this game, they don't have a chance anymore for Worlds and they are eliminated. So a little bit more pressure on this one. This is match point, and it makes sense. This is something that happens when you get to this point where teams just want to play a little bit slower, a little bit smarter, maybe not more calculated because there, there has been a few openings that just don't get exploited, but it's just you don't want to be the one making that play that kind of blows open the game. Kind of that you don't want to be the reason that you lose the game. You don't want to be the reason maybe you don't qualify exactly. to SWC kind of mentality. And in games like this, it feels like it's a lot more pressure on the SBL team, such as Captain Twig, a lot thrown his way. But a lot of that, a lot more pressure like this really does feel like it comes to the SBL teams because these the Wardens, these guys, I don't think anybody expected them to even be here. I don't think anybody expected and I mean like here at this event entirely. Or this last was like week even. The fifth seed team. I don't think anybody was expecting how far the Kalen Wardens would go. And now they're here to essentially play spoiler to the Kings. There's a lot riding on the line historically for the Camelot Kings if they miss out 
on the World Championships. If the Wardens can do so, this marks three SCC teams that get there. A first year without Captain Twig. A first year a back-to-back -back champion doesn't make it to the event. There's a lot riding on this for the Camelot Kings. They've got to play careful and make sure they minimize their mistakes. First mistake they're going to make sure they don't make is giving away a free objective. Gold Fury over to the Camelot Kings. But when you look up at the top of the graphs, the top of the charts, it's an even game. 100 XP, 200 gold at 18 minutes. This is the closest that we've had a game this set. And just the way both of these teams are playing, it seems like this one's most likely going the distance. We should see level 20s across the board. And that gets me excited talking about secures on those fire giants because there's not really great secure on either side. It makes these fire giants very risky. And with the build that Yarkor has been opting for, usually just going Kin's Titans with no crit. And Tuba on the opposite side has been going crit. So unless they switch up their builds, Burn is going to be on the side of the Wardens, and then neither team has great secure. So these 5v5 fights on the Fire Giant in 5-ish minutes are going to be very interesting to watch. No Fury. That's been now taken. Pyromancer up. We've had a lot of early Fire Giant calls, but as mentioned, because of how close the game is, probably not worth it for either team to try and go for a bait at this point. Instead, it's back to Pyromancer round three for the Wardens. See if they can maybe get this one. Never mind, they're just going to walk past it. I thought maybe they'd try to start this one up, but instead, focus on the farm. We're maybe realizing too many of the kings are nearby. It's not worth risking a pull on the objective with so many standing by. Tuba versus Yark, but Captain Twig is he around the, the corner. Stops the dash in place. Beads and Aegis gone. Captain Twig with the saving play. Bails out Yarkor, picks up the kill. And what a bait by Yarkor to... Kind of get out traded a little bit there. It almost seemed like he was walking up expecting Tuba to be there, but not really wanting to actually take the fight. Letting Twig actually rotate in, and Tuba not expecting it at all, loses both relics, which is now almost three minutes for Tuba's relics to be back up. A little bit of an opening here for maybe Pyro, Tier 1 Tower in mid. The Kings, not necessarily, I mean, I mean 1,500 gold, but this is the, the time they want to start snowballing. They're sending Yarkor over to the right side of the map which means Pyromancer is going to be the call for the Camelot Kings. Elyon, Nog, Slash, Ultimates online for everybody going into this one. The only one used was Tuba's in the last engagement. Quig going to trade out with Nog. And Quig will take that kind of a trade any day of the week. That's the safety of their mid laner. Now gone from the Kowloon Warden. Still holding on to both of his relics, but man, what a trade that Quig goes for. Just rolls up to him, hits the four button, and says, I dare you use anything to defend yourself. And Nog's response was, well, what if I use my house? The alt for alt trade, a tale as old as time. And if you look at the cooldown, not a massive advantage either way. Put it on the side of Quig. And he's also got that 7% cooldown from Tier 2 Cloak. And only 10% for Nog, so a slight advantage for this Geb. And something we really haven't seen much is Geb at all. But Geb late game is something that teams aren't going to be really expecting. I, I think it is a very surprising thing when you haven't played against Geb in a long time for really underestimating how big the shield is or how like impactful it is. You could be looking for a pick. Maybe Elion finds a massive ult on the variety who's not ready and he gets pulled in and then there's massive Geb shield just flies in and saves him. Makes it very hard to find picks against a Geb cop. That's a twig pulled back. Media Grand Joust. Not gonna want to deal with anything that Slash or Elion have to answer back. Losing an ultimate for that, not the end of the world for Captain Twig. Losing a lot of health means he's going to have to go back to base and reset himself before he can rejoin the fight. Fury coming up in just a few seconds, about 15 out until that objective is on the map. We haven't really seen much of our solo laners in a while. It felt like once that level 12 gank kind of happened from Variety, it's been real quiet. Oh, wait, actually, I think that was an entirely wrong game. I believe that was last game that that one happened. It's been Variety bullied out the entirety of this game. And look, you played Chalk two games in a row. I'm trying to wrap my brain around how we got Chalk twice in a row to begin <laughs> with. But we haven't seen anything from the Soul Laners outside of the initial ganks over in Variety's lane. And you're not wrong. He was bullied out in the early game, but he's caught up, and he's actually even with Delny now, both level 19. Pull on to Quig here. Elyon. Uses landfall, but only grabbing Quig is completely fine for the Camelot Kings. They're just getting set up for the beacon. I want your core to get poked out too heavily. This Baba Yaga is starting to stack up one away from the full prophetic cloak. Delny trades ult, 
Hits two with his own as Elyon jumps over the wall. Pulls Captain Twig back a second time. Grand Joust available for the jungler on the Camelot Kings, but it's a trade out. Elyon's ult for Quigs and BMTs this time. So a little bit of extra value coming that way. Even Delny in the non-raged form using his just to stay away from that CC. And you saw them try to commit to that Kakolin, and that is a tanky Kakolin at this point. And that's before he even has that axe finished. Once Delny gets that axe finished, the dive potential is there. And I think that's something we can talk about quick with. How is the dive going to look late game when you see a Cloak Baba? Is there enough damage with this Lance, with this Chalk, to actually be able to kill? And yes, Maui's not a great peeling god, but... Baba in her own right doesn't really need a ton of peel. I think Tuba is the one that they're going to be looking to dive for the most part. Because that is a god where if you catch her dash very easily, all you got to do is really stand in front of it. You can pretty easily kill her. On the opposite side, the Kings with this Morgan Rama backline. A lot more damage on the side of the Warden's dive. Kakolin, Daji do a lot of damage. But there's a lot of return damage potential on this Morgan and the Rama. Morgan LeFay pretty self-sufficient. When and it comes to dealing with themselves, has the alternate timeline for the extra backup, has a lot of self-peel tools. You talk about the dragon flight all the time. You essentially have to dive in and almost either pre-beads or use your CC mute ult right away or any kind of knockback immunity because as soon as you blink in, it's turn around, pop that second ability and, ba and pull off any of these assassins, these warriors that try and dive on the mid laner. But I think you're right to say, Who's going to deal with Nog? Who's going to deal the damage to kill this Baba Yaga? Fully stacked Prophetic Cloak. Already done now for the mid laner of the Wardens. It's going to be a tough person, a tough god in general to kill. Camelot Kings going to have to figure out that game plan soon. Titans march down mid. Didn't even get to see the, the order side. Titans killed off screen essentially by the Kings before he got a chance to step up. And Callum Wardens will deal with the enemy Titan. Now both of them returning to base. Because the game starting to peter a bit towards the Camelot Kings. I mean, 5,000 gold, kind of seemingly out of nowhere. It's just been this real steady flow. Grab an objective here, grab an objective there. Tier 1 tower every so often. The Kings are starting to form a lead, but we're not really seeing them do anything with it just yet. Yeah, I think a lot of it can be brought back to Tuba getting picked by that Twig Gang. Because that's when it kind of started snowballing a little bit. Yes, only 5,000, 5 strong on this Fire Giant for the Kings. Or four strong, I guess, because Soul Laners not rotating yet, but they both have this teleport, so I would expect them to rotate quickly. Fury, quarter HP. Eleon steps four, goes for the landfall, pulls back one, but Captain Twig able to bail himself out quickly. The Soul Wardens are not giving up the chase. Let's take a listen in with the Wardens on the fight. I'm looking at Gep still. Yeah, pull him in, pull him in. Chuck behind, Chuck behind, Chuck behind. I'm looking at her backline. I'm, I'm taking some damage here. I'm metting. They're weak. I'm hitting Chuck. This is kind of done. Chuck's leaving. Oh, Chaka Colon? Alright, we can back up. Done. They do Oracles. We gotta deal with anyways. Leon finds a big ultimate to start that team fight out, but the rest of the team just taking a little too much damage walking up. BMT on this Morgan Le Fay, just chipping away at the health bar of the Kalen Wardens, and you heard it that entire time. Chalk's behind, Chalk's behind. Hey guys, Chalk is back here. Somebody's gotta deal with them. But who's going to at this point? I mean, Variety is just so tanky on this god. Yeah, and he still doesn't have too many cloak stacks. Only 14 seems a little low, especially at 26 minutes. But with FG5 strong, they have the f no frenzy, I guess. No frenzy, no no crit. No crit, no frenzy, half health on the objective. Delny and Elyon are here to try and stop this, this one. But the ultimates are down on both of them. Can the Camelot Kings secure it? It's going to be a variety dropping the ultimate to make sure it goes down and that Elyon and Delny can't steal it away. The Camelot Kings with their Runic Bomb secure the Fire Giant for all five. And now it's the Camelot Kings who can start pushing up the right lane. And not even a big opening left by the Wardens. The Kings get there five, ten seconds before them, but they just commit to the fire and they trust in their secure, which is that bomb. And to be fair, with how little secure is on the map, bomb is not bad secure right now. I mean, it's the best immediate burst damage that you can offer. But it did cost Variety using his ultimate on two people to guarantee that that bomb doesn't get destroyed beforehand and that it can secure the objective. Everyone of the Camelot Kings, Sans Captain Twig, will group up on the right. Captain Twig now making his way through the jungle to rejoin the team. The Wardens are putting up pretty hard defense on this side. Still just missing Slash, who's sitting over in mid, maybe waiting for Captain Twig to step out of line. 
But Twig can just do exactly this. Just keep galloping through the jungle. Maybe go for a pincer maneuver if the team gets enough distance. He's just roaming through the jungle, waiting for one team to step too far forward, waiting for one player, one god to get just a little too low on the Kalan Wardens. A little bit of poking trader right now, but one team has FG, and that's the team that's going to be a little bit more sustained up. Delny forced into the transform. And if this doesn't happen here, I expect for the Wardens to give up this tower and the FG team be able to take that tier two. I, I think this is mostly just to clear up the tier two, but the Wardens seem to be standing here still. Standing firm at tower. They don't want to give this one up for free, but Variety's really the only one low. And now, with the Kukulun D transform, the snipes from Yark start the fight, but misses just about every shot of it. It only is there to clear out and, and push back the Wardens. That way the Camelot Kings can deal with tier two. A lot of that fire giant power play Kind of falls by the wayside there. They still get the tower, but so much of the time got eaten up by that siege. Yeah, wasted almost two minutes on just one tier two. Still enough time, get this pyro back up, try to siege one more time, because again, this first FG a lot of the time is just to clean up the towers. Still two towers available. Gold Fury is going to be spawning soonish. And they're still not full build. They're playing to get this farm, get their sixth items. And actually, with that tier two tower, with this back, some of them are starting to get through to that sixth item. Soul Reaver on Big Man. You've got the Kins Titans Bane on Yarkor. Variety's also finished that Pridwin. Still not a ton of stacks on the cloak, but this th this chalk dive at this point is going to be rather scary. Variety with that Pridwin, fully upgraded starter. The full slots coming in for just about everybody. I think Captain Twig just now going back and finishing an Emperor's Armor. Curious that it's Captain Twig going for that one. I mean, considering that. Twig wasn't really a part of that siege at all on the right side, but Twig has been doing a lot of split pushing with Variety. You think maybe that's part of the reason we see this this pickup for Captain Twig? I mean, it's got to be. If they 5v5, Twig is not going to be able to step into the tier two, so he's not going to be able to actually get the Emperor's proc onto it. So I'd expect Twig maybe look to split off. Actually, maybe a, a dive onto this tier two here. Variety behind. Slows Twig down a couple through. in. Kit Variety goes for a big ult, it hits El Leon, the Palau is out, but how many get pulled back by it? It's only Variety this time. Health bar is low, the land ball. ball, grabs two, Captain Twig, down to half HP and Variety, starting to get chunked away. It's the home sweet home now out of Nog to push the Camelot Kings away. The Camelot Kings got what they wanted. It's a tier two tower once more. They can fall back and clean up the Primal Fury on the way home. And still not full all-ins for either of the team. It's mostly just trying to just separate the fight as much as possible to get the stuff they're coming for, for. They're taking that fight to get the tier two. They're taking that fight to back up to the Gold Fury, not to actually get kills. But they're still forcing out some relics. Slash has got everything available, but no beads on Nog, which is, for my money, probably the most important player when it comes to this late game. Not necessarily because Bob is like an easy god to kill or she's gonna be doing a ton of damage, but she is gonna be doing a ton of damage. It's mostly because a lot of the Warden's late game relies on Nog kind of making these plays, finding a little bit of damage, and kind of pushing his luck as much as he can without dying. And I think if he's able to do that, if he's able to get a little bit of damage, maybe onto the back line of Yarkor, Big Man, or Clean Up Twig, I think that could be a real big boon for this Warden's team. Especially with this EFG spawning. I mean, this is putting your team into a really good spot with this EFG, and if you kill enough, this could be game right here. So far, the only power spikes that are matched are the mid laners. Nog just now gets that Obsidian Shard online. So full six slot for the mid laners. But everywhere else, we're at least an item behind. I mean, I guess supports are tied Doesn't in count. that regard. But Doesn't count. that's the supports. Who knows what they do. <laughs> As the Fire Giant is what the Camelot Kings want. Nog it goes no in with the double ultimate. Nog in danger. Variety hits three with his own in Tuba. Fast dash Delny out, in. but Delny is in the middle of five. He gets a Bastard knockup and will get the Rage Transformation just in time. But is it enough to keep his life? What Twig! Captain Twig, he's got him now bail out of the fight. Gets a big shield and gets the retreat. Can the Kalan Wardens recuperate in time? Because the Kalan, or the Amla Kings, they really only have to send one player back. I'm looking to separate the fight a little bit. Big Man still standing around. Yarkor still around this Fire Giant. Something that kind of is sticking out to me, very interesting. The meditation still not being upgraded by El Leon. The difference in healing, the difference in cooldowns is insane. And actually, pause on that, Fire Giant's getting pulled. Delny and Tuba move forward. The Camelot Kings, they want to try and stop this 
Callan Warden's team from taking this Fire Giant away, and they're playing it so cautiously. Quig is really playing with his life up there in the front line on this Geb. Throws out the knockups, has those shields just for that backup, but Geb doesn't have a lot of sustain in the kit, so Quig's got to go back to base to get some of that health, get some of that mana back for himself. Keep your eyes on Relics going into this next fight. Still over 100 seconds till Tuba's got beads. Blinks both down for the Kalan Wardens, and that shield missing on Elion's side. Meanwhile, you look across the board, it's only Quig who's down in his relics right now. All the defense is available to the King's carries. And looking at the Fire Giant pit right now, Ward Vision is very strong for both teams, but in the immediate pit, it's all Camelot Kings. Around it a little bit, even on the King's side, we do have some Wardens' wards, but still, the important part is in that Fire Giant pit because you have to know how low it is if you're looking for a steal. Quig lost a decent chunk of HP. And now it's Variety getting pulled back. The Camelot Kings, you don't want to lose your solo laner here. Variety will be able to fall back. He's got Teleport if he needs to walk back in. Might wait on the call for the team to see if he actually needs to Teleport in. Might just do so anyways. But the Camelot Kings got to regroup. And Variety just recuperate his HP. He did, in fact, it's all the way to the sideline. He's now in the middle of a 3v1. And the Camelot Kings are getting poked out. It's the Kalen Wardens repelling the back. Variety just got in, and he's already lost a quarter of his health. Same to Captain Twig. The Camelot Kings are just getting poked out by the Wardens at fire. Yeah, it's not even like the Wardens have this super high poke comp. They're pretty short-ranged. Baba has a little bit. Tuba's got a little bit with the autos. But outside of that, I, I, for my money, the King's poke is better. It just seems like the, the Wardens are hitting their abilities, and the Frontliners are playing safe enough that they're not taking that poke. I think a little bit of it is on to Twig and on to Variety to not take as much poke. I think it's a little less Variety. He has that sustain, but Twig needs to be a lot smarter with his health bar. I think all the Kings got to be cautious here. Still have a game to fall back on, but you don't want to have to go to game five to qualify to Worlds. Only Fury started up, slash Nog Elyon walking forward, but too late to stop Captain Twig, to stop Yarkor from grabbing that Fury. So now Oni Fury on the way with some minions pushing down. Not super important at the moment, but the biggest factor for these players. Teleport still down, 36 seconds for Ridey. All relics back up, all ultimates online and waiting for that big fight. Kalen Warren's Hunter, Tuba still missing out on that last item. Would love that power spike, but doesn't have the chance to go back. Doesn't have that golden hand just yet. And same with Slash, still only five items deep. Had about 2,000 gold in hand, 2,200. Trying to get that final six item because that is really all that's separating both these teams. There's really no map pressure. Yes, we have Oni Waves pushing down. There's not true threat on those Phoenixes with those Oni Waves unless a god is with it. So the only true advantage that the Kings have is maybe a little bit of positioning being in the Fire Giant pit and then just the sixth item in jungle. But even then, that's an Emperor's Armor for Twig, not a true damage item longer that these dances kind of peter out around here. Better for the Kings, but also better for the Wardens because they're able to catch back up to what the Camelot Kings are at. As mentioned, it's only items that maybe one now technically separating the two of them because Slash able to go back and buy a full serrated edge. So it's really just Tuba lacking in. Fire pulled. Some of his damage. The Kings Pull the fire giant. Delny walks forward. The Kings trying to go for the ending fight. Let's take a listen in with the Kings. Maui, 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 no jump behind you. Maui, 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 Maui. Behind you, Maui. That was easy. Look at Dodgy, look at Dodgy. I have shield, so I have shield. Yeah, I have shield. Dodgy on that, Dodgy on that. Kill me, kill me. Good. I'm holding shield. Can we chase? Can we chase? Fire, 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 fire. Fire, fire, fire. Go fire, go fire. I got poked, I got poked. Do fire, do fire. Do fire, do fire. The beads and that Maui puddle clutch to keeping Slash alive. Without that there, I don't think the jungler makes out on the Warden. So far, the only casualty is Delny, but the Wardens didn't get a great chance to regenerate themselves. It's Elyon walking up at a third HP to fire all by himself. Tuba standing, his arms are hitting for 100 on Variety. Variety's out healing the damage Tuba's throwing. Nog has joined Fire's the fray, low. but Nog is not going to be able to get in. It's Fire Giant enhanced at that for all five of the Camelot Kings. And they can take their time getting back in. 15 seconds till Delny is back up. I don't think that Quig or BMT want to walk up to a Phoenix 
or even a tier 2 tower at this low of health. So the Camelot Kings reset themselves. And at 37 minutes in, 4-4. Four to four. This has not been a kill game. This is the opposite of a kill-determined game. This has all been the macro play for the Kings to now put them 19k up over the Wardens. Did you just see what I saw on the Kings side in all their builds? We have 3k D-Pot for Variety, 3k Power Pot for Yarkor, Quick got a 500 pot, and that is on top of Variety also finishing his cloak. So now Variety has got 25% more mitigation going into this next fight that he didn't have in the previous fight. Do you know how low Variety got on that Fire Giant fight? He didn't. He was like three quarters health and he took a lot of damage. So now it's going to be even harder to deal with Variety. His damage is going to be higher also because he's got this Fire Giant. And this is looking grim for the Wardens. They don't have great matchup potential against the Kings. If Variety and Twig are splitting, there's no way Slash and Delny can match them. Now where power potions are in advantage for Camelot Kings, Wardens. We've gotten everybody but their support to at least full build now. Kinsai's up for Tuba. Slash has serrated Edge. And Delny and Nog have been at that full build for a moment. It's going to come down to the defense of the Kalan Wardens. Two Runic Bombs, both of them in the pockets of the two guys that have been sticking together the whole time. Twig and Variety can, if they want to, walk up and just eliminate one of these Phoenixes but they're gonna take their time on the side of the Camelot Kings. You don't wanna make a mistake now. You've had 39 minutes of complete control in this game. You don't wanna blow it at one bad Phoenix Siege. Especially when you have this EFG, this slow trades fight. It's actually blinking by Slash. Bro, double Runic Bomb, the bird's gone. Slash nearly eliminating Captain Twig. Rides off on the horse. Variety's gonna get pulled back in by the Pal Lao. Slash, no, he he's not him. gonna make it out. The ultimate's good. Variety has taken down Slash. Now it's Delny to try and defend. Three versus three on the opposite end, though, is going a bit more in favor of the Wardens. Look how much Nog is done to Yarkor. Forces the Hunter back at 40% health. But this is now a five versus four. This is now gonna be two Phoenixes down unless the Wardens can stop the Kings. And Leon's not gonna be able to do so. He's being shoved back by the Morgan Le Fay. Quick though, rolls in at low health, gets a stun on Delny and nearly takes him down. But the Camelot Kings, they hold firm. The Kalan Wardens still standing their ground. And going over to this left Phoenix, Kings five strong here. Still have that EFG, they have this Emperor's Armor in Captain Twig's pocket, but they are getting a little low here. Leon pulls back Twig, that's a pick on a support, but Nog is the one that they want, and Nog is the one that the Kings will take down. Still 20 seconds till Slash is back up. Tuba uses both his relics and the bubble to get back to his support. Variety will chase him down. Delny will go to the grave. The Camelot Kings, they want to make it back to the world stage. They've got to defend their title. They'll get the chance to do so. The Camelot Kings in four will make it back to the Smite World Championships. And what an incredible end there by the Kings. That is how you use the EFG. You split off, you take that 2v2 on the left side, because there is nothing you can do to match that. There was too much power in Twig's pocket. There was too much power in Variety's pocket. They tried to match it. I mean, Slash even tried to go in and take the fight, but they had bombs already on the Phoenixes. The Phoenix was just dead instantly. Yeah, it was a double bomb down, and I don't think Slash even thought twice of maybe trying to defend the Phoenix instead. He turn, goes up to the ultimate, and the second he lands down, Variety times it all perfectly, catches him out, and then he's gone. And from that, it's just the Camelot King slowly maneuvering back and forth, really just leading the Kalan Wardens by the nose, going exactly where the Camelot Kings want them to be. And, and what a close fight beforehand, before that EFG, but that's just the strength of the EFG. As soon as you actually get that, the potential to get Phoenixes, the potential to end, the potential to win these 5v5 fights just goes through the roof. You saw how close the fights were beforehand. EFG just changes it that much. And again, this is a game that was not determined by, you know, Captain Twig or Variety popping off with a ton of kills in the early game or the Kalan Warrens going crazy in the kill count. It was 4-4 four to four before that enhanced <laughs> fire giant goes down. We had eight total kills at like 38 minutes in the game. This was completely dictated by the macro, by the farm on map. And the Camelot Kings, well, they've been the reigning kings of doing that for the last couple of years. That's a that's a that's a good one. I, I like that one. You have one Kings, every so often. Yeah, you got I'll give you that one. That's the one you get. <laughs> Kings oh. played exceptional well. I, I'm I'm. It's good to have them back because it's not a world without Twig. Not a world without Captain Twig, and they'll get the chance to defend their title at the SWC. Congrats to the Camelot Kings on their victory here. That's it for me and inbound on the castle. Throw it back to the desk to break down the set.
The Kings make it back, and Charlie, that's the big thing to hold on to here. It was a shaky path, but they confirmed themselves here. 3-1 victory, uh, and more importantly, are going to the World Championship. Yep. So it's going to be an interesting time for everybody that has to deal with them back on the world stage. Uh, but for this game, you know, it starts out, it feels a lot closer. In fact, right. it feels maybe even a little Warden-sided. Uh, but just tenacity. I mean, that's what this team is. We talked about it at the very beginning. They can play into the late game right. and turn things around pretty well. And that's what I was talking about early on. If, if the Wardens wanted to knock them off their rhythm, there had to be some kills flying. There had to be some action being forced. 4-4 four to four at 40 minutes is not exactly that, right? That, that's playing into the King's hands as far as I'm concerned. They want to systematically dismantle everything you want to do across the map, and they want to do it at... 35, 40, as long as the game will go. Because they know that they'll have a little bit of a league, so they're gonna farm a little bit better, they're gonna play around objectives a little bit better. But props to the Wardens. I mean, what a run they had. Yeah, the, the game up against, they, they played yesterday was close, right? They, they had a very solid early game, but this time around, the late game wins the day. And we just see the Camelot Kings once again blessing us on the world stage. And really, it's gonna be, man, it's gonna be an interesting world, right? Being able to come back, that's the biggest thing. And we have seen some of these teams, especially when you, you face into matchups like this, when you have to go uh, a lot longer than maybe you had anticipated or maybe even wanted to, uh, it gives you a lot more warm up time going into worlds. Maybe something that they're gonna be able to play with. I also think it was really fun because, Charlie, the drafts and, and the way they changed from like game one to game two and then game two to three and four was incredibly fun to, to see the, the shift. And yeah. specifically, I feel like, you know, the shot coming out was one that was a surprise, but a pleasant one nonetheless. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, trying to get first pick there was a good idea. They had to try to stop what the Kings were doing, but they had the draft ready for everything. I mean, eventually they were going to get late game here. Tings didn't take that Kukulkin. Wasn't something he was looking for. The Morgan Le Fay ended up working out just fine. Robin, when you get to late game, Yarkor, I, I saw him hitting for like 600. There was no crit in the build. That was just 600 damage for <laughs> auto attack, which can be absolutely ridiculous when you only have so much HP, right? So I think it was exactly what the Kings were after, right? They played this draft. They knew they'd be able to get EFG territory, and that's where it really did just kind of ramp up. And it, it's a scary thought, too, because it wasn't like their sieges were messy. They, they were just slow. They were methodical. They had plenty of runic bombs. They played around that as well. So if I'm the other teams looking at the Camelot Kings, because you got to remember, there are still four teams that are going to have to look at every squad that made it and pick who they want to chase. I'm considering that. Yeah, that's something, again, that, that makes this really interesting. So yesterday we qualified two teams. Today we've qualified another two. Kings are the fourth and final one that are going to Worlds. We'll find out a little bit more about what that Worlds is going to look like. But right now all that matters is that they've made it. And so, of course, to, to catch how they're feeling, we've got the entirety of the Kings standing by. That's right. I got the Camelot Kings, our fourth and final team qualifying to SWC from the event. And we got to start with the man himself, the one we've been talking the most about because it's Probably the most iconic storyline to keep on. Captain Twig, 10 years of the SPL, 10 years of the World Championships now. How's it feel making it? Amazing. It was uh, maybe the most stressful qualification of uh, my life in the last 10 years. Uh, I mean, just the pressure of not making it, I guess, made us play a bit bad, I think. Um, but yeah, it feels amazing. Good to have you back at the World Championships. Congratulations, Twig. I'll scoot right behind you. Yarkor getting to go back again now, third time to try and fight for a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back title. How does it feel making some World Championships and maybe trying to go for the three time? Uh, I think it feels really amazing. I really enjoyed it last year uh, when we went. I think the people and the community and everyone is so amazing at the venue. So I would love to just be there and meet everyone there and just try to make a good run. Excited to have you back there. Congratulations on your win. Variety, feels good to have the solo laners uh, at least get those Warriors back. I, I know that we had the made solo meta for quite some time. Now kind of feeling like those unkillable monsters again. How do you feel about the solo and how's it feel going back to Worlds again? Uh, I think the solo is a good spot. Obviously, I'm not the best mage player, <laughs> and probably not the best warrior player. So, uh, yeah, going back to worlds, whoever picks us, enjoy the three two zero, enjoy semifinals. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Oh, I don't gotta get it like that, man. Well, congratulations on making it back to worlds, BMT. You've been one of the players who talk about picture consistency as far as the squad goes, trying to hold this team up. How does it feel being able to qualify and go back to worlds a second time this year? Oh uh, yeah, it's just a great feeling, honestly. Um, obviously, it didn't look too good uh, the first set against the Scarabs, but we all stayed strong, and uh, I'm happy we pulled for an end. I want to make it through. Congratulations, BMT. Quick, jumping onto the team, maybe not the most favorable positions initially, but jumping on about halfway through, now had some time to sit down with the team. How's it feel making it to Worlds of the Camelot Kings here? Feels great. Super excited. Hey, man, a few words. Congratulations to you, Quig. 
Biggie. <laughs> Hey, sometimes you just got to, hey, sometimes short, sweet, to the point, how it's got to be. Biggie, it's probably been a stressful year for you, stressful last couple of years for you. Making it to the world stage of the team, how you just feel as a coach, how you feel about the boys here? It's not like that stressful. I didn't really get stressed. I think it's more frustrating because I think we have more potential than we've shown, like a lot more, but I just think a few things behind the scenes and just you know, the roster change and stuff was kind of an ambush, and that just kind of threw us, threw us off a bit. You know, I'm I'm really proud of like the way we played today, and I think we can do anything at Worlds. We just have to play, play well. Yeah. well. Let's see how you guys can do at the World Stage again. Emlock Kings, congratulations on making it to the SWC. We'll see you guys on Friday on the World Stage. That's it from us here over on the interview. We'll throw it back over to Des to close out the day. And Shelly, yeah. there's still a lot of, of data to be had, oh, despite yeah. the fact that there's no more gameplay. Uh, there is going to be a little bit. Yeah, that's the thing we've been running into. Some some bullet time dodges I saw <laughs> for the cameras there. Uh, it has been a, again a very fun weekend. A lot of competitive smite. A lot of good competitive smite. Right. Leading all into guess what? The last weekend of this season for competitive smite in the World Championship. Someone is going to be lifting that hammer. A week from today. Oh, my God. Wait, a week from today. Wow. A week from today, the championship is going to happen. My goodness. Uh, and, of course, we have to finalize the bracket. We're going to have the, uh, a little bit of a draft show right after this. But before we get there, again, how we got here and what teams are qualifying. If you're just tuning in, first off, you missed a whole lot. And I'm wondering where you've been all weekend. But the good news is, is that we've got our teams. The Ravens and Hex Mambo are going from Group A, two teams that I think people were betting on. But... We had to say goodbye to the Gilded Gladiators, their season is over, and goodbye to the Shabalba Storm as their season came to an end as well. Over in Group B, oh well, we just qualified the Camelot Kings. The champions are now going to be returning to the world stage, and they are joined by the Solar Scarabs, who ended up finding a win over them in Day 1. We say goodbye to the Kowloon Wardens as their season ends, and we said goodbye to the Eldritch Hounds with their season coming to an end. So two EU SCC teams and two SPL teams. I'm having a little bit of deja vu, I feel like, to last year. Uh, and of course, a lot of interesting discussions to be had. Right. Because now that we know the other four teams, for those of you who have been hanging out with us for the last two months, you go back to the four teams that qualified in November. Well, those teams get to choose their opponent. That's something that we had talked about. That's what seeding during that tournament was really important for. Getting into the top four means, yes, you go to Worlds, but then, what, in order, Ferryman into Levi's, the Leviathans, into the Oni, Oni and Dragons. Dragons, right, will be the ones who are going to be choosing, uh, and they're going to be controlling that. Then we did the SEC things to get those teams here. We've done this thing to get the four teams I just named before those other four teams I just <laughs> named. Uh, and now they're going to choose who's going up against who, what side of the bracket that they're going to be choosing on. Charlie, it, this is one that, that last year was really interesting because if I remember correctly, uh, we had a team very early choose to go up against the Titans. Yep, the, uh, Levi's. And the Levi's chose that. And yep. it ended up being a... Um, Quick world's run for them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they, they went home a little sooner than they would have maybe liked. Yeah. So what we're going to be doing is kicking it to a quick break, but then when we get back, we're going to have the draft show, and we'll be able to finalize the SWC bracket. So stick with us. We'll be right back.